Deputy City Clerk, if you'd like to make your statement. Yes, I will. Oh, we don't have our, our interpreters yet, so we can go ahead and proceed, um, Vice Mayor. Say that one more time, City Clerk. Um, we don't have our interpreters on yet, but we can go ahead and proceed if yeah, you want. Yes, please. In that case, we'll go ahead and uh, skip the interpreter statement. And um, we'll go ahead and see the time is now 1 o'clock, 1.30 even. Uh, let's go ahead and open up public comment for, public, uh, for a close uh, study session. Uh, Vice Mayor, we need to call the meeting to order and do a roll call. Okay, let's go ahead and do that part first then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Here. Councilmember Sawyer? Councilmember Rogers? Present. Councilmember McDonald? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Okay, let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Mayor Rogers and Council Member Sawyer. All right, thank you. With that being said, let's go ahead and open up the public comment for our closed study session. Okay, we're now taking public comments on item two, closed session items. If you wish to make a comment in person, please put your name in with the administrator at the top of the well or via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. You'll have three minutes for your comment and a countdown, ti countdown timer alert at the conclusion of that period. Seeing that no one is here with us today, are there any recorded? There are no voicemail recorded messages and I don't see any raised hands. Very well, that concludes uh, the pre-recorded, or actually the, the opportunity for public comment. Let's go ahead and close that. And with that said, we will recess and uh, we will be, at, we'll be back shortly.
right, and this will give you the credentials on how to drop in pieces. Or, um,
Hello, Charles and Pablo. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to put Charles into the Spanish channel, um, and then Pablo, if you will, if you will translate when the council resumes, please. Charles understood. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of the meeting. For those jo just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available, and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Um, Pablo, can you please restate this in Spanish? Buenas tardes. Para los decisión regados a esta reunión, interpretación en vivo estará disponible. Y los miembros que deseen escuchar la interpretación en español pueden unirse al canal. Para unirse, haga clic en el icono de interpretación en la barra de herramientas de Zoom, que ahora parece un globo terráqueo. Una, mente, una vez se una al canal de español, Eh, recomendamos que apague el audio primario para escuchar solamente la interpretación al español. Thank you. I'll go ahead and place you in the um, Spanish channel as well.
Good afternoon, everyone. The time is now 2.30. City Clerk, would you like to call roll call? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Mayor Rogers and Council Member Sawyer. Thank you. We'll move ahead into a study session. Item 3.1, City Manager presenting staff. Thank you, Vice Mayor Alvarez and members of council. Item 3.1 is the Short Range Transit Plan, SRTP, 2022 update. I'd like to introduce Deputy Director Ede. Thank you. Thanks very much and good afternoon, Vice Mayor Alvarez and members of council. We're pleased to be with you here today for this study session on the city bus short range transit plan update. Uh, transit planner Matt Wilcox is the project manager for this SRTP update and will be providing today's presentation with myself and uh, planner Yuri Koslin also in attendance to help answer questions or provide any additional information that's needed. Before handing the presentation off to Matt, I wanted to provide some brief context for this effort. Uh, going back to 2020, uh, in the spring of 2020, we had just begun our regular short range transit plan update, which is a process we go through every three to four years following guidelines provided by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC. Uh, the pandemic hit right as we were getting started and we have placed the effort on hold for the past two years, but it's time to get it started again, um, both with new guidelines from MTC, which Matt will discuss, as well as needing to get back to regular planning work for the future of city bus. Um, so we will be moving, uh, let me back up and say, you know, this effort has been on hold in part because we're still working to restore service that we cut during the pandemic, as you all know, and staffing continues to be the limiting factor uh, in that service restoration. But as staffing uh, grows and, uh, and as we, we have the staff available to further restore service, we are planning to do that aggressively. So even uh, more reason to get into this planning effort um, to shape any changes to the city bus system that needs to be made at this point in time. Um, combined with that, we're also um, needing to begin planning for the Go Sonoma sales tax measure, which, which kicks in in 2025. That measure will be bringing new operating revenues for local bus transit in Sonoma County. So it's a good time now to start thinking about um, what, what would be the best use of those new operating funds for transit in Santa Rosa to help support the needs of the public and our ridership. So despite the fact that we're very much still in pandemic recovery mode here at City Bus, the time is right to do this focused planning work uh, on the future of the city bus system and the Santa Rosa paratransit system. So as you know, we implemented a full system restructuring of the city bus system back in 2017. And leading up to the pandemic, that system was performing really well. So at this point in time, we aren't looking to start from square one. What we'd really like to do is focus on the pre-pandemic system as the framework, um, but look to identify both the shorter term changes that need to be made to better meet riders' needs as well as start to think about priorities for future service changes or expansion of the system. Um, Matt will be talking more about the planning framework that underpins the current city bus system to give you some additional background and context and answer any questions you may have. Um, I also wanna highlight that this SRTP update is taking the place in the context of unprecedented local and regional, regional efforts to integrate transit service provision among multiple operators. So, uh, you know, the goal is to develop, as we've discussed in the past, a, a seamless transit network here in Sonoma County that operates as, as one unified system from the standpoint of the rider. So, you know, while we're looking within for this process, really focusing on the city bus part of that, that countywide and regional transit network, what we learn and the recommendations that come out of this process will be brought forward into both the Sonoma County as well as the Bay Area regional um, integrated service transit planning process. So they're not exclusive, you know, this, this inner look at city bus doesn't preclude us then be, being able to participate in those larger integration efforts. Um, I'll conclude by noting that we have provided print and, printed system maps for council, as well as any, any members of the public in the chamber. There's also a link in the agenda that, that would take people to um, the online version of this if people are watching on Zoom and wanna have a point of reference for the current city bus system. And uh, we look forward to your feedback, both on the SRTP process coming up as well as your priorities for the city bus system, any concerns or questions you may have that we need to take into consideration and look at throughout this process. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Matt, but I did wanna note that this is not the first slide of our presentation. So if we could kind of scroll back 
Um, that would be great. Um, one moment. I'm having issues with the PDF. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, while we're waiting for the presentation, I also wanted to note, Vice Mayor, we're happy to answer questions during the presentation or wait till the end, however uh, you would like the, the study session to run. We're very flexible, so either way. If you don't mind, Council, if you wish to ask questions uh, as the presentation goes, please feel free. All right. All right, Matt, take it away. Will do. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Rachel mentioned, this is a uh, study session for our short range transit plan. Um, it is something that we do update every three years and it was postponed. Um, and with that postponement, MTC actually changed the structure of um, the short range transit plan. So for some of you, this will be all new. Some of you may have experienced the short range transit plan before, um, but either way, we'll kind of give a background of what we did previous on previous short range transit plans and then move into what MTC is asking um, transit operators this time around. I can go to the next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of this presentation, um, we'll jump into a overview of our service trends over the last four years, including the current fiscal year, um, give you kind of a basis, basis to go off of, of where we are from a service standpoint, um, and then just move into the actual process, go over the old process, um, and go into the new process and what that entails. Um, specifically, this planning scenarios that MTC has um, provided us this go around. And you know, as you'll see, that's not um, normally how these things progress. Um, and then we'll jump into service planning, which um, as you'll see, isn't necessarily a requirement of this new SRTP, but it is a past. And as Rachel mentioned, we're kind of at a, a point in our service delivery that uh, we need to see what what has changed as we come out of the pandemic um, what needs for our riders um, have changed the demographics of our riders have changed um, so we need to tweak our service to to meet those new needs and then obviously part of that um, will be a, a rather robust uh, public engagement campaign to make sure that not only are we just looking at the data and what that tells us we're actually engaging the public to help understand what people need um, and we find that sometimes those, those stories are often um, what push us in the right direction on delivering an effective service for the community. And then finally, we'll wrap up with just a timeline to give you a sense of how long this process will take um, and what to expect from us in the future. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so just a kind of a state of service overview, um, comparing fiscal year 1819, which was our last whole year of non pandemic um, numbers uh, comparing to our current fiscal year. So our average monthly ridership was um, in the mid 7,000s um, and now we're close to 6,000. That's about a um, 40, or sorry, it's a, not a precipitous drop, but it is um, you know, we're about 80% of our service hours um, versus what we were before on average. Um, going down to fair media, um, Demographics have changed, um, and I will note from the get-go for all you people doing your mental math that those do not add to 100%. Um, and that is because within our fare structure, we have a lot of um, additional categories that aren't really rolled into adult and youth. Um, things like our transfers, which are free, um, the SRJC um, free program, the veteran free program. Um, those programs have a different categories of fares, but looking at just cash, adult um, passes, um, looking at our 31 day passes, my apologies, or and tickets, we can actually categorize those and our new youth free fare program. So um, as you can see, the youth free fare program has a dramatic effect on how our rider demographics break out age wise. Um, so that is just something we also need to look at because um, how we deliver service, um, if it's more anterior, aimed at um, 
getting kids to and from school, which has always been the case, but if there's more we can do to kind of um, rebound off of um, this growth in youth ridership, then all the better. Um, and just looking at general trips taken um, on your average weekday, we're down 44% um, versus what we were pre-pandemic on weekdays, um, roughly the same for Saturday and Sunday. We're doing a little better at 35%. Um, Sundays have had relatively the same service level um, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now, um, just because it is our lowest span of service um, that we offer. And I'll go to the next slide, please. So just looking at ridership trends um, over the past four years, um, it's very obvious where the pandemic happened. Um, you can see a very precipitous drop in ridership, um, and we had our lowest ridership in May of that year. Um, our highest ridership was in recent years was in October of 1819, it was almost $170,000 or dollars riders a month. Um, and then as we move forward, you can see as we, we came out of the pandemic and we're still going through it, we're growing ridership back. Um, and our highest ridership to date um, was last month, uh, sorry, April, we're not in May anymore, uh, at 93,326. Um, and May and June are projected out right now. We haven't finished doing the ridership for May and um, June is not, but as you can kind of see the trend for most Junes is that we do see a drop. And with youth riders being such a large portion of our ridership now, um, we believe that ridership will probably drop significantly, but we, we may see a new trend where it doesn't drop um, that much with school being out as children are still able to, and school children are still able to ride free. Um, so we may not see um, that big of a dip. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is a review of our revenue hours um, over the same period. Um, each of the blue dots represents a service change. So for context, um, during non-pandemic times, um, we only change our schedule on average two times a year. and. Um, as you can see, that changed greatly with the pandemic. Um, we've done 13 service changes. And once again, if you're doing mental math and counting the dots since the outset of the pandemic, um, we actually ended up doing two service changes in the month of January. As you can see, there's a pretty large drop in this current fiscal year. Um, and that was mostly due to the Omicron surge um, where we had staffing issues, um, people being out sick. Um, and not able to drive. Um, so we had a reduced service, that way we could provide at least a consistent level, um, albeit a lower one than we would have desired at that point. We can go to the next slide. Um, so the old SRTP process, which also might be the new old for some of you, um, is broken out to a six key parts. Um, and we would, when we presented this to MTC, um, each of those three years, the update, um, we have provided organiz their organizational structure, so we would give them a breakdown of how we operate. Um, Santa Rosa is one of the unique transit operators in the Bay Area um, as what we're called directly operated, where our bus drivers are city employees, um, it's the exception being paratransit, but at least for the six, fixed, route, fixed route bus service, um, our drivers are employees, whereas most um, agencies contract out their services. Um, then we would provide goals, objectives, and standards. So um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about the general plan. Um, it's kind of the, the same idea where we, we have things we want to achieve and then how do we measure the success in those, um, those goals, um, whether we use um, certain metrics, um, usually key performance indicators like the number of passengers we have, um, how many riders we have per hour, um, things of that nature. And then we would do a service and system evaluation, so comparing our uh, key performance indicators to make sure that we know which routes are performing, um, if they're performing poorly or if they're performing better than expected, you know, what service do we need to add or remove and based off of that evaluation. And then all that kind of culminates into an operations plan, which allows us to determine what we want to do over the next 10 years, which is the planning horizon for most um, short range transit plans, and then we update those every three years. Um, obviously, we want to create a budget that's sustainable um, and sustains that service that we plan for. Um, and then capital improvements are always important, making sure that 
we have a state of good repair on our fleet and facilities and also that we are keeping on top of purchasing our buses um, in the proper intervals as dictated by um, the federal government. We can go to the next slide. So the new process um, takes some from the old process, but um, it's much more special, specialized this time around than the, what MTC is asking of us. Um, one of the major shifts is actually that all transit operators in the Bay Area will be submitting their touring transit plans at the same time. And this is unique, usually they're staggered. Um, and the reason MTC wants to do this is so they can get a very holistic view of what is happening to the transit operators in the Bay Area. Um, are there certain trends? Is everyone feeling the same effects? Are the effects different by county? Um, so they're trying to get an apples apples comparison. And the way they set this up um, is to provide us with the template for service data so we can provide them the hours of service we're providing our riders, how much fares um, we've collected and what we anticipate to collect. And then within that, we need to um, tell MTC through a narrative, you know, why we've come to these conclusions. You know, what have we seen in our um, service area that leads us to believe that the ridership will go up or down? Um, obviously, we haven't done that yet, so we're not really sure, but that's what this whole process is for. Um, and then all of that is within um, three different scenarios that MTC has provided the transit operators. Um, they want us to look at what a, a robust recovery looks for us, um, a recovery of our revenue, but having fewer riders on our system, and then some recovery. And if we go to the next slide, um, I can give you a better idea of what um, each of those recovery or, or those um, scenarios entails. So a robust recovery is 100% recovery of revenue um, to pre-pandemic levels um, to the various funding sources that we have, local, uh, state, federal, um, with escalation, you know, we're bringing in more funds um, and ridership is recovering. And then revenue recovery, uh, but fewer riders, um, we've, in this scenario, we've exhausted our relief funds, um, but our other funding sources are recovered. So that would be our local funds. Um, and state funds, and then fare box revenue is 20 to 50 percent below pre-pandemic levels. And then finally, they're defining some recovery as federal relief money, also exhausted like the previous scenario. And then totals of all funding sources are 15 percent below pre-pandemic levels, so that's state and local. Um, for the purposes of city bus, uh, we um, we're really looking at kind of the last two, um, or the first and the last um, scenarios. And then the middle scenario, the revenue recovery for your riders is kind of, for us, combined with the sum recovery, um, mostly due to the fact that, albeit that fare box revenue is a portion of our operating budget, we're not as reliant on it as some of the other operators. Um, an example would be that BART um, is highly reliant on its fare box um, revenue as a source of operating funds. Um, so that's kind of one of the things where looking at this regionally, MTC is covering all its bases um, to ensure that they can kind of see, you know, based off of that, how is one agency faring versus another um, in these very varying scenarios? Um, and then their intent is to decide how they want to allocate funds in the future or where um, more strategic planning on their part can take place um, in the future. We can go to the next slide, please. So financial considerations for us, um, we have a five-year operating plan and a five-year capital plan. Um, the five-year operating plan is, you know, we're, we're basing it off, off of anticipated um, changes in revenues. So um, we as an agency still um, have about $2.9 million of our um, COVID emergency relief funds. Um, which we can use to backfill fare box um, as we go forward. So um, we're relatively well off in that regard. Um, and, you know, if things go swimmingly, um, you know, that will easily carry, out, carry us towards um, when go Sonoma revenues kick in in fiscal year 2025 or 2024, 2425. Um, and then five year capital plan. Um, we are looking at our fleet electrification. Um, you know, it's a requirement, but also something that, you know, we imagine we would go forward with anyways, as you know, we move to be a more environmentally friendly transportation choice than we already are. Um, 
And we also want to make sure that we're maintaining the fleet that we have as, you know, we progress towards an all electric fleet. We still have um, a clean diesel fleet that we need to maintain and then start to maintain those electric vehicles as they come in. Um, and then kind of the overall financial plan um, is a culmination of the, the capital plan and the operating plan and that we need to make sure that we're sustainable in both parts of it where uh, we're not overextending ourselves on an operational basis. Um, therefore, you know, we have to shift funds over to capital because we need to purchase new buses um, and the other way around where we want to make sure that we strike that balance um, and we can make sure that we're providing the service that the community needs. Um, you know, we need buses to provide it, but we also need to make sure that um, the hours meet the needs of the community. We can go to the next slide, please. So to go into the service planning portion of this, as I mentioned before, there isn't a specific request from NTC to do a service plan or create an operations plan. Um, part of that falls into um, what they're asking in the narrative portion of the new process. Um, but we felt that we need to provide a more robust service plan. So as an agency, we have an idea of where we want to go um, over the next few years and how we want to deliver a service. Um, and all of that service planning is kind of couched within the council adopted service design guidelines. So in, when reimagining happened in 2017, um, council adopted service design guidelines that act as kind of a, a um, well, guidelines um, for us and how we deliver um, do our planning um, across the system. And those key components of the service design principles um, are best practices and transit service design. So these aren't necessarily unique to Santa Rosa, uh, but more of industry standards um, in transit planning. And you would see um, these at, with many other transit agencies and how they plan their service, um, how we allocate service, you know, where, where does a bus go in the city and, you know, and how many times does it come per hour? Um, so we have a methodology for that. And then we also have a definition for route and service typology. So when we're saying we're allocating service here, we're saying we're allocating this type of typology or this route typology or service typology um, because it meets um, the criteria where we know that having 15 minute service um, on a highly dense corridor is optimal, whereas that may not be appropriate for a neighborhood suburban type development. And we can go to the next slide. So we'll get into the details of each of those right now. Um, so the principles of service design are frequent service, direct alignments, bi-directional service, strong anchors, spacing, and connectivity. And all of these play off of each other. Um, and you will actually be able to see these in play with the system as it is currently um, seen today. So frequent service for us is 15 minute service. Um, for someone like Uni in San Francisco, um, some of their routes don't even operate with a schedule because there's a bus every five minutes. Um, but for us, 15 minute service is, is pretty frequent, um, especially for a um, density that like Santa Rosa. Um, direct alignments are very important. We want people to get a trip that is not necessarily exactly like they would drive in a car, but very close, um, which makes transit service more enticing. Um, so a direct alignment um, is in your head. I mean, most of our, our routes, we attempt to make direct alignments, but routes like the Route 1 that goes up Mendocino Avenue to Cottingtown is probably one of our most direct routes. Um, and then bi-directional is also very important um, to ensure that someone's trip from, say, their house to their place of work um, takes the same amount of time as the trip back home. Uh, once again, trying to make it equitable with a car trip as possible to entice people on the transit and um, just make it a better experience for um, riders where they're, they're not, one part of the trip is 10 minutes and then the other part is 20 minutes because they have to go the opposite direction of where they want to go. Um, it's very important to have strong anchors. So um, housing density is a strong anchor. The higher the density, the stronger the anchor is for transit. Um, job centers where jobs are clustered in a single area provide a strong anchor and then also um, health and human services um, 
when those things are clustered in single areas, it's easier to provide transit service to them. And it's also indicative of a stronger ridership for the route serving those. Um, and then spacing is equally important, um, closeness and how far away things are. Um, we don't want routes that go down the same roads, um, but we don't want, also don't want routes so far apart um, that you kind of create a transit desert in areas um, where there's not service and it's not walkable. Um, but spacing um, is very relative that if you have very frequent service that's bi-directional and it's direct, you can get away with spacing service more because study after study shows that people are willing to walk further um, to higher quality transit services, higher quality being frequent, direct, and bi-directional. And then finally, connectivity also related to spacing. Um, routes that go north-south and east-west can intersect each other, um, allows people to make um, efficient transfers between routes, having the connectivity at major transit hubs is equally important, not just for riders going across the city, but going regionally. So we wanna make sure that as we work with our um, transit partners like Sonoma County Transit, that we can make efficient connections, that they can provide a more regional trip for somebody. But once that person arrives in Santa Rosa or someone who may be leaving Santa Rosa, they have a very quick trip to their connection from say their home um, to a hub. You can go to the next slide, please. So these are some diagrams kind of giving a visual of what I mean by service allocation methodologies. Um, the two, not necessarily competing, but just different ideas um, are coverage versus productivity. Um, coverage is dispersed everywhere. Um, you see the diagram, there's lots of buses, there's lots of coverage, but there's just one bus on each route. Um, so you will have a bus that probably comes very close to you and um, it's very important to the people that use it um, because that is their lifeline if they're using that bus. Um, but it's hard to get places um, quickly and it's hard to attract more riders if you're applying this methodology everywhere in a system. Um, if we did this on like a highly dense corridor, um, it would probably not attract people to use the system or make the system very useful to people that are already using it. However, if we're trying to make sure that um, people do get service, um, we can apply that to uh, neighborhoods. Versus productivity service, um, where it stays on major corridors, um, buses are coming very frequently, um, but it is very limited in where it goes in the sense that it has a very um, specific start and end location. Um, it doesn't meander. Um, it's not going closer to people's homes necessarily unless they're directly on those major arterials um, that these routes are generally on. But the end goal is generally higher ridership on these routes as um, they provide more frequency. There's more opportunity for trips. Can you go to the next slide? So to tie in with the allocation um, methodology um, are our route typologies. And if you look at the system map that that was provided, you can kind of see um, a little bit of the different service allocation methodologies and also the typologies. The one exception being rapid bus. Um, we don't, even though it says 15 minute frequency, which is what the route one um, traditionally operates on, uh, we don't consider rapid bus because for us rapid bus means there are some other factors as part of the route that allow it to run more quickly than um, say a vehicle in some cases or a personal automobile, uh, whether it be um, transit, transit signal um, priority, um, not to be confused with preemption, we're not an ambulance, we're not changing the lights as we're going up to the intersection, um, but it's more of it changes the timing based off of what the bus is doing. So if it is late, um, it may hold in the system recognizes it, it may hold the light at the intersection to allow the bus get through um, before cycling. Um, or the other thing that is part of this typology is our um, Q jump lane. So it's a, a lane that is at the intersection um, that allows the bus to leave um, before the light turns for the rest of the vehicles in the queue. So the bus can get ahead of um, traffic that's backed up at the light and then therefore making it um, a faster service and also more desirable service for riders. Um, what we see on our system um, is the 
three other typologies. So trunk routes, um, you would be thinking of the route one, the route two, two B, um, where frequency is every 15 to 30 minutes. Um, they're along major corridors in areas where we know they're high demand. Um, local routes are 30 to 60 minutes. Um, examples of those would be uh, the Route 8, um, the Route 4, 4B, where they're, they're not as direct, but large portions of them are kind of that inbound, outbound, bidirectional service, whereas they have loops at the end to serve uh, neighborhoods, uh, but do in, eventually connect to uh, major arterial and major hubs. And then finally, circulators are flex service. Um, these are more of what you would expect in that coverage based model um, where they're covering a lot of geographic area, but they're not as frequent. Um, so they are providing the trips, um, but they're not uh, coming every 15 minutes and something like that in our service right now would be like the route 18 where it covers a lot of distance, goes lots of places, um, can get you where you want to go, but the buses are not coming um, as frequently as some of our other service. We can go to the next slide. So now that we have a basis of kind of how we want to plan the service, um, we're, we have a the intent to move into the public engagement and kind of bring these ideas back to the public. Um, they may be familiar with it from reimagining it for a long time writers. Um, but we have a couple of different um, processes that we use when engaging the public and to reference back to reimagining, it was a, a chance for us to really hone our engagement skills. Um, and since then, um, there has been an increase in collaboration across departments in the city um, and us and kind of the best practices of how to get out to the public and get the feedback that we need. So um, one of the things that we do plan to engage the public is a writer survey. Um, and a component of that will probably also be aimed at non-writing residents um, to get a sense of, you know, why don't they ride? Um, will they ride if, you know, things change, um, but predominantly it's going to be aimed at our current riders to better, under, better understand their needs um, as we move out of the pandemic and have those changed. And then other part of it is providing trade-offs for them. Um, we've heard uh, from feedback over the years that different desires from different riders um, are there, and we want to kind of get a bigger, a better sense of, is there a, a bigger idea that most riders would agree on is the next step for us to um, change um, our service and some of those are you know Sunday service um, that's equal to Saturday service um, later evening service on the weekdays um, or increasing frequency on the the major corridors uh, in the in-person outreach um, the one thing that we stand by is uh, direct outreach to the riders at where they are so that's on the bus major transit hub that stops um, we want to make sure that we get that anecdotal evidence. We can get the responses from the survey and we can look at our data, um, but we often find that the just speaking with the writers gets us pointed in the right direction more often um, than not and kind of leads us down paths that we may have not considered before or at the very least, it reaffirms our um, suspicions based off what we found in the data. Um, and then in cases where we want to be, we want to change service, um, we will do a more specific outreach to the on those routes. So not just the major hubs to kind of get the overall picture, but really getting to a lot of the stops on a route if we do have a targeted route. And you'll see later in the, the slides that that is something that we are planning to do. Um, and then stakeholder outreach is equally important. It's a great way for us to get a lot of comments from a single source, um, whether it be health and human service agencies, our other community partners, often their clients speak to them about their issues, and sometimes city bus is their issue. And we um, can get that feedback in, from a single source, and it's good to know, you know what these community um, partners are hearing from their riders and what we can do to better their services. Um, and then public workshops um, and community meetings are always key to us, especially we imagine later in the project when we can come back to um, the public and say, you know, we've heard your feedback and here's the changes that we think are, you know, meet that feedback. Um, and once again, it's another great opportunity for more feedback to us. And then finally, um, we want to make sure that if we can tie into other engagement, uh, community engagement, whether it be stuff with the general plan or other departments where there can, you can get that um, synergy, um, you know, transit and land use are intertwined 
um, it was beaten into me by my um, transportation professor. Um, we had to say it as an affirmation before every class. So, you know, as we improve our um, densities to make I mean, have higher density developments, um, different jobs coming into the area, um, having a good transit to those um, locations is key to community well-being. We can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned before, um, some of the things that we're looking at are new spans and destinations. That's part of the trade-off questions we want to ask the public. So service extending further into the evening, um, equaling spans of service for the, the weekend, so Saturday and Sunday, go start at the same time and at the same time, so there's less confusion there for our riders. And then also expanding service areas. Um, Part of reimagining, which had two phases, phase one was already implemented is what's on the street now, but phase two um, included some expansion of service. Um, and that's been um, reaffirmed from the public feedback we have. As you can note on the map to the right, um, the areas highlighted in orange are areas that we've heard um, from multiple constituents um, that they would like service in those areas. Um, and that's something we want to look at too. You know, how best to serve those areas? Is it ex extending routes that we already operate? Is it putting different service typologies in there? Um, and then an area not necessarily highlighted on here, um, and not necessarily a new area, but would be the Fountain Grove area where the Route 19 served prior to the pandemic. Um, there are obviously things changing up there. Um, there are places that need service. Um, so we need to take a look at what is the appropriate service for that area? Because um, it is something that um, people have mentioned that they were sad that it did go away. Um, and it's one of those things that, unfortunately, we, it was a trade off and we had to prioritize, prioritize uh, more impactful areas of our service area that generated more riders and had more riders using them. We can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned before, route realignment um, is one of those things that we are looking at in one of those instances where we would do very route specific outreach. Um, so not just the major hubs, but all the, all the stops in between um, if possible. Um, so one of the routes that we are looking at is the Route 9. Um, as you can see, the picture on the left is the Route 9 as it currently is, um, which is a loop with kind of an inbound outbound tail um, that starts at the transit mall and ends at the transit mall. And one of the things we want to bring to the public is a concept of a bi-directional service that ends at Cottingtown and the transit mall and already begins there as well. Um, and this kind of ties into the service principles, you know, bi-directional service, it's direct. Um, and if we can make it frequent, all the better. Um, and one of the you know, reasons to do this is to, once again, fill a gap that the Route 19 left along North Dutton um, and it provides better transfer opportunities um, and connectivity for the riders of the system. If you live along West Ninth um, or West, West College and you wanted to go to say Kaiser, um, one of your options is to go south to go north, essentially. You're coming back on the nine to go to the transit mall, to get on the one, to go north. Um, and that's just not intuitive and it's not fair to, to riders. But with this configuration, you have more opportunity to, to transfer um, the one you can get to the one at Cottingtown, and it's a little more intuitive to go north and continue to go north to your ultimate destination. Um, the one downside of this is that there is that section of Dutton Avenue between College and Ninth that would not um, have the service directly on it. Um, but if we can get that bi-directionality and that frequency, um, it could still be enticing to riders as it's a it would be a, a stronger route in the end. But this is for us to find out from the riders, um, and ultimately they will provide kind of the the cherry on top of you know which way we go. We go to the next slide. And then finally is something that we've it wasn't it hasn't been really discussed in other plans in great depth, but is kind of you know talked about um, between staff and new service typologies. Um, and as technology has progressed, these become more viable. Um, and one of those things is using a deviated fixed route or um, on-demand services. And you may have heard the term microtransit. That kind of that kind of is a catch-all for those two. 
Um, essentially, we can use ride sharing companies or provide our own vehicles to provide on, on demand service where people can request rides um, through their smartphone. Um, where this wouldn't cover the whole city, um, that's not feasible, but it could be used in areas where we see less ridership, but there is still a demand um, there and there still needs to be transit service. Um, we're in access. Um, is a program that we're in transit is using. Uh, their service is aligned around major transfer hubs and those being the smart stations and their transit centers. Um, essentially, there is a 200 or 2.5 uh, mile radius around each of those hubs. So if you do arrive at a smart station there, you can request a ride and essentially get door to door service within that um, service area. Or if you're going beyond that, they'll at least connect you um, to another or to a transit hub that would allow you to complete the rest of your trip. So if you say you were in Santa Rosa and you want to travel to Marin um, and you needed to go out to Fairfax, they could get at least get you to the transfer hub from the smart station and then have a Marin transit bus take you the rest of the way. Next slide, please. So as this all kind of wraps up and we go through this service planning, um, the SRTP in this process, we're going to be looking internally a lot, and we're going to be looking at our own service um, as that's what MTC is asked, and that's kind of what we need to do to get a sense of where we stand um, as a transit provider. But um, ultimately, whether it's regionally or within the county regionally um, or the Bay Area regionally, um, a lot of what we're going to do, the information we're going to provide, the answers, the questions we're going to ask are going to inform that regional effort, um, specifically for our planning, um, service planning integration with Sonoma County and Pebble Transit. Um, what they find from their SATP, RT, SRTP process will help us with um, trying to figure out where are their overlaps in demand, where are their overlaps, um, whether it be where service is allocated or fares. These are all things that we need to also look at on a regional level in this process will allow that to be easier as we move into it. Uh, but probably through the actual SRTP process, as I mentioned, will be more of a look internally than externally. Let me go to the next slide, please. So to give you a sense of how this project will play out, um, we are here in June 2022 at the Council study session. Um, and as we move into the rest of June, we'll start getting our public outreach campaign into July. And with that information, um, come August, September, we will kind of take that information and once we receive it, look at the data that we have on um, how many riders per hour, our general ridership trends, I use stops, things of that nature, kind of what we call a line by line analysis. Um, and also the data that MTC is requesting to compile that. Um, a lot of overlap in there as well. And then in September, MTC is asking for a draft plan to be submitted. Um, so that won't probably not include our service plan, but it will include all the components that MTC is asking for that we spoke about um, in the previous slides. And then once we have comments from them, um, we will kind of re-engage with the service planning part of our process um, and any changes that they provide or changes from comments that they provide. Um, and the public engagement will be us refining a service plan. So this is bringing, we, we've taken in what the public has said, we've looked at the data and kind of decided this is the, this is the direction we want to head, take it back out to the public and let them tell us, you know, yes, you're headed in the right direction. No, I totally agree with that. That's great. Or no, it's all wrong. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen, but um, we want to make sure that there's multiple opportunities for people to comment um, and kind of push us in the right direction. Um, that will hopefully better serve them. And then November, we will bring it back to council um, to review and approve the plan. Um, this will probably at that point be the whole plan, including what MTC is requesting and our service plan. Um, and then we will submit to MTC in December um, for um, their adoption and um, the rest of, with the rest of the uh, transit uh, operators in the Bay Area. Next slide, please. So being that this is study session, we want to create a dialogue. We've, we've set up some questions here that um, 
if council is happy to ask, it would be greatly appreciated and it would certainly help our process. Um, so um, one of those first question is what transit related concerns or opportunities have you observed in your district and across the city? Um, are there changes in the travel needs of your constituents from before the pandemic? What service changes as what service changes do you see as a priority for improving city bus and Santa Rosa paratransit service and access for all residents? And what else should we be exploring the short range transit plan update? Um, and by all means, you know, we don't need to answer all these questions today. You can ruminate on them um, and, you know, get back to us, but we'd have to, to open the, the floor up to comments and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, Council, do we have any questions today? Yes, please. So thank you so much for the presentation. I just have a, um, a couple questions for you. As we are looking at more electrical vehicles and buses, do you have um, an estimate of the cost of the fuel of one of our buses to fill that up? I do not. Um, that might be a Rachel question. She may have the answer, um, but I'm not sure what our current fuel costs are. Um, and and council member, are you specifically asking about the fueling costs for our electric vehicles versus diesel? I'm sorry, I'm reading the prompter in front of me, so I'm sure that I heard you correctly. Yeah, I'm looking at if we were to move our buses to electric, how much would we be saving in fuel costs like over the years? So we're meeting all of our climate goals, but in addition to that, as far as budget goes, are you able to reduce cost of fuel and then actually have more routes, more buses, more employees to drive on those because we're not paying it for something else? Yeah, that's a great question. And how I would, you know, without having, you know, a dollar figure to give you, how we've been thinking about this transition in term, to electric vehicles in terms of the fuel costs is that, you know, we may just sort of break even. Electricity, you know, with the, the rate that we should qualify for as a transit agency, um, it should be less than diesel fuel, especially right now with the current costs. Um, we are paying a higher rate because we are paying for the evergreen plan, which we think is a great thing because, you know, we, we will be fueling these buses with a local renewable electric fuel source, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, until we really get there and understand um, the variable rates for different times of day when we're charging and how that plays out, we're not anticipating a big savings in the fuel arena um, right out of the gate, where we may eventually see it um, more as in maintenance costs. Um, the, the feedback from early adopters of, of battery electric buses is that maintenance costs do tend to run uh, a good deal less because there just aren't as many moving pieces as a different propulsion technology. So um, I, I think it's a little too early to speculate on exactly how much savings that might be, but I think we are uh, assuming that there will be an operating cost savings overall with um, operating the electric vehicle fleet, which you're right, could then go into uh, potentially higher levels of service um, out on the street. So I, I think we're optimistic that that will be the case, but at this point in time, uh, I'd be wildly speculating exactly to what that might be. Uh, but we'll certainly, as we get those buses here in August and have some um, some experience fueling and operating them, you know, we'll be able to provide some feedback within, you know, the coming year. Thank you, that's so helpful. Do we need to invest any more money in infrastructure if we are moving to electric vehicles and have we anticipated where that might be? I know we have a yard maybe, but do we have to have more infrastructure around the city if we're looking at recharging stations for a vehicle of that size? And and has that been considered as part of our goals? I'm, yeah, since I have you on the line, I'm gonna ask these questions. So it's helpful to know, well, thank you. It's absolutely, it's, and they're great questions. They're all very relevant to the capital plan. That's a key component of this entire exercise because we need to make sure we're adequately funding that capital program uh, and, and then maintaining that sustainable service level as well. So uh, in terms of infrastructure, you know, we've, we've been very fortunate with the competitive grants we've applied for. And so we do have uh, about 20 buses worth of in infrastructure funded through federal and state grants. The first phase is breaking ground this week that will fuel up to our first nine buses. And then this year we received um, an additional federal competitive grant that's gonna pay for phase two of that charging infrastructure at the yard. 
So that's the overnight charging where the buses will come in in the day and we'll plug them in and charge them up overnight. Um, so, so we do have those plans in motion and already a pretty good funding program for the, the first two phases of, of the yard infrastructure. Um, we need to do some, some further work to think about en route charging out in the system. And, and that's something we're talking about with Sonoma County Transit. Ultimately, we might be talking with Golden Gate Transit, you know, the other operators in Santa Rosa that are also gonna be transitioning to zero emissions fleet fleets to see if there's an opportunity or a need to create, you know, for example, at the transit mall and Enry charging station or at Cottingtown. Um, we're kind of early days on that analysis right now with the way our system is structured. Uh, it makes more sense to do the overnight charging and it's certainly much more economical, especially as we get our feet wet with this new te technology. But I think we'll evolve into that conversation. And frankly, I, I think that also um, plays into the integrated service planning conversation. Like as we build this integrated service network in Sonoma County, we're going to be need to be thinking about the charging facilities out throughout our service area um, to accommodate the kind of service we need to provide. So again, these are great questions. I don't, I don't have a, a, a perfect answer for you at this point, but they're definitely uh, items on the list for, our, uh, for us to fur further investigate and evaluate. Thank you. And then I just have one last comment to the youth in our community whose ridership is up a pretty good percentage. I just want to thank those that are willing to go and catch the bus. That's something that I did, um, you know, as a child here in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa specific. And then just to see if we had done any outreach to the schools so that they know how to use our apps or have um, our maps available to students so that they actually are really aware of times and routes. And I know we were like, received a little card that showed the times that the buses would be at specific routes when I was young and I know it's probably all on a phone now because I'm that old but uh, just to see if that's been done and since we're going to be in the summertime but going into school session if we could maybe do um, that and you probably already are but just thought that would be good to note as well. Yeah um, great comment and and yeah the the schools and school districts have been wonderful and um, Yuri Koslin who's on the line as well who's the project manager for the UR free program has been doing a ton of outreach and working with school sites and with districts to push out information and you know some particular schools have been more active than others but overall I would say the response has been really positive in terms of us being able to provide information that then can be shared with the students and families I think what there's an is an opportunity to take it to the next level in terms of providing um, you know additional training resources you know we've been talking for a while about doing a short video that shows you how to use our app you know that you know you could watch in a couple minutes and you can understand how to use the real-time information a lot of the youth pick it up like super easily right uh, it's it's some of us older folks who maybe need a little bit more hand holding um but uh you know i think i think we're we're already in that conversation with the school sites to talk about what we could a rollout in the fall to further support that program and make it even easier to use city bus for the um, the youth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any additional questions uh, before we take public comment? Seeing none, let's go ahead and open up public comment. If there's anybody in the public here who would like to make a, a comment, please move forward to the dais. If you're visiting us from Zoom, go ahead and raise your hand. If you're dialing, please hit star nine. Do we have any pre-recorded messages? Um, we have no pre-recorded messages. I see nobody coming forward in the council chamber and no raised hands. Very well, let's go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the council. Council, uh, before we go into recess, are there any questions? seeing shaking heads uh, it looks like it's time for us to take a recess uh, it is now 325 we'll, we will be back at four o'clock thank you
Hi, John, this is Stephanie. Um, can you do a quick mic check and, um, oh, I see you. I don't see you. Okay. Um, I, I see you and hear you. That's all that matters. <laughs> hold, on, hold on, hold on a second, Stephanie. What was that, Brian? Um, I'm swiping to the left and I'm not, nothing's happening. Um, you know, I'm not, oh, here we go. Um, let's see. Here's more than 60, um, or, um, not seeing the U is what I, I normally do. Do you still want me to keep my video active, John? You can just nod your head so you can run through this, or are we good? I think Stephanie, you can you can take. Me. I think you can. Um, Brian, is it okay if she, if she takes me off video? Yeah, you can take me off video, Steph. Okay. Well, you're coming in clear. Your video is coming in clear, and we can hear you. Hear you. Okay, just that's fine. good. And I'm not getting any. And I'm not getting any feedback. So that's that's a good thing. That's a well. good thing. I mean, yes. I just can't see. That's I can't see any. It's, so it's as though I'm not in the meeting visually, but I am coming across um, vocally. Oh, okay. On our end, you are coming and through. And I can't also be. Okay. Well, you are coming okay. in and I can't, visually. I can't change. And I can't change the view. I can't change my view. It like, like, um, looks like a little bit Okay, well, like we, we, can see, the way it would we can see you and hear you, so that's what's important, so that you can make any motions or um, introductions or comments, so. And we can see you just fine. Okay. We are on a recess right now, so um, just so you know that, that may be why you're not seeing the chamber. 
Okay. Um, but yeah, Brian was Brian is concerned that uh, that it's that I'm not really as as far as my iPad is concerned, I'm kind of not altogether there. But um, we, that may be as close as 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 we're going to get. Okay. Well, as long as we have you for audio, then I think we're fine as far as on our end and your iPad. I know you use to access any documents, but we can certainly wing it and assign anything that you need okay. to end somebody else. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. We have we 10 minutes. I would keep that open. You know, this Both may be as good as we're, as we're gonna get, but well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Brian about it. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Do, do you think we should just let, let it, let sleeping dogs lie, Brian? You're still, you want might wanna mute your, um, yourself John thanks
All right, good evening, council members. How's everybody doing? Welcome to tonight's city council meeting. This is as hybrid as they come. As you'll notice, we have five council members in the chamber. We have myself and council member Sawyer who are zooming in. Uh, let's go ahead and begin today's meeting with a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Schwedhelm? Here. Council member Sawyer? Here. Council member Rogers? Present. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present. All right, thank you so much. And before we get into our items for the day, a quick PSA for folks who are watching. Today is election day. Uh, if you have not returned your ballot yet, you still can. Remember that all ballots in California now can be postmarked on election day and still count, and you don't even have to put a stamp on it. So if you haven't voted yet, uh, go vote. Uh, with that, we'll get into our regular agenda for today, and we're going to start with a proclamation. Uh, we have some folks who are in the chambers here to accept it, including my good friend Kirsten, uh, but I'll turn it over to Councilmember Rogers for item 6.1. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on September 22nd, 1862, with an effective date of January 1st, 1863, and whereas Juneteenth is the oldest known public celebration of the end of slavery in the United States, commemorating the day when those enslaved in Galveston, Texas, finally received word of their freedom on June 19, 1865, and whereas last year President Joe Biden signed a bill to establish June 19 as Juneteenth National Independence Day, officially making Juneteenth a U.S. federal holiday, and whereas the Santa Rosa Juneteenth celebration was founded in 1954 by Miss Martrell, Mother Perry, and whereas the local Martin Luther King Juneteenth Community Festival celebration was merged in 1970 to keep the dream of Dr. King and the spirit of Juneteenth alive. This year, marking the 52nd anniversary of the celebration in Santa Rosa and whereas the 52nd annual Martin Luther King Juneteenth Community Festival Celebration. Our history is our strength, sponsored by over 14 community organizations through Sonoma County, will take place on Saturday, June 18th, 2022, at Martin Luther King Jr. Park in South Park neighborhood and is free and open to community members of all ages. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Chris Rogers, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, recognize and acknowledge the historical significance of this celebration and do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2022 as Juneteenth. 
Thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, and do we have some folks who are at the podium ready to speak? We do, Mayor. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Sandy to go ahead and run public comment on this item. Uh, on behalf of the Juneteenth Committee, I'm proud to be here to accept this proclamation uh, along with Kirsten, who is also part of that committee. We have to give a shout out to Nancy Rogers, who has worked diligently um, for this year and previous years to bring this community event to Santa Rosa. We're really excited about this year being the 52nd year of Juneteenth. We have a fabulous, um, a fabulous lineup of musicians and community organizations and and we even have um, just a number of activities for children as well as adults. And so I'm really proud to be part of this committee. We've been working for over four plus months, mm -hmm. you know, to really bring it this year. So we are bringing it to Santa Rosa and we appreciate the proclamation in honor of this very important federal liberation holiday. Thank you all, and I'll just add, we will be doing a march in honor of Vince Harper, who I know holds a dear place in all of our hearts. So if you all would love to join us in that effort, marching from Juilliard Park to MLK Park, we welcome you at about 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. Do we have anybody else uh, looking to provide comments in the chambers? Um, I don't see anybody walking towards the podium, and I see no raised hands. Okay, we'll bring it back. Council members, does anybody want to make any comments? Perfect. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a two-minute break here so that a picture can be taken. Uh, all council members who are there who want to jump in, feel free. I don't know if there's a way that you can get John and my heads in the background so we can participate, but uh, I guess we'll just have to miss the photo op. Mayor, we will be sure to capture you and John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, I'm actually gonna jump back for a quick second here. I inadvertently glossed over uh, our uh, acting city attorney's report from closed session. Let me double check and make sure and see if there's a report out from that. Uh, there is, uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, Council Members, uh, item 2.1, conference with labor negotiators. Uh, council met with the team in closed session and gave direction. All right, short and sweet. Let's see if we have any public comment on the report out. Um, I see nobody walking towards the podium and no raised hands on, in Zoom. Okay. Uh, Madam City Manager, if you could go ahead and jump to item number seven. That's our staff briefings for tonight. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. Item 7.1, COVID-19 response update. As of today, Sonoma County has reported an average daily case rate of 34.3 per 100,000 residents. As case rates continue its downward trend, the County of Sonoma does not foresee a need to reinstate a mask mandate. However, it is important to remember that vaccinations remain the most effective means to protect yourself from getting seri seriously ill and being hospitalized to, due to COVID-19. For more information about the status of COVID-19 in our community, testing locations, and vaccine informa information for all ages, please go to socoemergency.org. Thank you. Item 7.2 is our community empowerment plan update. 
Uh, Deputy Director Tellis will present the report. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, Mayor Day is here, uh, members of the council um, here with the Community Empowerment Plan report. We are very grateful to report that um, we are back in community. Um, so between the, we've also been taking some um, information on how many community members we've, we've reached out to since March. So from March to May of 2022, we've engaged with over 2,800 community members via events, tabling opportunities and presentations in the community. Uh, we've led or provided thought partnership or development for 12 different community events, including the Mary Lou Loretta Reveal event, Earth Day, Latino Family Educational Summit, South Park Ice Cream Social, Wildfire Ready, and more. Um, we uh, were invited by community to six community partner events, including Cultural Heritage Day at Rosen University Prep, the Wellness Fair at LC Allen High School, uh, Four C's Preschool Enrollment drive through LC Allen High School ELAC meeting, and two different Cesar Chavez Language Academy outreach, uh, youth outreach events. We've also worked on activating the crisis response team to address community needs after violent occurrences in, in specific neighborhoods have taken place, um, or where a violence prevention partnership was requested by community partners. And these calls were due to gang incidents, uh, de-escalation and mediation needs, or community outreach and follow-up in, in a neighborhood. Uh, so we've also held four town hall meetings, uh, three of them in person um, being Measure O educational meetings and also an introductory town hall with our city manager, uh, Markeisha Smith. And we've launched and culminated the school outreach pilot program, which we will have more information on um, soon. Uh, in terms of the results, we had a pre and post assessment. This was a direct result um, for the need for social emotional training and participation for youth that are gang interested or gang involved. And our team's been invited to participate in um, this year's Juneteenth event at MLK Park uh, on June 18th. So we are excited to be uh, participating there. With the Mary Lou Lowrider engagement, um, the Mary Lou has been out and about town. So many of you may have seen the Mary Lou at the Pride Parade. Um, she was a hit. And so uh, also she was out at the South Park Ice Cream Social and Public Safety Day, Wildfire Ready, and um, many other uh, programs and events. And you can see her again at the Peggy Sue Car Show and Cruise uh, this Saturday. Um, again at Juneteenth at the Father's Day Show and Shine at Juilliard Park on June 19th, on National Night Out in Roseland on August 2nd, and the Fiesta de Independencia at the LDC in September. Um, so with the Multicultural Roots Project, um, this month the project will share stories in honor of both Pride and Juneteenth. We've also been invited by the Arts in Public Places program to display um, a multicultural roots project exhibit at the Finley Community Center during the month of August. The exhibit is set to start at um, on August 1st with a reception tentatively scheduled on August 11th and we'll have uh, more info on that as well. Uh, for the month of July, due to staffing shortages, we will be pausing new feature stories during uh, that month because we're gonna be using this time to recruit and train a, a new intern to assist us with the project, um, as well as to prepare for the exhibit at Finley. Um, we also were at the Los Cien event, uh, which we were really grateful to be able to participate and um, be back in community for. The Hearn Community Hub project, um, there's been a lot of community questions um, and excitement around this. We're very excited. Um, on June 21st, we'll be bringing this item um, as a consent item to council to help us finalize the process of hiring a final candidate consultant who will be working with our team on a community needs assessment for what will ultimately be a multicultural center space or whatever the community deems to be the need in, in sort of that area. So uh, once approved, the consultant will begin working with our team on community meetings, Getting, um, getting folks to the table. And um, there was, sorry, one other item regarding that that just absolutely has slipped my mind, but um, 
there is a Let's Connect page. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. There is a Let's Connect page. Um, if you want to sign up, your community member, you want to sign up and you want to make sure that you're able to um, participate in the community listening sessions and the community input, um, we will make sure to, um, um, to notify a community. So that is available and that is the end of my report. Thank you. Council, do we have any questions for the deputy director? All right, I'm not seeing any. Let's go to public comment on our staff briefings for tonight. <clears throat> one, one moment, please. May I make a comment, please? Yes, please just give us one minute, Dwayne. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland and I'd like to thank the <clears throat> director of the community engagement effort for the report that was just given. At the same time, I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Natalie Rogers and Council Member Alvarez for coming into Roseland on the 1st of June and talking to folks in person. It's become a relatively rare situation to have that occur during this COVID activity. So I wanted to mention the COVID response and say that it's time to open up our government again to the people. It's great having folks being able to zoom in, but I'm from a community where many people are not on the internet. And if they use the library to get on the internet, there are restrictions that might keep them from being able to participate in many of those meetings that community director just spoke about. One of the dilemmas <clears throat> that we face over in Roseland is we need to have more action on a lot of activities a little bit less talk. We got some really bad graffiti problems. The city used to have a graffiti removal team that would come over and take that out. We've had gang killings recently, and that has meant even more gang graffiti. That's a form of community engagement for those people and their community. We need to overcome them. We need to wipe that graffiti off of our neighborhood. It's a stain upon the regular community who would like to be engaged with our city. My hope is that the city's approach <clears throat> will broaden, have more in-person meetings out in our community and advertise them at our local library. I never saw anything about any of these meetings that this director just spoke about. They happen at schools, so parents are getting involved and that's good. But there's a whole bunch of other taxpayers who support the bonds for the schools. They should be involved in this community engagement activity also. So I'm hoping, and I know it's a long shot, but let's get the people more involved. Now that we're coming out from under the cover of COVID, if you will, let's look at it like the opportunity is here for community engagement to actually occur with community activities such as neighborhood cleanups. Over in my area, we citizens have been cleaning up debris in a park that's been left to kind of fall by the wayside under COVID. The city can do maintenance, doesn't need reports to do maintenance. So with all that said, thanks for even trying to have some community engagement. Um, Mayor, I see nobody else walking towards the podium and no raised hands. All right, thank you so much. We'll move on to item number eight. Good afternoon again, Mayor. Um, uh, the city attorney's litigation report is included in your materials. There are no settlements to report. I'll just briefly mention that our office has 30 pending litigation matters. Many of those are in active phases of discovery. About five are proceeding to trial. We do have one new claim uh, alleging that a car was hit by San Rosa Police Department uh, a police officer when exiting the parking lot, and that is the end of my report. Thank you. Okay. Council, any questions? Council Member Fleming? Yes, Mayor. 
Oh, I apologize. I thought you had a question. No, sir. Thank you. Okay. We'll see if there's any public comment on our quarterly reports from our city attorney's office. Um, may, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor, I see nobody walking towards the podium and no hands raised. All right. We'll keep moving through our agenda then. Thank you. Let's go to item number nine. Are there any statements of abstention by council members on tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to our mayor's and council members' reports. Oh, I apologize. Before we do that, I, I skipped over the city manager's uh, report as well. Let's go back uh, to our esteemed city manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, on behalf of the City Manager, Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager, um, I mean, we're excited to talk about and give an update on a new mural by Rough Edge Collective uh, that is being placed on the Fifth Street parking garage. Uh, the site-specific mural titled Help Each Other Grow by Rough Edge Collective uh, with artists MJ Lindo Lawyer and Joshua Lawyer broke ground on May 25th and is scheduled to be completed by June 8th. 2022. A dedication ceremony will be announced soon. The primary goal of the project has been to increase the visibility of often overlooked Fifth Street Garage while enhancing the pedestrian experience. The art will not only improve the aesthetics of the garage, it will distinguish it from neighborhoods, neighboring structures, serving as a creative wayfinding and identification element. The public art program released a call for artists in February of 2021, seeking qualified Northern California-based artists and artist teams. After a public survey and initial selection process, three finalists were identified and invited to submit design proposals. The selection panel ultimately chose Santa Rosa-based Rough Edge Collective for the project. The selection panel was comprised of six people representing downtown residents, downtown businesses, the Art and Public Places Committee, art professionals, and the city's parking division. If you're interested in more information, please visit www.srcity.org forward slash Fifth Street Garage Art, all one word. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present that, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Assistant City Manager. Uh, and Mr. Assistant City Attorney, did you have anything to add in addition to your report? I do not, thank you. Okay. Uh, Council, any questions for the Assistant City Manager? All right, let's check on public comment. Uh, Mayor, I see nobody walking towards the podium. And please. I see no raised hands. All right. We'll come back to our city council members' reports. Is there anybody who'd like to provide a report tonight? Don't all raise your hands at once. All right, Mr. Vice Mayor, kick us off. Appreciate that, Mayor. First of all, I want to thank Council Member Swalham for being the provider of candy at the Pride uh, <laughs> Parade. Uh, I, at first, I thought it was, everyone was cheering me on as, as I was handing candy out. Little did I know that they were actually cheering on the Mary Lou uh, vehicle. It was the hit of the day, and uh, what a great investment by our community to really get people involved in, in city government. So I have to applaud the different departments and the different community organizations that were involved in, in the creation of the Mary Lou. Uh, also on, on, I think uh, Magali touched on it, we had a uh, town hall meeting and really the first town hall meeting in in district one with an actual elected representative that that specifically uh is responsible for the people of district one and i'm not ashamed that the turnout was low uh i wish that it had been greater but it's definitely a starting point and i i look forward to to creating more involvement and and more engagement but the seed has been planted and i'm very proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish thus far and i definitely look forward to even more involvement in the near future thank you mayor thank you council member we'll go to council member Swedhelm. thank you mr mayor would like to uh, echo our vice mayor's comments it was pretty funny as we're walking there and everyone starts applauding oh it's got to be us oh 
Mary Lou. We had Gustavo behind the uh, wheel of the Mary Lou, and he did an awesome job along with Lieutenant Cooker uh, going through the route. But uh, a wonderful event. I really appreciate all the staff and uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Jason Nutt, who was also there, and Socorro who helped organize it. It was really uh, a wonderful event. Um, also, just wanted to do a shout out. Uh, I was able to attend the Santa Rosa Scuba Divers opening night out at Doyle Park on May 26. Really encourage others to be out there. Uh, had a little hiccups, as would be expected first time, but um, some good balls being played there. It's a great community event. It was nice to see so many uh, folks show up there. Thanks. Councilmember Fleming. As it turns out, everybody wants to talk about the Pride Parade, so I'm going to talk about it as well. First of all, um, I was offered a seat as an honoree, which was quite hilarious because uh, it had my name on it, but it didn't have my title. And, and many people came up to me and said, we're so glad you're here, but who are you? So <laughs> it was both hilarious and humbling. It was, <laughs> it was pretty great. Um, but the thing that I wanted to highlight about it that just filled me up with so much joy and happiness was that our streets were full with so many people and you know, it seemed like at least half of the folks who were there were children and there was a lot of uh, so many pets and it, it was just a beautiful example of what I know everybody imagined our square to be and how much effort people have put into getting us to this point where we can have a vibrant downtown and how heart-wrenching it has been the last few years to see it so quiet and it just filled me up with hope and made me so excited for, for the rest of the summer and to see what comes next. So um, thank you, Mayor, for that opportunity. And I wanna thank Sonoma County Pride for all the work it took to pull off an incredible event, as well as our Office of Community Engagement and Socorro Shields, as well as the rest of the council. It was a not to be missed, even if you were in Reno event. <laughs> Did I see a hand from Councilmember McDonald? I sure do. Um, so I have a few different things to report on. Um, yesterday I was able to attend the Santa Rosa JC College um, Foundation, the president's address to the community and awards ceremony. And I just wanna do a shout out to our incredible Santa Rosa JC for not only the education that they provide to our kids and, and those who wanna take classes, not even kids, um, but the expansion that they're doing specifically in construction and career technical education and the STEM building and the housing that's going to be built there and so that you know the students that are attending there that want to have an on-campus um, experience of living in housing or those who need housing so that they can continue their education they'll have that opportunity and so it was so wonderful to see um, Pam uh, uh, Chanter uh, received the President's Medallion, a very well-deserved award to her who has done so much not only for our community but actually around our nation and in the world. So uh, a congratulatory um, and thank you to those who have um, done so much for our community. Uh, next, I want to say thanks to the Parks Department for the tour last week. I was able to go out and tour two different um, parks to see how much they're doing with the very small staff that they have. Um, we are not back up to where we were when cuts were made to departments, and I just want to thank them. I was able to meet somebody who has worked for uh, the City of Santa Rosa for 48 years, um, and so it's incredible to see that much dedication and, and thank you to um, Mr. Castro for taking me out to meet with our employees and, and really thank them for their dedication to the city of Santa Rosa and, and what they do to make sure that we are living in such a beautiful community. Um, so thank you so much to them. And last but not least, I would like to thank um, the fire department. Um, I apologize for not being at the Pride Parade last week. I had to be taken out of the community for a family the emergency for one of my grandsons. And uh, I just want to say thank you to the fire department for a few different things. One, for their dedication when we are in crisis or in emergency situations and how they work with community members and reassure them that they are there to help and support them. And their response time to community um, emergencies is incredible. And also thank you for the training. I have never been in more pain after I attended 
attended that training for a, a full day. It was exhausting. I had to go home and lay on the couch for several hours after that. Um, but it was very intense to see the work that they do. Um, the equipment that they use and how strong they physically have to be and how quick witted they have to be to be able to think on their feet in emergency situations. And so I just want to give my heartfelt thanks to them and appreciate all they do. And, um, and, and the helmet is heavier than you think. And they had to literally carry me out of the burning building because I could not lift the pack. So I was quite annoyed with my, um, weakness physically and so I um, I just want to thank them for all their assistance that day it was it was quite an event so I appreciate it all right thank you council member council member Rogers thank you mayor um, on June 1st I was able to meet with spiritual leaders in district 7 um, and happy that city manager was able to attend and I would like to thank her for that um, we looked at ways to cultivate relationships and uh, transmit information between the city um, and also the congregations that we have in our com community, collaborate and opportunities um, to collaborate um, within the city. Um, so that was actually very nice and we are going to uh, attempt to meet regularly. So. Um, and on May 24th, um, we had a study session here. Um, and in that study session, it looks like we went over uh, police oversight, independent uh, police auditor, and civilian review models. Um, I was unable to attend, and I apologize due to being out of town at my um, son's graduation. Um, one, I would like to apologize um, to community members and to anyone that assumed my absence showed a lack of support for uh, wanting transparency, accountability, um, and the possibility of explore the possibility of exploration uh, to improve practices within the city um, around public safety. That was not my intent. Um, when I was informed of the outcome. Um, of the vote, I was disappointed to say the least. Um, I know many will not understand, but account accountability does not um, right wrongs, but it helps people to feel that no one is above the law and that everyone will be held accountable. Um, Mayor, I apologize to you, the, the city manager, um, and my peers on council um, and the staff for all the hard work that they put in um, to the study session and for me um, not being here. I know that as a council member, it is really hard for us to juggle both family um, and trying to be here um, to, to run the city. Um, and, and this is one where I feel like I dropped the ball and, um, but I love my babies and I, I wouldn't take it back. So I, I do apologize. Um, but I am respectfully requesting, um, if there is a way, um, and I'm not sure that there is, I would like to make a motion to bring back for further discussion, the police oversight, independent police auditor and civilian review models, because I do believe that if all council members were present um, during the study session, that the outcome would not have been the same as it was. So I'm not. If, if there is a motion on the on the floor, I would I would be honored to to second that motion. OK, uh, and council members, what happens now is uh, because it's not an agendized item, we don't talk uh, about the specifics about it. What we do is, as you'll see later in tonight's agenda, we'll agendize the question uh, for our next available council meeting where we can weigh in on whether or not folks uh, would like to reconsider uh, or, or bring that topic back for discussion. Um, and so if that works, there's a motion in a second. We don't need any other information, uh, but we will bring that on the item, uh, that item for discussion uh, about whether to reconsider. Thank you, Mayor, for hearing my report out. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, 
Nothing to report, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to start uh, by uh, talking about the, the Pride Parade. Uh, I was not able to attend on Friday and I'll, or on, excuse me, on Saturday, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but I did want to start with a big thank you to all of the staff who worked hard, uh, both at the city and, and externally from the city, from the planning committee who worked very hard to plan uh, the entire weekend worth of events, uh, and then also the folks who plugged in when inevitably something went wrong. And uh, as I was uh, heading out of town on Thursday, I was on emails and text messages uh, as things inevitably were going wrong and seeing just a, a huge wave of support from our interim chief, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, from our staff, to make sure that the events that had been planned were able to go off without a hitch. And so I just wanted to say kudos to the team. Uh, it from the, from the pictures and every report back that I've gotten from folks, looked like just such an incredible community event and it wouldn't have happened without people going above and beyond uh, to make sure that they got past uh, some last minute barriers. Uh, so a big thank you on that. And then my report out, and I can uh, definitely do more of this when I'm back in Santa Rosa in person, uh, but I've uh, been spending the last couple of days at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, meeting with mayors from around the country uh, to talk about the issues that they're facing and talk about uh, what resources are available. Uh, the, the conference opened with a quote that uh, good mayors borrow ideas and great mayors steal them. Uh, and so in that vein, I'm coming back with a whole bunch of great ideas that I've heard from other mayors around the country who are dealing with some of the same same issues that we are uh, and how they're addressing them. Uh, staff also was kind enough to load me up with uh, the alphabet soup of meeting uh, while I've been gone, uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Justice, EPA, uh, every single one going in looking for funding for the city's priorities, such as the Hernover Crossing in response. Uh, some of those other things that we hold hold dear. Uh, so I'm coming back uh, armed with uh, quite a bit of funding opportunities for us that, that staff's going to pursue. Uh, and then today I, I made my way to New York and I'm at the U.S. Conference of, May or excuse me, the uh, Yale Mayors and CEOs College, uh, talking with CEOs from around the country about economic development, gun control, uh, other issues that are pressing uh, on the national level, and, and bringing really the experience from Santa Rosa and talking about our uh, disaster uh, responses. Um, and so wanted to let folks know that's why I'm not there in the chambers, but that doesn't mean that we're not all working hard and I'll be bringing uh, more of that information back here in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, and we'll be back tomorrow with you all. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and see if there's public comment on the report outs from our council members tonight. Um, Mayor, I see nobody moving towards the podium. We have no raised hands and no voicemail public comment. Okay. And then as I mentioned, uh, last week, uh, our last council meeting, we did have a motion for reconsideration of an item. It was item 15.1 on the May 24th agenda. Uh, that motion was made by council member Sawyer and I seconded the motion. So tonight, what council is considering is not the merits of that item. It's not the merits of item 15.1. Tonight, the council has to weigh in on whether or not we would like to reconsider that. And so we'll take public comment on it first. It does already have a motion in a second, so we won't need that. Uh, but then if four council members agree uh, that this item should be reheard, it will go on a future council agenda for reconsideration. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to public comment to see if anybody has an opinion that they'd like to share about whether the council should reconsider item 15.1 uh, from our May 24th council meeting. Um, Mayor, nobody's moving towards the podium and I see no raised hands and we have no voicemail public comment on this item. All right, thank you. So there is a motion in a second that's on the floor. Uh, let's go ahead and call the vote, if you would. One moment. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes.
All right, thank you, Council. We'll go ahead and bring that back on a future Council uh, agenda. And for the public, uh, it'll likely be uh, at the next one, although I believe that the City Attorney's Office is going to have to weigh in to make sure that the timing of everything works uh, correctly. So keep an eye on the future agenda items as they pop up. We have no minutes for tonight. So Madam City Manager, if you could go to the consent calendar, please. Item 12.1 is a motion receive 2021 general plan, inclusionary housing and growth management annual review report and waive council policy 200-01 requirement for a joint study session on the general plan annual review. Item 12.2 is a resolution, Ninth Amendment to General Services Agreement number F000308 with Granicus LLC. Item 12.3 is a resolution, First Amendment to Agreement F002155 with Acela Incorporated for the Acela CRM My Santa Rosa tool. Item 12.4, resolution, approval of one tow vendor to the tow vendor franchisee list for police generated operations. Item 12.5 is a resolution, approval, waiver of competitive bid and issuance of blanket purchase orders for asphalt concrete supplies to Bodine Company Inc. and Sire Industries um, Incorporated. Item 12.6 is a resolution authorizing submittal of a grant application for improvements to Kiwana Springs Community Park. Item 12.7 is a resolution state of good repair program authorization to apply for the annual, annual, annual formula allocation and project approval for fiscal year 2022-2023. Item 12.8 is a resolution, Transportation Development Act Article 4 and State Transit Assistance Annual Formula Allocation Claim Submittal. Item 12.9 is a resolution, Acceptance and Appropriation of the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development's Infill Infrastructure Grant Program for the Downtown Santa Rosa Qualified Infill Area. Item 1210 is a resolution, First Amendment to Professional Services Agreement F002049 with Cooperative Personnel Services doing business as CPS HR Consulting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Manager. Councilor, are there any questions on the consent calendar? Yes, Mayor Rogers, may I pull item 12.9, please? Sure, we'll pull that one for now and we'll discuss that one separately. Mayor. All right, you go ahead. Um, having no questions, um, I suppose I'll wait till later. I just wanted to say that there was a couple of great things on the, the consent calendar, but I'll wait until after public comment. Okay, I'll, have, uh, I'll come back for comments at that point. Anything else, Council? Uh, Mr. Assistant City Manager, just as a point of clarification for the public, uh, previous direction, and this is for item 12.5, previous direction from the council has been uh, that we would not patronize uh, the Bodine asphalt plant so long as they were not in compliance with city rules and regulations. Uh, can you give us an update on where that sits uh, as this contract comes before us? Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I do have assistance by the City Attorney's Office if needed. Um, at this point in time, complaints have been filed in certain areas, but, at the, but there's not necessarily an open code enforcement case or violation at, uh, at this point. Uh, should one come and be um, put into effect, uh, then the uh, maintenance team would not procure asphalt from that particular plant or facility until that violation is cleared and identified as cleared from our uh, building department. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's go to, and as, uh, as was mentioned, we'll take uh, items uh, except for 12.9, uh, correct, Council Member? 
Well, just a point of clarification on that. Would I be able to just ask a clarifying question and then we could do them in gross? Yeah, go ahead. If it's uh, if it's a clarifying question, feel free. If you need to pull it for further discussion, uh, then we can do so as well. But go ahead and ask your clarifying questions sure. on it first. My clarifying question is um, just so I was aware as reading the item, is does this specify a specific area in um, the grant where we would have to put housing and is it drawn on a map somewhere so we know if we're receiving grant money specifically the area where we would need to then move for approval or um, look at the land and i apologize if it wasn't clear before so, thanks good evening mayor rogers and members of council i'm megan bassinger director of housing and community services and this specific grant is for um, an area that we developed with the Renewal Enterprise District, known as the Downtown Santa Rosa Qualified Info Area. It identifies four specific housing projects, which are listed in the stack report, and they are the Caritas Homes Phase 1, which is currently under construction, the Cannery at Railroad Square, which is adjacent to the Smart Site, and then two market rate, um, primarily market rate developments, one Santa Rosa Avenue, and then 425 Humboldt. So those would be the housing sites that would benefit from this grant uh, funding. And there also will be an infrastructure project for the city, which is the Southbound Turn Pocket at 3rd and B Street. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions. And Megan, can you clarify, these are specific to the developments between 3rd and B Streets, correct? So the, the Turn Pocket is a separate project that the city identified within the general area that was defined and then the four housing projects are located within the boundaries of the area we drew. So all the funds will go towards those five projects, four housing projects and then the infrastructure. That, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. I'd be comfortable moving and gross then with that um, response. Thank you. Okay, so we will not pull item 12.9 at this time. Uh, so let's go to public comment. If you have a comment on item 12.1 through 12.10, now is the time for your comment. Um, and uh, Dwayne DeWitt is heading towards the podium. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, and I do believe because item 12.9 is important, I should be allowed to speak separately on that for the full three minutes. Item 12.1, the general plan process. I and, believe and Mr. You DeWitt, not... you've got your three minutes for the whole consent calendar. I just want to make sure we're clear. Well, once again, keeping the public at a disadvantage, I do believe that the entire general plan opportunities have been disadvantaging the low income and unconnected members of the community. You who are well off might laugh and say, oh, well, that's no big deal. But this whole general plan process under cover of COVID has essentially locked out most of the community. I would be willing to say that less than 1% of our community residents have been able to actually participate in this general plan process. I do believe that once again, it disadvantages the community if you take away the joint planning commission and housing authority meeting in public. That's coming up this week, and they're doing it only by Zoom. And they said, well, we can't have the public there. We don't have the staff. I think this is just a canard, that they are just keeping us from being involved, especially at the housing authority, which funds a lot of projects, but doesn't really get a lot of housing that is for the extremely low income population of our city built. And that'll come out later in this report because you're not really presenting it to the community. The community is not seeing how we're getting cheated on the amount of money that's going forward and how you want to raise the population of Santa Rosa by 2035 to another 60,000 people, according to what this report says. Now, those are big changes. And if that were to come forward, that would require the people in this community to take on perhaps added tax burdens and increased infrastructure provision, which hasn't been happening just with the basic building going on over in Roseland. 
thousands of housing units are coming forward and we're neglecting the infrastructure that's necessary for the people that live here. That's what should be in this general plan, how to deal with what we have going on right now. But it's not. And you've essentially cheated the people out of the opportunity to actually participate in the discussions. And now you're saying, well, it's all good because we're together on it. We're working on it behind the scenes. Nothing should be behind the scenes on a general plan, especially when it comes to involving the Planning Commission and the Housing Authority. Those joint meetings were put there on purpose in the past to make sure that the public could participate. If you take them out, it shows how you don't care. So actions speak louder than words. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I see nobody walking towards the podium, but we do have two raised hands. Um, uh, Gregory Ferron, uh, are you able to speak and see the screen? Yes, I can, and I can see the timer. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. I, too, am concerned about um, item 12.1. Um, but I'm, I'm wanting to tell the council that usually the consent calendar is full of things that are not as really exciting. And this one seems to have quite a few that, in my opinion, are. Um, you're getting lots of money for things you're doing right. Uh, and, you're, and several of the items, uh, independently of uh, the whole collection, um, are warranted you know, comments saying, good job, council. Uh, the one that I want to comment on, actually there's two, 12.1 and 12.9, because they're kind of um, connected. Uh, Duane is right. Uh, you have not provided housing for the extremely low. The report on 12.1 um, says, gives you the documentation of what the last six years of your housing development has been. 2% of the extremely low need housing has been built. 2% percent the above moderate which is the other end of the scale has had 113 percent every bit of their need has been met uh that's sad uh, it shows how the market and your subsidy of low-income housing has not kept up you the market's providing plenty of housing the upper income has gotten what they needed uh, I, I really don't understand their complaints about not being able to find housing. Uh, I compared to the low income and the extremely low income and the very low income, all at the other end of the scale, oh, come on, there's no housing being built. Now, having said that, the report also identifies four projects, Caritas, Cannery, the other two that Megan talked about, which you are building and have a tremendous amount of extremely low. They're at 37% of the need of the housing being aimed at extremely low. So I'm on one hand saying the past has been miserable. On the other hand, I'm also saying you're doing a much better job. Uh, kudos. Uh, and I hope those projects get built and I hope they get occupied by people who are extremely low. I'm going to do everything I can to help that. Um, so keep it up. Uh, the only other comment on any other item is I really think we ought to take a new look at um, the towing contract. Uh, you really can do a better job of allowing those people who have their vehicles towed to retrieve their possessions, to get the vehicle back. And we've got to take a wholly different look at how we help those people keep their homes. Um, if my home needed something from the city, I'd get it and you'd be supportive. Uh, I don't understand why you're not helping those vehicles. Um, and then, hold on just a moment, please. Um, uh, Adina Flores, please. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Council. I had requested earlier today to pull consent item 12.10 for discussion. Uh, once again, this was not pulled. Um, this is funny because the County of Sonoma does the same thing when I request for consent items to be pulled. Um, so this is pertaining to the approval of the First Amendment to Professional Services Agreement number F002049 with Cooperative Personnel Services, DBA, CPS, HR Consulting to increase time of performance and increase compensation 
in the amount of 80,000 for a total contract amount not to exceed $185,000, 300, sorry, 185, $360 to provide professional human resources services to temporarily support the department with current vacancies and to appropriate 80,000 from the unassigned general fund balance. I cannot find a business by this name that is legally registered with the college Sorry, there was a plane flying over me. Um, I could not find a business by this name that is legally registered with the California Secretary of State. According to the public records database for Sacramento County, where this uh, business is based, the fictitious business name expired in 2016. I'm unsure as to why competitive bids were waived for this contract upon the initial approval of the agreement in January 2022. Since the tax ID must be verified via a W-9 when initially establishing business with the contractor, that's standard practice with any corporation or government entity, why was this completely bypassed? Um, I'm looking for clarification on this. Uh, just for reference, um, the L.C. Allen High School Foundation also just accepted millions of dollars um, of donations, but uh, they were actually legally suspended with the Franchise Tax Board. Um, and uh, Healdsburg Forever, who's distributing millions of dollars worth of grant funds, they're also not legally registered to operate within the state of California. So I just really like to know where our taxpayer dollars are going because right now I'm extremely confused. Thank you. I see no more hands raised and um, there's no voicemail public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Assistant City Manager, do you want to answer that last question or weigh in on that? Or, or Madam City Manager? Um, Mayor, are you referencing CPS? Amy Reed. Yes, correct. So, so CPS Consultant has been in business for as long as I know, since about 1985. So we've been using CPS Consulting um, here since I arrived for COVID. Um, for to augment our personnel because of staff shortages. Um, the reason why it's not bid because it was just um, an amendment to our current contract. Um, I have Amy Reeves um, that can pop up on the line if you have any additional questions. Amy, did you have anything to add? I did. Thank you, Mayor Rogers, and good evening, members of the City Council. I'm Amy Reeve, Director of Human Resources. I did want to respond to the caller's concern and clarify that CPS is actually a joint powers authority, a JPA, and therefore they actually have filed with the Secretary of State instead of as a regular corporation. So that might provide some clarity to the question. If there's any additional questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much. So, Council, do we does anybody have any additional questions on the consent calendar? Okay, uh, Councilmember Fleming, you had uh, some comments you'd like to make. Yes, I wanted to thank the um, Public Works Department for their follow through on item twelve point six. Um, in terms of getting uh, the grant submittal for Kiwana Springs Park, I know that a lot of folks are really looking forward to the day. And sometimes we joke about whether or not, you know, our children or grandchildren or great grandchildren will ever get to use that park. And so when I saw it pop up on the consent calendar, I thought, oh, you know, it's a shame that it won't get any airtime. And I wanted to make sure that staff knew that this is a big deal to our community and we're really, really grateful. And then I wanted to note on um, item 12.9 that the um the getting this funding for the infill infrastructure is going to be one of the pieces that's going to it's going to be a piece on which the capstone sort of ties together with what i was talking about seeing downtown lit up with the pride parade we're going to have so much affordable housing and more density downtown and it's going to make our downtown business community more vibrant and it's going to be a virtuous cycle so while the consent calendar doesn't usually get a lot of attention i felt that today was a day to to thank staff um, both in housing and community services thank you to megan and your staff and jason and your staff well done all right thank you council member are there any other comments from council 
Mr. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you. On item 12.4, we heard a statement about removal of property from vehicles that are being towed. Um, are there any other agencies that whose policy allows for an individual to remove their items from a vehicle that has been towed? And this is item 12.4. Do we see Lieutenant on the line? Yes, one moment, please. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, so this is a franchise agreement. I, I don't know if we're getting into, or are you asking if people can remove items from a vehicle that's been towed? That's not what, I don't believe that's what this is. This is what we're no, discussing. Sir. No, sir, my question is if there's any other agencies that we're aware of that do allow people to remove their items once their car is towed or before the car is towed. Or if it's Typically, just general yes, practice. That's, yeah, it's general practice to, okay. if there's personal in a vehicle, it's, it's very common practice for uh, people to remove their items versus having uh, any of the tow companies or the police department or whoever's towing the vehicle having to um, put those items into evidence or into storage. So pretty common to allow people to take their stuff out, their very, items out of the vehicle. Very well. I appreciate the answer, sir. Thank you. Sure. You bet. All right. If there are no other questions, Mr. Vice Mayor, do you want to put a motion on the table? Thank you, Mayor. I move items 12.1 through 12.10 and waive further reading of the text. Second. So we have a motion from the Vice Mayor and a second from Council Member McDonald. Uh, any other comments or discussion? All right, let's call the vote. Council Member Schwedham. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes. Okay. Uh, it is five o'clock on the dot, so we'll roll into our public, our first public comment for non-agenda items, period. Uh, if you have a comment that is on an item that is not on tonight, council agenda, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom or make your way towards the podium. Um, Mayor, we have Dwayne DeWitt heading to the podium. Okay. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt and I'm from Roseland. And I wanted to thank a number of people for helping Roseland recently. Earlier I mentioned Mayor Alvarez, excuse me, Vice Mayor Alvarez and <clears throat> Natalie Rogers for coming to Roseland on Wednesday, the 1st of June, to try to talk with community members. Mr. Alvarez also, on his own time after, came over to McMinn Avenue to see an illegal encampment. He spoke with two school board members, uh, Patricia Kruger and Mary Balsarek, and got to see firsthand how it's negatively affecting the community to have <clears throat> a dozen people living within 10 feet of a residence in an area where they're burning fires in an oak woodland with dry grass. Just by chance, perhaps, on Friday, a work crew came out. I'm hoping it's because Mr. Alvarez made a drop to dime. Thing is, we want to thank Officer Moore from the Santa Rosa Police Department for Friday, Officer Richmond for coming out on Saturday, for our Roseland Creek cleanup effort, where community members gathered and did work along with supervised adult crews from the probation department. We also got to meet members of the debris removal team today. That was Derek and Darren, and they had come out to help out. So one of the things we'd like to see, now that we're coming out from under the restrictions of COVID, is an effort to re-establish volunteerism and to have us neighborhood volunteers be able to work with the city to get things done in a quicker way. Specifically, we've got those graffiti problems I mentioned earlier. 
you wouldn't have it on Humboldt Street or Mc, McDonald Avenue for more than a day or two. We've had it for weeks at the corner of Hearn Avenue and Whitewood, just down from Kenton Court where a man was murdered the other day. So we've got these serious problems and we're thanking the people who are helping us. We want more of that to continue. And I'm here to put up my effort and say, I'll walk my talk. I will volunteer to go paint over graffiti. I will volunteer to be out there like I've been for at least 10 hours over the last four days, working in that neighborhood to clean it up and keep it nice. And you can't hide behind the fact that somebody asked for an environmental impact report to say, well, we don't do the maintenance. You can do maintenance in parks. You don't need a report. So we need you to step up. We're stepping up. We're out there, and we'd like you to be out there again on the weekend. The debris removal team told us they'd come back next Wednesday. We'll have things bagged and tagged and ready for them. Thank you kindly for your help. Mayor, we have another person heading to the podium. If you'd like to state your name for the record, if you choose. My name is Bernadette Burrell. When home sharing began, it was for someone who wanted to couch surf in someone else's home for a period of time. Since then, it has turned into an investing vehicle that destroys the fabric of our neighborhoods, <coughs> the rental housing market, and communities. What is the true concept of home sharing? Home sharing is what people do in Councilman Alvarez's district by many people sharing a single residence that are entry-level workers in retail, hospitality, vineyard, and agriculture. They share a home so they are able to afford to live here. Home sharing is multifamily generations sharing a property to afford to live in Sonoma County. Home sharing is what we all did through the Tubbs, Nuns, Glass, and Dixie fires, opening our homes to people that were evacuated or lost their homes, opening our homes for free to help our fellow community members. Home sharing is neighbors, behind me that are a hosted short-term rental owners that rent a room to only two guests at a time. Home sharing is not the house next to me that is out of town investors and corporations coming into our neighborhood for the sole purpose of turning a profit. Home sharing is not Wall Street players like Avant Stay buying up houses in our neighborhoods, knowing the rules and how to get around them, offering homes for large gatherings, kidding home purchases for high net worth individuals who want to have a short-term rental investment portfolio. This type of STR owner is turning our neighborhoods into a boutique hotel zone. This is a non-conforming use in a residential zone. They have no ties to the community, nor do they care about the health and well-being of the neighborhood of Santa Rosa. Or only hosted short-term rentals should be allowed in the residential areas. Only primary homeowners should be permitted to rent their homes as an STR. Operators in good standing should not only be for tot collecting. The property next to me has had 30 plus calls from code enforcement, but somehow they are still permitted to operate under the current ordinance. This needs to be addressed and revised. Santa needs, Rosa needs to join other communities around the county and put strict limits on short-term rentals. The members of ORRA have tried to paint a rosy picture of why there should be no rules and regulations that hinder them to run commercial businesses in our neighborhoods. They tell a tall tale of how their operations have no effect on the neighborhood around them. I am here to tell you they are wrong. Thank you for your time. Excuse me, Mayor, I see nobody moving to the panel or the podium. I have one. Um, let's see, Adina Flores, if you want to go ahead, please. Good evening, Council. Um, so I wanted to follow up on my comment from earlier. I did have time to verify um, that the CPS HR consulting is not listed as a joint power authority within the state of California. And I've already verified um, that, again, their FBN is expired. 
and they do not have a they <laughs> they've never filed um, ever with the California Secretary of State. So if you know something different or have access to a different database that the general public does not, I'm asking for um, the, a screenshot of the Secretary of State filing to be emailed to me. Um, I just have a lot of issues because again, time and time again, I've proven that this entire pandemic and the wildfires have been orchestrated, which our elected officials are profiting from. And therefore, Supervisor Gore, the county chairman, decided to file a restraining order against my fiance in an effort to silence us. Um, I'm tired of being told I'm full of basement accusations. I just find this interesting because Supervisor Gore, on the same day that he told me I'm full of basement accusations, received a sworn complaint from the FPPC confirming that all of my accusations were legitimate and they have opened an investigation because he failed to disclose that his wife, Elizabeth Gore, possesses um, a business by the name of Gore Country, which he uses uh, for his political campaigning as well. So I don't understand how this is permissible. Um, that's been omitted for all years. Um, initially, you know, he said only Hello Alice was omitted, but um, there are many other businesses which the Gores have in their possession that aren't being disclosed. Um, there is a tremendous lack of transparency in this community. For example, um, Healdsburg Councilwoman Arielle Kelly was extremely um, taken aback by the fact that I called her out on her statement of economic interest several months ago because she's pers personally invested in Pfizer. She's not vaccinating Latinos because she wants equity. She's vaccinating them because she knows she's harming people of color and profiting from it. Uh, um, she said that her Pfizer investments, apparently she inherited those from her deceased grandmother um, and disposed of them last year. So fast forward to April 2022, her 2021 statement of economic interest shows not only do, does she still have Pfizer in her possession, she added BioNTech and also McKesson Distribution, who possess the uh, contracts for $3 billion with the CDC to distribute the vaccines, um, which was actually initiated in 2017 before the pandemic existed. So I would just really appreciate transparency. Thank you. And Mayor, we have one, uh, one voicemail public comment. Hi, this is Eris Weaver, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, general public comment, uh, agenda item 13 or 17, items not on the agenda. As I was cycling to work on Thursday last week, June 2nd, I was the victim of a hit and run right in front of the Bike Coalition office. Uh, we were both traveling slowly, and I managed to remain upright, but even though my, neither my bike nor my body were injured, I was quite shook up by the experience. It was frightening to see a large machine advancing toward my unprotected body, and I was angry that the driver continued down the road, apparently unaware that he had struck me. From my involvement in our local road safety plans and the Vision Zero project, I know the importance of data about collisions, and I constantly tell my staff and my members that they should always report collisions so that we have documentation of the problems that cyclists face on our streets. My experience of filing a police report with the city was awful, and I now have a greater understanding of why so many people don't bother. I first called the PD to try and file it over the phone, as the online form stated that you shouldn't do it online if there was a known suspect. And in my case, the person who struck me works in another office in our building, so I recognized the driver in the car. After I told my story, the dispatcher said, no, I did need to go back and file it online after all, which I then tried to do so. But the online form is not at all user-friendly, and all the drop-down menus for filing a hit-and-run report don't allow anywhere for you to say that the victim is a cyclist or pedestrian. It asks what kind of vehicle you're on. And I should state that I am not, uh, I am someone who is very um, competent with computers. I've been a network administrator and a programmer and uh, things like that. So it's, it's a really bad form. So I called back and said, 
you know, I can't, this form isn't working, and was told now I had to come in and file the report in person. So I rode over to the station to do so. I filled out all the paper forms, including contact information for witness, and submitted video from my front and rear cameras that documented the incident. The entire process from the first phone call took over two hours, and I have yet to be contacted by an officer. I was coherent, uninjured, motivated, and knew what to do. I had time to come down to the station without worrying about missing work or childcare or anything like that. How much more difficult this would have been for someone who had been injured, didn't know the system, didn't speak English well, had no computer access or limited literacy. This process is unacceptable and needs to be fixed. Thank you. Mayor, that concludes public comment for this item. Thank you so much. And I know Eris's uh, comment was a voicemail. Uh, I will follow back up with her that it is something that, that we'll talk about with our team and try to fix. Uh, for Adina, I will ask uh, Amy to go ahead and uh, email you uh, so that you have the accurate information uh, that you were looking for as well. Uh, Mayor, if I could respond, we have the documents ready to forward, and myself and Interim Chief Cregan have already made contact with Eris and are resolving the situation. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's go on to item 14.1. Report item 14.1 is approval of agreement with Touchstone Golf LLC for management of Bennett Valley Golf Course uh, Enterprise. I'd like to introduce Deputy Director Santos. Thank you. One moment while I promote her, please. All right, can you can everyone see me? Thank you. Uh, sorry, just needed to be promoted there. Um, good afternoon or good uh, evening. I guess it's evening. Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and Council members. I'm Jen Santos, Parks Deputy Director. Tonight, we will discuss the recommendation before you to approve an agreement with Touchstone Golf to manage the Bennett Valley Golf Course. Next slide, please. So although you'll mostly be hearing from me tonight, I really want to acknowledge contributions of this presentation and the contributions uh, folks have made to moving this entire process for, forward with the Bennett Valley Golf Course. Um, of course, acknowledgement to Jason Nutt, our assistant city manager for providing oversight and direction for getting us through this process. And um, a recognition to our ad hoc committee who's had over 12 meetings since forming at the mayor's request in 2021 to assist staff and the community with a path forward for the golf course. Also, the National Golf Foundation has provided insight into the options for future operations, capital improvements, and long range funding and operations options. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I definitely wanna thank our city attorney's office and the chief financial officer and uh, his staff. And of course, uh, the folks from the Transportation and Public Works Department. Next slide, please. So on, so we have 150 acres of golf course are shown here in two images. The one on the left is an aerial image showing the golf course and the red shapes uh, show the building locations. The maintenance buildings are near the top of the screen and the restaurant and pro shop buildings are near the bottom of the image, just for reference. If you look to the image to the right, you'll see a graphic version of each of the 18 holes and the driving range, the restaurant, pro shop, and of course you can see Matanzas Creek uh, very clearly. Next slide, please. So the, just a reminder, the golf course is a full 18 hole golf course, par 72 with a pro shop and a pop, very popular unlit driving range and has a priority need for capital investments to repair the water supply, irrigation and drainage issues on the golf course as presented to council in February of this year by National Golf Foundation. The restaurant um, was designed in 2004 and built and finished in 2005, contains a main restaurant and a bar, 
an outdoor patio, banquet facilities for events. The kitchen is designed to uh, run both operations for the restaurant and the event center simultaneously. And we know that there are a few capital investments needed at the restaurant in order to reopen to the community. Next slide, please. So in 2004, the city sold bonds and received a loan from the Southeast and Northwest Park Development Impact Fee Zones for a total of approximately $10 million overall. These uh, were used to fund the new restaurant and the banquet facilities and modernize the pro shop. So in 2005, after construction was complete, the city entered into an agreement with the Bennett Valley Golf Course Shop um, and followed with an agreement with the sports restaurant of Bennett Valley Golf Course to operate and manage the restaurant and banquet facilities. Next slide, please. So by 2020, the restaurant and event center were no longer profitable due to the pandemic restrictions regarding gathering inside and the city granted termination of their lease in December of 2020. And the restaurant and banquet facility have remained closed. We did try some food truck providers at one point, uh, it was working really well and then it just uh, fizzled out. So uh, we don't have food truck providers there right now. And uh, of course we have the Bennett Valley Golf Shops Agreement expiring on June 30th of this year and the owners retiring and not seeking renewal. So we have been working diligently over the last couple of years to uh, look for solutions uh, moving forward to provide golf to the community. Next slide, please. So by February of 2021, staff presented an option in a study session for future golf operations that included real estate options to help fund the capital investments needed at the golf course and to fund the existing debt services that we have. Following this presentation in 2021, citizens of the golfing community and the sports community formed the Save the Bennett Valley Golf Course group in opposition uh, to the options that included real estate, and they advocated and encouraged the city to look for alternatives. Mayor Rogers established the Bennett Valley Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee on March 2nd, 2021, which consists of Council Member Sawyer as Chair, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and Council Member Tibbetts. Mayor Rogers joined the committee following the resignation of Council Member Tibbetts. And as part of their first meeting in April of 2021, the Ad Hoc Committee recommended that staff provide a comprehensive analysis regarding the future operations of the Bennett Valley Golf Course without real estate options. And so we move forward on that recommendation. Next slide, please. So on August 17, 2021, Council approved a request for proposals to solicit for qualified for a qualified firm to evaluate the golf course and make recommendations for how we should operate the future operations, capital projects, and what sort of funding mechanisms we could find to help us with that. The National Golf Foundation was recommended by that review committee and approved on November 4th, 2021 by the city. And before the end of the 2021 year, National Golf Foundation had provided a rough draft of their future recommendations for the Bennett Valley Valley Golf Operations, <laughs> capital projects and funding mechanisms. The ad hoc committee received those recommendations from National Golf Foundation and further recommended that staff move forward to council with the option for a single operator as recommended by National Golf Foundation. The council received this update and the ad hoc committee from of the ad hoc committee during their um, council meeting on February 1st during a staff briefing. Next slide, please. So on February 15th of this year, 2022, knowing that time was of the essence, council approved a scope of services for an RFP, a request for proposal to solicit for a single operator to manage the operations and maintenance of the Bennett Valley Golf Course and includes restaurant, et cetera. During that presentation, council received a comprehensive presentation from National Golf Foundation detailing their analysis and recommendation for a single management operator. Following the solicitation, the city received five proposals, very high quality proposals uh, on March 24th, 2022. The Bennett Valley Golf Course, Course Proposal Review Committee 
which consisted of one council member on the rotation assignment and uh, one member of the golfing community and staff members familiar with the operations and maintenance of the Bennett Valley Golf Course. They reviewed and interviewed the top ranked firms and recommended the highest ranked firm Touchstone Golf for future management of Bennett Valley Golf Course. Next slide, please. So approval to finalize an agreement with Touchstone will provide for the operations and maintenance of the Bennett Valley Golf Course for three years with an option to extend up to two additional years. Some key elements of the future operations are to implement the transition plan, which will provide the framework for bringing on Touchstone in June, prior to the end of the current operator's term in order to facilitate a smooth transition. We really need that time in there. There's a lot of details to work out in between now and July 1st. Approval of this agreement will also put into motion the support services necessary for this future operations, such as, uh, as example, internet services, golf cart contracts, uh, goods and services to operate and maintain, maintain the Bennett Valley Golf Course Enterprise. Touchstone has a proven track record of providing professional level management service for municipalities with similar operations all over California and the United States. Um, Touchstone is not only recommended by the Bennett Valley Golf Course Proposal Review Committee, but they are also recommended by every municipality contacted for reference regarding their performance. References were contacted that were provided by Touchstone, as well as those not specifically mentioned by Touchstone. In particular, uh, the city of Burbank, California operates DeBell Golf Course, which is an 18-hole golf course and restaurant with uh, event center facilities similar to uh, the city of Santa Rosa. Touchstone began operations and maintenance of the DeBell Golf Course in 2019, and the city of Burbank is extremely pleased with Touchstone's performance. And they do highly recommend uh, Touchstone. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the folks from the city of Burbank over the last three weeks, and they've been really instrumental in helping me understand how they've been working with Touchstone and how the transitions are going. Um, it's, it's been a really great uh, experience for them. Uh, we spoke with a lot of folks, but we also specifically, I wanna mention the city of Chula Vista, California. Uh, we spoke uh, with them about their financial agreement with Touchstone, and they also reported very similar positive um, aspects of Touchstone, including their revenue flow. Uh, there were lots of other references that we checked with golf courses and one in Texas and one in Colorado. Again, all very similar, highly positive uh, comments and all made recommendations that we um, work with Touchstone, that they're a great company to work with. Of course, Touchstone is a highly, highly skilled golf management. Um, they operate over 21, I believe in California alone, 21 facilities. Uh, which do include management of restaurants and banquet services on municipal golf courses. Uh, Touchstone will, as part of this agreement, will also reopen our restaurant and uh, event center facilities and operate a beverage and snack cart, which is, of course, highly desired by the golfing community. It's often hard when you're golfing in the middle of golfing to stop and make, it, make time to go to the restaurant. So um, I know the golfing community is looking forward to that. Touchstone will utilize their extensive marketing and outreach skills for both the restaurant and event center and the golf course. Um, they have uh, staff dedicated just to that um, purposes, which is really exciting. One of the many comments I received uh, from doing the due diligence uh, with Touchstone was hearing that uh, they are quote, an extension of our staff, which is really um, a, it's something that really uh, resonated with, with staff um, there's, there's a lot going on with looking at a new management organization, and this is really helpful. Um, their expert knowledge of golf, but also being able to, to meet the uniqueness of Bennett Valley Golf Course and work with our existing staff is really exciting. Uh, in negotiations with Touchstone so far, they have proven to be very easy to work with, and they bring a wealth of experience to the table. I know that Touchstone themselves are very much for looking forward to meeting our community, encouraging the sport of golf for everyone in the community. Next slide, please. So as a single operator under an operations and maintenance agreement, Touchstone will receive a base monthly management fee of $8,000 a month or $96,000 annually. 
and an incentive fee of approximately uh, 20% of the net revenue goals, which is estimated to be a, around $20,000 annually for the first year. And as we increase revenue, the incentive will of course correspondingly increase as well. The city is expected to earn every dime, every bit of revenue comes to the city and the first year is estimated at approximately $3.4 million. And by year three, we're looking at 4.6 million. Um, the city will use these revenues to fund every expenditure, including the management and incentive fees and all operating and maintenance expenses and all existing debt services. Next slide, please. So as a reminder of where we're at for our debt services, the bond debt services is approximately $395,261 per year plus the annual park development impact debt service is approximately $63,244 um, annually. So combined, the existing debt service annually is around $458,000. Um, that's generally where it's at. There is some fluctuation in the bond debt service, but very little. So it's around $450,000 with just the debt service. So if we were to pay off this existing debt service for all the remaining years, uh, we're looking at a little over $4 million right now if we were to pay it off as scheduled. Um, in the previous slide, we mentioned that Touchstone is projecting about $3.4 million in revenue and their estimate for the first year of expenditures is approximately $2.9 million, which does not include our existing debt service and our the transitional costs that we need to transition from an existing operator to a new operator. So annually, once these costs are added, we are projecting a first year loss. Uh, and I also just want to add that the projected expenditures for year or for year three are looking at 3.8 million as the revenue is also projected to increase and correspond. So we're looking at a first year loss and years after that are projected to earn revenue, a positive revenue. Next slide, please. So if we look at the budget available, um, we have projected around $537,000. Touchstone is projecting, once you add in our debt service and the transition costs, a first year loss of approximately $234,682. Um, so we've got that number there. We also have uh, $681,574 in uh, council reserve policy requirements. What that number includes is an estimated initial estimate of $466,000 plus a 20% increase to cover the increased risk inherent in the new operating agreement. So we expect that by the end of the first year, we will need to have all these funds. For instance, if the revenue projections aren't met, we need to have a larger reserves to protect ourselves. There is an increased risk with this type of management agreement uh, where the city earns all the revenue, but we also are on the hook for all the expenditures. So there's a total reserve requirement of $681,574. Um, moving down, we also have about $317,000 in additional needs this first year that we need to add into this uh, analysis. And so I'll just go through that, bear with me. <laughs> there's. Uh, that $317,000 is made up of 20, about $20,000 of city maintenance staff and salaries for maintenance of the buildings and major repairs, infrastructure repairs, things like that to the buildings and grounds, um, as well as preventative maintenance. There's professional banking services, fees and fire and earthquake insurance, et cetera, for about the same amount, around $20,000. There's overhead uh, costs for, citywide, for the citywide cost plan of approximately $20,000. Uh, we also need to maintain an operating cash flow of a bank account for about $75,000 so that we have enough money to make sure we're um, paying everybody and doing all the paying all the expenditures as expected. Um, we also have uh, the golf maintenance equipment and repair at about $241,000. And traditionally, the city is not budgeted for these, which has led to all sorts of issues with our fleet equipment we have out there now at the golf course. There's been no replacement fund established and no dedicated ability for getting repair. So we're pulling money from different locations to try to accommodate these. We really want to move forward with a structured process like we've had at all of our other agencies, all of our other departments here 
Uh, similar with the fire trucks, I know that we didn't have this with our fire trucks as well. So we really want to make sure that the equipment is um, getting replaced and that we have the funding to do that. Um, when we have to wait to ask council for funding for some way or another or find funding from somewhere else, it creates all sorts of problems, as you can imagine, at the golf course. So if you were totaling that uh, on a piece of paper, that's about $377,000 in total. What we do is we take the revenue that we're earning uh, that was not calculated also from the cell tower and subtract that and we have about $317,000. So thanks for bearing with me on the math. I just wanted to make sure I got all of that out of there. Um, so what that leaves is a, is a remainder. And we're looking uh, as part of this approval process to include $345,000 of funds transferring from the Bennett Valley Golf Course Capital Fund to the Operating Fund and approximately $345,000 and $225,000 from the General Fund to the Bennett Valley Golf Course Reserve Fund. So that will bring the balance to zero and uh, our projected expenditures for the budget to zero. Um, I just want to emphasize it's an extremely tight budget uh, this first year. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of risk involved starting any sort of new contract up. And uh, we're very excited to get started with Touchstone, but we also want to make sure that we're secure in our budget situation. And so I just I just want to extra emphasize that that is a zero balance. There's no remainder. Uh, we're hoping to have a much higher projection um, of revenue coming in, especially as we reopen the restaurant, which has been closed for years. So we're looking forward to that. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about capital projects here a little bit. Uh, when we do move forward with our high priority capital projects that the National Golf Course Foundation specified in February 15th, um, it is, we expect that revenues will also increase, which is really exciting. Until then, all of Touchstone's projections and the city's projections are based on very minor capital project improvements in year one. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, revising the sand traps a little bit, uh, thinning trees, minor improvements to the restaurant and vent facilities. These are really minor projects that we really just need to do to make sure it's an inviting space and a safe space for people to come back in um, and use the facilities. Uh, Touchstone has also committed $50,000 of their own funds towards the front entry landscaping area for an immediate positive impact and there's no obligation to the city whatsoever for that. So that's really exciting. If any of you have been to the front of the, of the golf course there, it needs some uh, definite um, attention. And uh, during the National Golf Course presentation in February of this year, the high priority capital projects were identified and ranked and preliminary evaluate and preliminarily evaluated. Um, National Golf Foundation uh, recommended a two-phased approach towards looking at our uh, capital projects. And that includes first conducting a full site master plan and then second, undertaking those improvements immediately um, and closing the golf course in order to do so. National Golf Course Foundation estimated that the high priority needs at the, at the golf course are approximately 6.8 million, uh, which of course includes the irrigation system and the water supply system. It's a, it's a huge component. Um, those of you that have been out to the golf course understand it's, it's, it's a real urgent need uh, over the next couple of years to make sure we take care of that um, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, National Golf Foundation also presented strategies for how do we fund all of these capital projects that we need to do. They offered three strategies to look at and some sort of combination there. They looked at a general fund investment or bonding for the capital improvements to occur as soon as possible. Um, they also put on the table using net gains from the Bend Valley Golf Course revenue that are saved over the years to use uh, to fund capital needs as we can do that. These strategies are predicated on the city implementing these high priority capital needs as soon as possible, while also uh, implementing an increase to the golf fee structure, which we recognize needs some attention. Next slide, please. 
In working with Touchstone so far, they have mentioned they have the capabilities to manage capital projects, and they've mentioned cost-saving alternatives that national that the National Golf Foundation, uh, alternatives to the National Golf Foundation uh, recommendations, I should say, for completing golf course, for completely um, closing the golf course. So we could potentially look at an option where um, only we're only closing a portion of the golf course so that golf can still happen. So we really want to explore that with Touchstone, with National Golf Foundation. We want to look at all these alternatives. So we'll be evaluating the National Golf Financial Options as well as Touchstone's current and future recommendations. And we will evaluate what we can do with our financing options to move that forward. And also we will be evaluating the golf fee structure and we'll be returning to council prior to the mid-year budget cycle in a study session to discuss all those um, options. Uh, tonight, though, we are focusing solely mostly on the operating of the golf course, and we'll return to discuss the capital projects as well as the fees. And I recognize that the fees would not only fund capital projects, but they could also fund uh, the revenue going forward, but we do need the time necessary to do a deep dive into those fee structures as compared to the other uh, golf courses in Sonoma County. We wouldn't want to raise fees and not have any anything different at the golf course necessarily. We want to look at what our options are and come back to you. So we will thoroughly evaluate all of those uh, financial strategies, the options for funding these, and we will return um, in a study session prior to um, mid-year budget cycle to discuss those in depth. Next slide, please. So pending council's approval to negotiate a final agreement with Touchstone, a draft operations schedule shows a kickoff meeting uh, with the city within a few days of the fully executed agreement. The Touchstone transition plan will be implemented within a couple weeks and Touchstone will implement their transition checklist, which has over a hundred action items and deadlines to ensure a smooth transition from our current operator uh, to the Touchstone operators. We anticipate that there will be um, three days or less of golf golf on the golf course following uh, June 30th, 2022, um, and that the restaurant will be open by mid-July. I know that Touchstone is very excited to have zero days of golf, but we do need to uh, make sure we have a buffer in there in case we need a few days to get something set up. So once Touchstone has a fully executed agreement, a final schedule will be produced and the city will share this information on the city's website with key dates for golf and restaurant services. And we keep that updated and monitored. So um, if they, you know, as we update the golf website, you can at least come to the city's website to get information temporarily um, until that July 1st deadline. Next slide, please. So if we look at following the recommendations from National Golf Foundation to bring on a professional single operator management company, this is really the best, the city's best, best method for achieving its goals for golf continuity, revenue generation, uh, sufficient to cover operational expenses. And um, it also includes those options for long range capital improvements that we'll bring back. In addition, Touchstone is committed to engaging with the golfing community and to provide an inclusive golf experience and have the staff to help diversify the golfing experience at Bennett Valley Golf Course. I know that they are interested in meeting the community members and understanding how they can better support and uh, generate interest for the sport of golf for everyone. Um, next slide, please. So with that, it's uh, recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department that council by resolution approve and authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute an agreement with Touchstone Golf LLC to manage the Bennett Valley Golf Course Enterprise in accordance with the business terms set forth in the staff report and the resolution, and to authorize increased appropriations in the Bennett Valley Golf Course Fund in the amount of $345,000 to fund the transition plan capital costs from the agreement with the source of the funds from the Bennett Valley Golf Course Capital Fund, and three, authorize increased appropriations in the Bennett Valley Golf Course operations fund in the amount of 351,225 for the creation of sufficient projected reserves with the source of the funds from the general fund. 
and four, authorize the chief financial officer to appropriate all operator fees and operating and maintenance expenditures from the Bennett Valley Golf revenue to Touchstone Golf LLC as described in the agreement. And five, approve and authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute assumption from the current golf course operator to the master lease agreement for golf carts with Yamaha Motor Finance Corporation USA for the remainder for the master lease agreement term through October 2022. Next slide, please. And so I am here to answer questions. We also have members from four members from Touchstone. Uh, if they can be promoted to help answer questions that uh, that might arise. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Director. Uh, before we go to questions from council members, I just wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank Jason. I wanted to thank everybody who has worked so hard on this. Uh, to say that there was a, a fair amount of skepticism from the public uh, about the ability of the city to pull this off on the timeline uh, that, that we were presenting uh, would be an incredible understatement. I think there was a sense that the, that the city was trying to kill the golf, the golf course by having the timelines drag out far beyond when the existing operator would be able to operate. Uh, and I know that you've been steadfast uh, in your resolve to make this happen. Uh, and now uh, staff has done a good job and now it's on the council. Uh, you have it here with an opportunity for us to have continuity of services uh, and we'll, we'll get to questions and, and deliberations. But I wanted to thank you and thank the assistant city manager, uh, not just for the heat that you took uh, getting us to this point, uh, but for continuing day after day to, to keep plowing away to make this a possibility. So, so thank you to both of you uh, and, and to your team. Uh, I'll start with one simple question and it's because it's perhaps the thing that I hear the most from the public. Uh, outside of uh, just the desire to keep the, the golf course and it's, it's emblematic of our community as a whole, uh, but concern for the existing staff and concern that we could lose folks who have uh, a wealth of knowledge and who know the golfing community and have uh, supported uh, Santa Rosa. And, and I'm, I'm going to put you a little bit on the, the spot, Mr. Mr. Luffman and, and uh, our uh, city attorney's team, uh, but have there been discussions about continuity of staff? Certainly. Um, and Mayor Rogers uh, and Vice Mayor Alvarez and city council and uh, city staff members, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you here this evening. I'm, I'm joined by Steve Harker, who is Touchstone Golf CEO, Ashley Van Dissel, who is Touchstone Golf's Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and also James Birchall, who is our Vice President of Operations in Northern California. Um, I'll um, uh, hopefully have an opportunity to share a little bit about Touchstone Golf uh, later on in greater detail, but I want to get right to your question. Mayor Rogers, and uh, very much so. Uh, our goal is to retain as many of the existing staff members at the golf course that are interested in working with us at Bennett Valley and continuing to work with us. To that end, we're planning our first, uh, providing your approval of our agreement this evening, we're planning our first meeting with the current staff members next Tuesday that I'll be leading and it will be an orientation about Touchstone Golf and a little bit about who we are and uh, our expectations for ourselves as responsible employers in the community and uh, a, a brief overview of what our expectations are for Touchstone Golf staff members at our courses. But yes, in summary, we're looking forward to meeting the existing staff members and getting to know them and providing for a smooth transition for them. All right, I appreciate that. And uh, I, yeah, I wanted to jump right into it, but I would be interested in allowing you to introduce yourselves a little bit, talk a little bit about Touchstone, uh, what should the community know about about you and about the proposal, uh, and then I'll come to council members for additional questions. Certainly, thank you very much. Well, I uh, took a minute there and introduced my colleagues who are joining on the call today. 
And uh, a little bit about who we are. We are a medium-sized golf course management company based here in Northern California. We work with 41 golf courses around the country, although primarily in the state of California and included in that is 10 golf courses in Northern California, although this will be our first that we're operating in the North Bay area. Um, our specialty is working with municipalities such as yourselves. And uh, I really have to say, and, and Jen, thank you for that gracious lead in. It was humbling for me and for all of us to hear about the positive experiences that our clients uh, at the municipalities that we work with have uh, about working with us and the impact that we've been able to have at the facilities that we've been entrusted to operate. I think if I was to say, and every single golf course is, is different, of course, but if I were to say um, one overview mindset that we bring to all of our assignments, particularly our municipal assignments, it is operating the golf course in such a way that it is viewed as a community asset for the golfers and the non-golfers in the community. And we do that in a variety of different ways that, that we'll um, can get into further, but really it is having the Santa Rosa residents knowing and understanding and valuing Bennett Valley as a community asset. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And council, let's go ahead and start with questions. Uh, for folks who are on the Zoom or in person, we'll do questions from council members, turn it over to public comment, and then bring it back for deliberation and a decision. Uh, so I will see if there are any questions from council members to begin. Start with council member Rogers. Um, first question um, and a question I heard in the community is what is, what is the difference between a lease and um, a management company? Certainly. Um, so there's a, a two main ways that municipalities go about operating their golf courses. You mentioned the lease arrangement and uh, management company arrangement. Um, we are involved with both types of arrangements at various facilities. I would say over the last 15 years, management arrangements are more common. And the biggest difference between those two is a lessee pays a city a certain amount of rent and realizes the benefit of the upside of the financial performance of the golf course to its largest extent. Um, in doing so, they relinquish some large amount of control over the golf course because there is the lessee involved and the lessee pays rent and the lessee is making all the decisions as it relates to the business. A management arrangement, which is what we are contemplating and discussing here for Bennett Valley is much more common in this day and age. And in that arrangement, we as the management company report to the city and we take that responsibility very seriously, but the city ultimately makes the final decision on anything that happens at the golf course. We make recommendations based on our experience and city staff and city council ultimately approves those recommendations. Thanks, Mark. And I'll just, I'll just add, um, Councilmember Rogers, that the National Golf Foundation also uh, echoed a lot of what Mark was saying. and and is recommending the management contract for our company uh, because we are on a very restricted timeline to have continuity of golf and looking for a, a lease a lessee is a very long and <laughs> a protracted uh, process and it could take us time. And, and also we do lose the ability to have um, that type of uh, control of the situation and involvement 
the way that we as the city agency wants to be involved so we can ensure high quality golf going forward. So I'll just add that <laughs> to that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and in addition to that, so um, when you're a management company, what is your um, what is your interest in the golf course doing well? I know when you are, are, are leasing your interest in trying new things and wanting the golf course to be profitable and doing um, as well as it can in, can do is is very high, um, right? Because you get the profits from it doing that. But when you are just managing, um, it seems like your investment or your, your interest in, in that happening could, I'm not saying will, but could uh, potentially be, be less. So um, how can we be guaranteed that your enthusiasm today will continue to be your enthusiasm um, further down um, in our, our friendship? It's a very appropriate question. And um, I think there's there's two main answers for that. The, the first answer, if we want to talk about the dollars and cents point of view on it, it is um, building in a level of incentive management fee in order to align the interests of the city of Santa Rosa and Touchstone Golf. So that would, that would be the, the first answer, but the, the second answer is, is really the most important answer to us. And that is, um, as a management company, the most important thing that we have is our reputation as a management company. And I think the reason we have been able to grow from having one golf course in 2006, uh, 2006 to the company that we are today is because of the strong references that Jen mentioned earlier uh, about the job that we do operating those golf courses. And so that is our principal motivator to be doing a great job for the clients that entrust us with their golf course. And then hopefully two years from now, three years from now, if somebody calls any of you or somebody calls Jen, she can uh, provide just as glowing of a reference for Touchstone Golf. Um, just two more things. Um, one would be, uh, I am very, very, uh, very interested in community engagement um, and having people on the golf course that would not normally uh, be able or would be interested in going to a golf course um, that don't even know about golf. Um, so that is something that I think is very important. Um, and that is something that I hope that we uh, strive to do. We have basketball camps, we have football camps, we have soccer camps. Um, and I hope we have someday have golf in all different kind of camps and have kids that come from all over our community to partake in um, something that they might end up enjoying and we may be able to watch them on television one day and they look different from all the other golfers that we see um, because that could be amazing and they come from Santa Rosa, California. I think that that would be great. Um, in addition to saying that um, city manager, um, $351,000, if this is approved today, how do we know? We don't know. We don't know anything, actually. But um, what is the likelihood that there, no additional monies will be asked for um, in the future? Council Member Rogers. Well, uh, so there, you had two questions there. Um, let me go ahead and respond to the second question and then I'll ask Mr. Luffman to 
uh, respond to the first, which is their community outreach. On the second question, when it comes to um, the request for general fund dollars, uh, this is based off a pro forma that uh, is, is looking at historical revenue uh, and their management fees associated with this. Um, it's our intention, as Ms. Santos mentioned, that we'll be coming back to council prior to the mid-year budget with, with updated revenue dollars in an effort to hopefully confirm that in fact, uh, not only was the 351 more than adequate, um, but that no additional general fund dollars will be needed moving forward. Um, with that said, that's part of the reason we're coming back uh, mid-year, is to basically justify the revenue and expenditure dollars that we're seeing. Um, this will be our first opportunity to work with a management company such as Touchstone, uh, and you know we're we're going to go off of their great experience, their knowledge base. We have a high level of confidence in the information, um, but they haven't worked Bennett Valley, uh, and we haven't had them at Bennett Valley. So uh, the mid-year is going to be a very important time for us to reconcile the information. And thank you for that question, Council Member Rogers. I wanted uh, Assistant City Manager not to answer since he had been so involved in the process. But I do understand your concern. I know one of the things that we've talked about is we want this to be a true enterprise fund. Uh, so this is something that we will talk about long term with the management company. Um, and we will bring it back to you and we will continue to look at revenues because this is not something that the general fund can continue to maintain. And lastly, Mayor, if I may, um, I, I just want to say that, and I've said it before, we have definitely a gym. The, the Bennett Valley Golf Course is, is beautiful, and I am not one for to, to sew into something that I believe only benefits a, a small number of people, but I think that it can benefit more people, and I think that if we think out of the box and we keep the, the gym that we have and we find a way to keep it and utilize it more, that we can make it even more, you know, um, worth the community's time and effort to have it. And so I do want to thank everyone that has been working on that from my peers and everyone that has been on the, the committee. Um, because it was something that I did not see at first. Um, but after going out there and seeing all the work that has been put into um, saving the Bennett Valley Golf Course, I, I know why people um, want to save it and why it is so important. So thank you. Council Member, if I could ask uh, Mr. Luffman to respond, I think they do have an engagement program that you might be interested in hearing about uh, from, from their experience. We do, and uh, I've been doing a lot of talking here this, this evening. I'd I, uh, like to invite my colleague, Steve Harker, Touchstone Golf's CEO. He can talk about our vision and also our experience with engagement at some of our other golf courses. Yeah, it's, a, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, share with you some of the programs we're running at our other golf courses that we hope to be running with the city of Santa Rosa. But I do want to say that we really want to spend time with you, spend time with staff, spend, spend time with our golfers and the non-golfers and understand uh, from you um, really who are the who are the folks that we need to get out there and who are the organizations that we can partner with to make the golf course much more diverse and inviting and accessible to everybody in the community. A couple of things that we've done uh, recently, uh, we've started junior golf camps, a new golf course that we took over December 17th, Tilden Park. I was up there today. Kids everywhere, 225 youth signed up for that program, and uh, it's going fantastic. We, um, we've we been taking golf to the high schools. We'll take over an athletic field. We'll bring some low-flight golf balls that are very safe, and we'll run a PE class for every single hour on the hour for the entire school. So the entire high school gets exposed to golf. And then during that session, we introduce them to our junior golf programs at the golf course. Uh, we also have a program in Oakland uh, that we're involved with, Ace Kids, which actually picks the kids up uh, from uh, high schools and junior high schools and brings them to the golf course. We'll be looking at that as an option. And uh, last week we met with a group in Santa Rosa uh, voices that helps uh, underserved youth. And we talked to them about 
a combination of a golf program along with a job training program. And they're very excited about that. We're working on uh, transportation to bring their youth out to the golf course so we can provide some golf instruction, but also share with them the different opportunities there are to learn uh, a job or a trade that they can use uh, later on as they become active adults. Um, and then we're also, uh, we'll adopt and be using the PGA's Get Golf Ready program, looking at expanding programs for women, looking at expanding uh, senior programs. We've done senior clinics for uh, senior centers. If Santa Rosa has a senior center, uh, busing the seniors out to the course for lunch and a talk about golf and an opportunity to hit a golf ball. So we, uh, we embrace your vision. Uh, we want everyone in the city of Santa Rosa to know that uh, this is their golf course. And uh, in addition to that, we're also gonna be running a number of non-golf events uh, for people that aren't interested in golf, just so they can, uh, they can dine at the restaurant or partake in another type of activity. Uh, could be a 4K run, could be uh, breakfast with Santa, could be, uh, could be anything. So uh, we're excited again to be involved and humbled by the opportunity uh, to uh, come in and work with you all on, on the programming and building the business plan that's right for the city of Santa Rosa. Other questions from council? Council Member McDonald? Yes, thank you, and thank you for your great presentation today. Um, can I, I just have some clarifying questions, and, and then I have some statements, but uh, is Touchstone out of Berkeley or out of Delaware? On the resolution, I saw that it was out of Berkeley, but under the contract, it says that your business is actually out of state, out of Delaware. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just, it's just for the corporate document purposes. It's just easier to set up your company when we started with one golf course, I, I uh, was advised that that would be the simplest way to do it. But yes, yeah, so I, I live in Berkeley. I'm a resident of Berkeley and this is our home base. Mark lives in San Jose. Uh, James lives in Santa Rosa and Ashley's in Colorado of all places, but she's out here all the time and she's a Californian. She's from Southern California. Thank you. And then for clarification on the actual golf course fees, which I, I think was somewhat what Natalie was um, asking about is who sets the golf course fees? Um, currently, I do know that Bennett Valley is lower than most of the other local golf courses, and that could definitely play a part in the revenue that the city receives. So who would be setting the golf course fees? So um, all of you would. We will, uh, as a part of our budget process each year make our recommendations and those recommendations will be based on the overall golf experience that golfers are receiving at Bennett Valley when compared to the local competition as well as what the local competition's rates are. So we'll make those recommendations, but ultimately all of, uh, all of you would approve them. Okay, thank you. And then council uh, member, if I could chime in, I just want to say that that is part of the difference between the contract that we've had in place where we're working collaboratively with the operator. The operator actually institutes uh, part of that fee. Um, in this particular case, the city owns the fee and that would be part of our annual fee approval process. Thank you for that clarification. So, um, Mayor Rogers, is it appropriate for me to make some statements and they may actually be questions that you can answer as well right now, or would you like to move forward let's, on something? Let's stick, let's stick to questions. If you have questions from your statements, go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, let's get all of the other questions answered from the council members and listen to public comments before we do statements. So just so I'm clear, um, as far, to, far as the proposal, it looks like the first year you're proposing a deficit of $234,682. And that the reason that the budget would be balanced is because we're pulling from reserves to backfill that. Am I clear on that specific amount? That's correct. We have two options. We have an option for funding from within the existing enterprise fund, a portion of that and then the remainder to help offset the need for additional reserves uh, we're asking from the general fund. So those two sources. 
And as far as any repairs that need to be done on the course, is that coming out of general fund or is that something that's already in the enterprise fund that will be covering that? There are, my, there are accommodations in the existing budget for minor repairs. If there's anything major, we'll have to look at what options we have at that point. But we'll be uh, coming back mid-year to talk about those major capital improvements uh, before the mid-year budget cycle. Uh, but uh, there is the ability for some minor improvements right now. We have some, you know, we need a sign for the restaurant. We need a few minor updates. We need some trees trimmed and we have a budget for that. And as for any of the RFPs that were submitted, could you share with me perhaps the top three groups that were considered um, and any of the details around that? And then in addition to that, were any of the other proposals willing to take on some of the repairs needed at the golf course? Sure, and I, I believe I can share um, those because we're having this discussion right now. Uh, but I'll check in with the city attorney's office I have, if I have any restrictions. Council Member McDonald, can you clarify your question, please? Yes, I asked if they could share the top three RFPs that were considered by the uh, subcommittee. Jen, please feel free, uh, move forward with answering the question. You should be fine. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We have, um, of course, a touchstone was the, in the top three, of course, and then we had um, Corsco, and we also had uh, Troon was uh, in the top three. And I, I need to search uh, through the information I have to see if I can find if there was any, any uh, bit about construction uh, similar to Touchstone. Uh, I don't have that answer right this moment. But those were the top three that were uh, moved forward to the interview process. And then how many RFPs did we receive in total? Five, we received five total proposals. I think that does it for questions right now. For me, I just have some comments that I can save. Okay, let's go to Council Member Sweathelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. And I think, uh, Jason, you touched base on a little bit um, regarding the pro forma, but I guess my question would be for Mark. Um, and again, this is not a criticism of our, of our previous golf operator, but I frequently had heard from some staff that um, the deal that we had with the previous contract really benefited the operator versus the city. A, Mark, are you aware of what that contract was? And do you have any thoughts about how this will benefit the city in a greater extent than what previously had been in place. Because again, I'm looking, if we've learned from what our experience has been in the past, moving forward for it, is this a more sustainable model in your professional opinion? Uh, certainly, I, I am not familiar with the details of the existing arrangement enough to, to comment on it. As it relates to the arrangement moving forward with us, I think there's a, a few reasons why it is sustainable for the city um, moving forward. First, the, the city retains control of the golf course. Um, so that is that is number one. And so the, the best interests of the city residents and the city itself are um, put into play through our management of the golf course. And second, I would say, it is, I would point to what our track record is for operating a golf course in such a manner that between course conditions, between community programming, between bringing new golfers to the game of, of golf, all of that um, is important at every single golf course. And our proposal considers doing just that at Bennett Valley. Great, thank you. Right, and if I if I might add, it's just two different ways of looking at the at the same thing. Our current operator um, retains a great deal of the revenue right now. Um, so as we move forward with Touchstone, we'll be receiving all of the revenue and have a lot more flexibility than we do right now. Um, so it's it's I think in my opinion, it's a much better way of operating for us 
we have a lot more flexibility for attending to the needs of Benna Valley Golf Course. Any other questions from council members? Mr. Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. I'll begin with asking a question about the contract uh, or, or life of contract. What, at what point is it no longer feasible to enter into a contract, such as a month to month? I do see that we have a five year with a one on one extension. I might need some clarification on that, Council yeah. uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez. I'm sorry. No, no problem. I, I'm asking that at what point is it no longer profitable for for the management company to enter into a contract with with an agency? Uh, I imagine such as a month to month would not be feasible because of the startup costs as well as the the administrative fees that go into setting up even a, uh, something as simple as an account. So I'm wondering if 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 there's a time period where where the management company would no longer be interested in entering a contract with an agency. Vice Mayor, if I could chime in first, um, let me just say that uh, National Golf Foundation came in and provided a presentation. Uh, in the preliminary discussion with staff, it was identified by them that a three-year contract is generally a minimal. Um, in order to select a management firm and, and with the startup costs, with the, the need to be able to hire staff, to retain staff, and to provide certainty for that particular organization, that that was the, that was the minimal need. Um, we did talk about whether there was a shorter term that we could enter into, uh, and, and to, to be frank, their, their fear was that we would get less interest from the management company uh, that are management companies that are out there. Um, and so that, that would be the response that I would provide based on the feedback that we received from our consultant. And that does make sense. Again, I do. I'm cognizant of the fees that are involved with any any management company that enters any type of agency that you would hope for a long-standing relationship, opposed to a short one. Um, in regards to, we spoke about leases. I, I want to go a little bit further into subleasing. Uh, is there is there a strategy where where subleasing is practiced, such as finding an operator for for the restaurant? that's not in-house in, in the past? Uh, Mark or Steve, would you be interested in talking about your particular operation and the restaurant component of that? Certainly. Um, as it relates to subleasing the restaurant, um, we are open to anything that's in the best interests of the city. And particularly as it would relate to getting to know local operators in the community. That's part of our um, desire to get to know many, many folks that operate businesses in, in the community. I think the most important thing for us with operating the food and beverage operation at Bennett Valley is that it is closely integrated with the golf operation. So as such that they, um, uh, benefit each other, both golfers coming to the restaurant and restaurant goers coming to the golf course and uh, planning and organizing and being able to implement uh, events that are geared toward non-golfers. All of that is what we do to great success at the facilities that we operate elsewhere in California where we operate the food and beverage operation as well as the golf operation. That said, we're open to any conversations um, in the best interests of the city. I do appreciate that, especially seeing that the food truck did fizzle out, uh, but nonetheless, you, you have some type of interest. How many properties do you manage in, 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 or how many golf courses do you have in your portfolio? We operate 41 golf courses right now. Oh, 10 of them are in Northern California and 20 of them are in California. Perfect. And of those 41, have you subleased any uh, of them in regards to the food or the restaurant, if, if those are components of the other 41? There is, is one golf course where we have a, a food and beverage partner operating the, um, that facility. It is um, mainly a result of the size and scope of the catering operation that we thought that that was a beneficial relationship at that course. Um, at every other golf course we work with, we operate the food and beverage. 
Thank you. And, and for staff, uh, how long before we revi revisit uh, the, the golf course in the future if we are successful in picking an operator today? Well, I'll just, uh, we'll, first we'll be coming back uh, during the study session or before the mid-year um, budget review in a study session to look at those long range capital needs we have at the golf course. Because I think that together with what you're hearing today is the big long-term picture for the golf course. So you'll have an opportunity at that point, but if we are successful today, uh, the contract expires in three years. So we could look at that in three years and look at different options if we want to consider some other different option at that point, or we can renew for additional two years if things are going the way we anticipated. Uh, so, and we always have we always have outs, but we that's that's what's in the contract right now. Thank you. Council, any other questions? All right, let's go to public comment on this item. If you are interested in providing comment or asking questions, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. And Sandy, I'm going to turn it over to you to handle. Thank you. Um, we have a person approaching the podium. And go ahead and state your name for the record if you so choose. Hi, I'm Richard Carlisle. I'm uh, president of Save Bennett Valley Golf Course Group. Um, we have about 4,000 people that strong that is in our group and uh, we, we feel very fortunate in being able to work with the city and staff on this process. Um, I want to thank Mayor Rogers for <clears throat> forming the Bennett Valley Golf Course Ad Hoc Committee because that allowed us to have a platform to work with the city staff, the city council, and eventually National Golf Foundation to craft this RFP. Now, RFP is a very complicated process and it weeds out the people who shouldn't be making an application in the first place. And we're very pleased to see that Touch, Touchstone Golf has come to the top and is the highest rated. Uh, we, we feel that they're somewhat local and being out of Berkeley and having a lot of golf courses in California. Um, they have a great reputation and an excellent references. Uh, people that are saying to us, this group knows how to manage a golf course. So we're very pleased with that. And so we would encourage the council to approve this contract tonight with Touchstone <clears throat> and move on to the next phase of this, which is a transition phase, along with integrating the food and beverage with the golf course. That's a big item and, and is really needed out there. And um, so I, I just want to say one other thing. Save Bennett Valley Golf Course is here to stay in the long run. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. We want to be around to help the city and Touchstone with a lot of the fundraising, events, community outreach. We think we can go a long ways in, in helping, the, particularly the community outreach and events and charity events and integrating some of the uh, collaboration that's necessary with the Galvin Park events. So we want to be here to help in the long run. Thank you. And Dwayne DeWitt is approaching the podium. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, which if you remember from the portrait of Sonoma County 2021 update, is at the lowest and most disadvantaged community in Sonoma County, while Bennett Valley is number one, the most advantaged. I actually worked in Bennett Valley before this golf course was put together at the Safeway. I'm very familiar with Bennett Valley, and I can appreciate all that's been said today, except I think this course should be privatized. It benefits Bennett Valley residents, 
Those houses that are near it have become uh, some of the most expensive in our community. And from the numbers that were just tossed out, it appears that less than 2% of Santa Rosa residents are members of this Bennett Valley organization that's now a nonprofit. One of the things that <clears throat> was emblematic of the whole, if you will, in the past, is the number of members of this course. I remember a previous discussion said only 118 members. It would be best to stop giving any, any general fund money to this project. Let this carry its own weight. It's 150 acres. Housing along there could help more of Santa Rosans than what this project will do. I'm a member of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group. And what surprises me is that <clears throat> all through this entire life of this golf course, the people in the disadvantaged neighborhoods of Santa Rosa have been told there's not enough money to do the things that need to be done. And yet, they've always found a way to make sure there's money for the Bennett Valley Golf Course. <clears throat> Based on what's been said tonight, be looking at $696,000 off the top this first year. You know, you can actually hire a supervised adult crew to trim trees for $1,200 a day. I bet that's not going to happen at the golf course. It could happen in Roseland if you folks would use that money from the general fund to help us. In that previous issue earlier about growth management, on page 18 when it mentioned the city is going to go up to 237 population in 13 years, 65,000 more people coming in. It also pointed out over 30 years he'd only been able to provide 1,870 affordable units supporting it with the housing impact fees. It's an average of 62 houses per year. I think you should be looking at helping with housing out on that 150 acres and let the golfers pay their own way. Privatize it. Bennett Valley folks can buy it. It helps them. The rest of the community can go forward with housing. Thank you. Mayor, we have two raised hands. Um, Mr. Cox. Are you able to see the timer? Mr. Cox, are you able to uh, see the timer? Let's come back to Mr. Cox and let's move on to Gregory. Okay, move up, please. Um, Mr. Farron, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. My name is Gregory Farron. I'm a member of the board of directors of the, of the Bennett Valley Golf Club, but I'm not speaking for them. I'm speaking as the guy who represented them for lots of years before your council, every time you had the choice of what fees to charge on this course. Every year, you would try to, as one member said to me, reach that sweet spot where the fees were just high enough to avoid people not playing. Uh, you, you did compare yourself to other courses, and which is wrong because there are apples and oranges in courses about uh, how they structure fees, but you didn't hear that. You heard, let's try to keep an enterprise out of this, have it pay for itself. Now, the flaw in that was the golf courses like a loved grandmother with cancer. The cancer on this golf course was the decision originally to build it with such high costs that the bonds that it took to be able to repay every year came off the top. Every time I'd ask for some kind of break on junior fees, on keeping the prices low, on paying for the course's upkeep, Every time those decisions were asked for by the operator or by the club or by anybody else, 
the, the answer was, nope, we got to pay the bondholders. All right. So now that it's come down to the roost, you still got bondholders, you still got bond fees, and these fools are telling you that they can raise the rates and be management associates and help you as the responsible parties avoid the bondholders and the costs of the, of the course. You're on the hook for it. Leases encourage them to be able to pay within the system uh, management doesn't. They have no responsibility for the problems you're going to encounter. This is not the end of your general fund. This is just a stop along the way. You've been paying out a general fund for years, making excuses to try to get to an enterprise. This is a failed financial arrangement that was started by the previous council long ago that agreed to $10 million worth of not asked for, overly expensive, hard to run facilities, not the course, the facilities. Uh, wait, you haven't seen anything yet in costs you're going to have to burden while these guys sit around collecting their fees. Annette Arnold, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Annette Arnold. I live in the South Park neighborhood. And I think that the golf course is really nice for the rich people who can afford it, but it really is not going to benefit a lot of the people in this community who really need some basic resources, not something that is extracurricular like a golf course. I think when there's not enough money to do an after school program that got closed in our neighborhood, or to fund the senior center that got closed in our neighborhood. This is in our same district, but there's money to fund a golf course. That is ridiculous. I think the priorities are for helping out rich white people and not really the majority of people in this community who cannot afford these resources for themselves. And I have nothing against the program that wants to operate it. I just think it's a lot of money, it's a lot of resources, it's a lot of land that can be put to much better use by people who really need it versus those who can probably afford it on their own. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I see nobody else rising in the chamber, no additional raised hands, and no public comment, voicemail public comment on this item. Okay, I'll go ahead and bring it back to council. Uh, council member Schwedhelm, let's have you put a motion on the table for a discussion and then we'll do any additional questions or comments from council members. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I make a motion to approve staff's five recommendations as it appears in the report for item 14.1. Second. And it sounded like that was a second from council member Sawyer. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, council member Sawyer, as the uh, chair of the ad hoc, I'll let you start with your comments. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. I do wanna thank our, our, our committee that came together quite some time ago, um, vice mayor and um, also um, Mr. Tibbetts um, at the time um, it was a, a fair amount of, of work and um, commitment. And um, I really want to thank um, Vice Mayor Alvarez for, for his help in moving this project forward. Um, and I also want to thank um, Council Member Fleming for um, recognizing the value of recommending uh, if in the RFP review committee, um, Touchstone. Um, it's clear in listening to their their um, uh, comments today and their presentation that they are highly qualified, uh, not only to run a, a, a golf course that has less challenges, but also be able to run a golf course that has challenges like like ours and has had challenges for 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 quite some time. So I am very um, pleased that they are uh, that they would be uh, assuming that they are selected. Uh, by the council tonight that they are, would be um, at the 
at the helm, not in front of the, of the council and the city, but with us. I think that's really important. This is a bold move. Uh, and there it is, and there, of course, as mentioned um, already, that there are risks involved. And any time that there is a bold investment done by the city, there are risks. But I believe that uh, there are a number of issues that have been long, long standing that need to be rectified. And um, I, I believe that this company is not only capable, um, but dedicated to the improvement of this of our this very important asset for the city, uh, the city wide, regional region wide. Um, it just there, I, I can't think of uh, a a better way to to enhance and um, improve. Uh, both those those standing challenges that have, that that golf course has faced over the years, and also to be able to um, present a plan to uh, be to, to truly create an enterprise for the city of Santa Rosa. So I wholeheartedly uh, endorse the, the, the moving forward with this contract and look forward to a very profitable future for Santa Rosa, um, for, for the Santa Rosa golf course. And it just, um, I, don't, I don't see a downside. Uh, people need to be patient and they need to be supportive. And at the end of the day, um, I, I believe that everyone at the dais would, would be pleased um, to see the results of their action tonight, assuming they move forward. Thank you, council member. We'll go to council member Schwedham. Thank, did you have a question, Councilman Fleming? No, I thought I would pipe in um, since I was on the RFP committee, but I'm not, nothing urgent. I'll, okay. I'll have you go next, Councilmember Fleming. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to make comments or? Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, Councilmember Schwedham. I'll, ha I'll come to Councilmember Fleming after. Great, thank you. Um, I really do appreciate the, um, the presentation and I'm really pleased with Test Stone and what they will be bringing to the table. I had mentioned earlier with um, you know, what we've gone through in the past and for me, you know, Jason, when you mentioned pro forma, this is a business and sustainability and I think staff has put together uh, a sustainable plan and the whole benefit for the community, I know when we first, I think, or I won't say first, but in February of 21, we first talked about this and different options. You know, I, I continue to hear members of the community and um, this council talk about what a gem and a jewel it is, the crown jewel of Santa Rosa. And that it is gonna take some investment because it is an asset of the city of Santa Rosa. And the part that I really liked hearing from Touchstone is what they are planning on doing, what they've done elsewhere regards to the outreach. Because I have personally seen those different groups out there, golf courses throughout the North Bay, whether it be um, high school players, which is always encouraging to see out there, but the multi-generational, and we heard that from many members of the community where um, a grandfather can play with his or her daughter or son in three generations, all playing the same sport together. And there's not many other opportunities for that type of engagement. It's a social thing. And even during um, COVID, as we're starting to come out of COVID, it was pretty much the only thing a lot of people can do, right? And I don't think it's just a blip in the radar that, yeah, if we saw more golf rounds go up during COVID, I think, I think it's sustainable. It's just a wonderful, active sport there. And you know, one of the other things that as we're having this conversation, you know, Santa Rosa, one of our visions is leaders of the North Bay. I think this is actually setting that mark. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do and the improvements to the golf course moving forward. And I really appreciate the efforts of A, this company being recommended because again, as I think during, uh, Jen said during the report, I haven't heard a negative conversation. I've asked a lot of people. In fact, I've even talked to the current operator. What do you think about him? Highly recommend him. Because again, if, if we're gonna move this needle and make it profitable and sustainable, these are the folks that are gonna help us get there. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. I had the unique experience of sitting um, as the council member on the RFP committee. And I'm a non-golfer. I, I do come from an enthusiastic golf family who thought it was quite amusing that I was in this position and 
you know, I read the five RFPs and we interviewed the three um, finalists and you know, it was really clear to me that touch tone would bring to Santa Rosa what it is that we're looking for. And specifically, their answers, and we, and we heard it again today, around engagement, around equity, and around community building really stood out. And so, you know, after talking with the golfers in my life, um, I, I learned that I, I definitely made the, the right recommendation. And, um, you know, as somebody who's not um, ever been a, a golf player, I do look forward to to learning to play, and I, I think that this is going to really turn things around for us, and that it's going to make this um, an asset that attracts people from across Santa Rosa. And if it is not, I'm prepared to, to hold them accountable, and I think that they're prepared to be held accountable. And so. I am um, enthusiastic to learn how to play, and I'm sure I will annoy many people when I'm out there. And I just want to thank all of the participants, all of the staff, and all of the um, respondents to the RFP, um, you know, what, beyond just touch tone, for participating in this process, um, as well as the community members who came out and volunteered their time. It was uh, definitely a learning experience for me. Thank you, Councilmember. Let's uh, jump to the other end of the dais to go to Councilmember Rogers. Um, I pretty much said my comments with the exception that I was very impressed with the community engagement part, and I cannot wait to see it in action in, uh, within our community um, if this goes through, so um, I'm really happy. Um, I, I do know that there are other ways that we can be spending our, our general fund dollars. I'm very aware that um, there are different parts of Santa Rosa um, that historically have not been equitable, we can say are, have not been equitable. Um, but we cannot right that wrong by spending all of our money in one part of Santa Rosa. Um, and so. Um, as a council member, I think that I, it, it is my duty to, to look at that, but to also know that we have to look at all of Santa Rosa. And although I represent District 7, um, I, have to, I have to be one-seventh of a vote for the entire city. And the Bennett Valley Golf Course, like I said, is a beautiful gym. And I would hate for us to lose um, that beautiful open space. Um, because because we have it. And so if this is an opportunity for us to preserve it and to look at a, another way um, to preserve it, then I'm, I'm all in. I don't know how many how many different ways we can look at preserving it, so I hope this, this way works. I'm, I'm just gonna say that. Um, but I, I definitely look forward to our success in our, in our partnership. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. So I want to first say thank you to the Bennett Valley, Save Our Bennett Valley Golf Course folks and that large group that worked so hard to bring it to the attention to the council um, of what a gym we have in our community and that we needed to step in and do something to make it a more profitable organization out there. Um, I have a few dissenting comments from my fellow council members, and it has nothing to do with, I'm sure, the phenomenal business that Touchstone runs, but I do have concerns that we're going from an out-of-town business. Um, and some of it is, I ask this question on almost every single item. Are there any local businesses that can do this work? Do we have a business out of Sonoma County that can come and do this work for us so that we can have and assure that there's more local jobs being created and that we aren't bringing folks from out of town to do work in our county, if possible? Um, so. I would like it if we could maybe consider a couple of different things. In the original RFP process, my understanding was that the restaurant was supposed to be separated out um, as an opportunity for us to potentially work with somebody who has different types of restaurant experience because it's also a huge investment of an invent place that we have in Santa Rosa. So my concern is that by going with um, this particular group is do they have a background 
background in working that restaurant business and the event space, as well as making sure that it's a profitable organization for Sonoma County and Santa Rosa specific. So, so that's one of my concerns. Um, Corsco is actually a local company that runs a couple of golf courses locally. They run Oakmont, who just went through the same process Santa Rosa did and chose them, as well as Roner Park. And so uh, my concern would be that the full council didn't see all the RFPs to see the comparison, and I know that's the purpose of having a committee, but I would like to see if we could perhaps pull the restaurant part of the contract out um, if that's an option, or to send back the contract to city manager and ask her to take a look at maybe the top two or three RFPs. My concern is that we will have interrupted um, play, which is not my desire. Uh, my hope would be that by allowing our city manager to make the decision, we would not have interrupted play and actually may be able to maintain the golf course um, and to keep that very healthy because I do realize that when golf courses are neglected on maintenance, that it can go downhill quite quickly. So that would be my recommendation is my concern that um, we are are being brought uh, a contract that may not be in the best fiscal in, um, decision for the city of Santa Rosa. And we are up against a very tight timeline. And so I don't mean any disrespect for the process that's been done, but I do feel that it's a little bit tight for us. And I hate to potentially approve a contract that may be um, problematic in the future or to see similar results based on us making a decision quickly. Um, so I would like to amend the motion, if I may, at this time, to move to have the city manager have a look at the top two groups and give her, author her authority to negotiate and execute a successful contract to avoid interruption of services and for the contract to be brought for ratification only to the council. And in addition, I would like to have the option for the restaurant portion of the contract to be removed from the contract to seek a more preferred operator with experience in the restaurant businesses and events. So there is a substitute motion on the table. Is there a second for that motion? I, I, would, I would actually support the motion, but I would ask our city manager if that is something that she would be interested in taking on if that's a proper question to ask. Um, to Council Member McDonald, I believe I already have authorization to negotiate the contract based off the recommendations that we have in front of us. But legally, I don't believe I'm authorized to pull out the second part of your motion, which is to pull out the restaurant portion, if I am hearing my uh, counsel correct. For clarification, was that because the RFP went out with the two items to be connected? That is correct. Vice Mayor Alvarez, are you still seconding the motion or did that motion die? I will second the motion out of interest to give the people of Santa Rosa the best that we can. But from what I'm hearing, their legal counsel is saying that you cannot separate one from the next. Uh, yeah, I, so Council Member McDonald, if you could re-clarify your motion based on that information from the city manager, we'll see if there's still a second. And then uh, according to our, our uh, rules for operating, that motion would supersede and we'd go to a vote once we're done with comments uh, on the motion, on the substitute motion. If that motion failed, then we'd have the original motion. So I would move to have the city manager look at the top two or three groups to give her authority to negotiate and execute a successful contract to avoid interruption of services and for the contract to be bought back for council for ratification only. Um, and I will remove the last part of my motion. And I will second. Okay. 
And Mr. Vice Mayor, it's your turn for comments. Absolutely. I, I think I've just proven that I'm willing to go or, or do whatever it's needed in order to give the people of Santa Rosa the best representation that we can. Uh, measure twice, cut once. I know it's painful to even hear that we're procrastinating on an issue that's so important as such as a fire line that, that separates and, and, and provides safety for the residents uh, of Santa Rosa. It, it is truly a gem. I truly believe that. Being that I represent District 1, which would love to see more low-income housing anywhere it can be placed in other places other than District 1, I know that I'm definitely, definitely going against the grain. But as my father taught me, in order to make money, you need to invest money. And that does point me in the direction that we need to do whatever we can in order to come out with the best program that we possibly can. And that's why I want to see us go beyond the yes, beyond the no, and see if maybe we could be innovative in creating a program that we did not devise originally. And I am part of the, 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 the subcommittee that voted to present this today. I believe truly that if we got rid of the middleman, such as uh, uh, what we had before, it provided a greater level of of profitability to the city of Santa Rosa, and that we as Santa Rosans, as we as city council, have more control over what happens at the Benavalle Valley Golf Course, and I think we're demonstrating that before you now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. <clears throat> um, I, I wanted to start off by thanking pretty much the only person who hasn't been thanked so far, and that's our current operator, Bob, uh, who has done a wonderful job uh, and has known this golfing community very well. Uh, and I know he's probably watching this to make sure that he's leaving things in, in good hands. And I know uh, he did reach out and I had a chance to, to read an email from him earlier uh, earlier today on this as well. Um, I, I wanna thank our, our staff for working with the diligence that they have. And I understand the uh, thought process of uh, evaluating it and evaluating it and making sure that we're getting the best that we can. And, and I get that uh, particularly given that we have a, a track record of uh, having a, a contract that we're now being told wasn't the optimal one. I get the hesitancy from council. Uh, we've got to make the best decisions that we can make to meet the expectations and the desires of our community. And, and I'm going to respect the process that got us here tonight, which included a ton of community collaboration. It included council members becoming specialists and understanding the needs of the golf course. It included an RFP process that was clear and concise for the folks who were responding. And it involved uh, experts, including a council member, reviewing uh, the ins and outs of each of those proposals in detail and making the best recommendation that they can for Santa Rosa so that we have continuity of operations so that we can continue to, to grow golf uh, in our community that that asset is available, not just to Bennett Valley, but to people throughout the community. I, I don't live in Bennett Valley, but I play Bennett Valley. Uh, I don't live in Ridgeway, but I swim at the Ridgeway pool. We have community assets that are scattered around our community for a reason. Uh, and we are making investments in every single district and in every single area. Since Roseland's been uh, a part of this city for still under four years or right around four years, uh, this council has put $20 million aside for a what will be a gem for the entire community in Roseland, but not just for Roseland, that'll include a pool and, and other amenities, hopefully, uh, once the, the community decides what they want. We need diverse uh, opportunities for folks to have recreation throughout our community. And, and I'm really grateful to staff for finding a path forward that will have continuity of services. Uh, so I won't be sub, uh, supporting the substitute motion, but I will be supporting the original staff uh, recommendation and the original motion. With that, I'll go ahead and see if there's any additional discussion on the substitute motion before we take a vote on that. Seeing none, uh, Madam City Clerk, if you could call the vote on the substitute motion. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? No. Council Member Sawyer? No. Council Member Rogers? No. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? No. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? No. That motion fails with um, five, four no's. 
and two yeses by Count Vice Mayor Alvarez and I'm sorry, five noes and two yeses by Council Member McDonald and Vice Mayor um, Alvarez. Okay, and so we now have the original motion from Council Member Spethelm and seconded by Council Member Sawyer. Is there any additional discussion before we go to a vote? Mayor Rogers, I have one more um, potential amendment to the motion, and not to beat a dead horse, but I feel pretty strongly about this, so I'm gonna offer one more amendment if I may. Absolutely. Thank you. On page five of 223 of the contract, I'd like to amend this section of the terms of agreement to 18 months with the option to extend the contract to three years upon successful report to the council of the operation of the facilities as well as the restaurant from Touchstone. Let's see if there's a second from another council member. Second. Okay, uh, Madam City Manager and team, is there any input on that substitute motion or, or amendment to the, I'm gonna take it as a substitute motion because um, otherwise uh, I don't think we'll, it would be discussed to the same level. Council Member McDonald, for clarification, can you repeat your motion? Sure, I move that we amend the contract on page five of 223 for this section to read, uh, move the agreement to 18 months with the option to extend to three years upon successful report to the council and, su pardon me, successful report to council and successful operation of the restaurant and all other facilities. So in, in essence, turning this into an 18 month contract with the ability to extend. With, with the to ability the, to then come back to council with a report on data on how the golf course is doing and then to be able to extend it to the full three years from that term on. Uh, can I have a question? Can I ask a question, Mayor? Or Absolutely. Jeff, uh, can we have it to where they, they bring us a report and we, if the report is unsatisfactory, we have the option to, um, to uh, amend the contract because the other way makes it sound like um, the contract is over and I don't we're just starting this relationship and I want to start it off on a on a on a good note like so it, it, it's all in wording for me and I and I want this to be a, a, a good beneficial relationship for everyone so I want to start it off so like I, I do want reports to know how the golf course is doing obviously um, so maybe 18 months we get a report, we know how, how it's doing, they come back to us, but we do have the, the option of, um, of, of not continuing, like some clause in there that if they're not, remember how I was asking like what is your investment, but some clause in there that we do have the option of not continuing with the. To Council Member Rogers, um, if I understand you clearly, what you're recommending is a policy decision which we could move forward forward with, and I believe we could make it part of the um, terms of the agreement. Yes, we would have to enter back into negotiation with uh, with Touchstone to determine if that's consistent with uh, the agreement that they proposed um, to us, if, if that's part of their proposal. Uh, and so we would have that discussion with them, but, but we do have the opportunity to make a recommendation to alter the terms of the agreement and that would just be part of the negotiation. Because 18 months is not a very long time. Um, it's not long at all. And um, I don't think that we're really gonna uh, see what it is that we wanna see. Although we do, we will be able to see numbers and we will start to see uh, a, a trend, so I, I understand that we want them to report back to us, but I don't want them to report back to us thinking that, oh, they might not, um, depending on who's sitting up here, like we might not want the contract to continue. That That's not the, the, the desire. The desire is that we're doing great, Bennett Valley Golf Course is doing great, and no one else is asking for any more money out of the general fund. That is the desire. 
Um, so if I could just respond to that, I, I think one, we're proposing coming back at the six month mark uh, in an effort to try to revise and re uh, look at the actual numbers, the expenditures, the revenue to try to validate the pro forma or to make adjustments in that as we need. Um, but uh, it's our intention on an annual basis at minimum to come back to council as part of the budget process to provide a detailed update. If you remember our, our budget process right now relating to the golf enterprise is fairly minimal. Um, the intent here is we have a much more dramatic and detailed information because it, it's, it's our revenue, it's our expenditure uh, that we're having to deal with it. It's not the operator's revenue and expenditure where we just have a single line item. So as council, you'll be able to review the performance of that particular, uh, of the operator every year uh, and if what you're requesting is that we do that evaluation with council more frequently we're happy to do that that's a policy decision you can ask staff to come back and provide you updates and, and i will also mention uh council members that the intention is to, to keep the ad hoc uh, going to be able to make sure that there is a level of oversight as well let's go to council member fleming Yes, Mayor. May I, um, uh, through you, ask a question of Councilmember McDonald to further understand um, her perspective? I'll just go ahead and do it. Um, so, Councilmember McDonald, um, I would like to better understand where you're coming from. So, having sat on the RFP um, committee, this was not the most local, but it is a local group. And one of the things that stood out about them and set them apart from some of the other respondents was their um, ability to manage really premier municipal um, golf courses in a way that, that was unique. And so um, I'm trying to understand what the root of the concern is. Is it that you have an affinity for the other golf course that you mentioned, or is it about good governance, or is it about a particular worry that we're not getting the best value, or that there's, can you explain perhaps exp explain a little bit so we might meet a resolution that meets your concerns. Thank you for the question. If I may, Mayor, respond yep. to that. Um, so I don't know how to golf at all. I guess the response is when people ask me, do you golf, the, the response is supposed to be not yet. But I have no intention of ever golfing because I am terrible at it. So I, um, it, my intent is truly around ensuring that whatever contract we go into, it is the most profitable for that specific enterprise because of some of the neglect that's been done to our Gem. And so by doing, making sure that we are in the most profitable um, contract, I feel that not only does our community win, but our, our asset wins because we're able to go back and reinvest in the course. And so my concern about using um, an out of the area um, uh, operator is that they don't have the same investment as sometimes people who live locally um, or or have worked with our community locally. Many people who golf at Bennett Valley also go to Oakmont and also go to our other courses and so the intent was just to make sure that we are selecting the, the um, the most profitable uh, contract for the city of Santa Rosa, and there's no other uh, intent behind it other than that. And I don't want to in any way dismiss the great work that Touchstone does around our state, and I don't um, believe that they would even do a poor job. I just want to ensure as a fiscal steward of this, um, of this group that we are ins ensuring that we're going to make the most money so that we can invest that money back into the course. Thank you, and I really appreciate that response. I think that it is absolutely our job to always be investing um, the public's money in a way that yields the best returns and provides the most public good. I do think that um, that for me, I, I won't be supporting the substitute motion that would have them come back for a re-up at 18 months. I don't think it's long enough. I would certainly support um, the already plan for response uh, or update in six months and then annual responses. And um, I would just note that one of the pieces of this that was um, alluring was that the, the GM of the restaurant was a local. And so 
I hope that that might allay some concerns, but I do share in general your your desire to keep things hyper local. But I think what this will do it will help us to uh, be be a, a leader in the North Bay in a way that that um, I'm not sure we could achieve otherwise. All right. So there is another substitute motion on the table. Uh, motion from Councilmember McDonald with a second from Councilmember Rogers. Mr. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Yes, I appreciate that, Mayor. Uh, I'll ask it in the form of a question. Are there performance clauses within the contract that assures that they're performing to a certain level and that would therefore alleviate some of the concerns when it comes to their performance at the Benavale Valley Golf Course? So I, I will, let me start and then Jen can chime in. There is a clause within the, within the agreement that allows them to see an incentive for performance. Um, obviously, if no performance exists, then there's no incentive and they just get their management fee. Um, we have the opportunity as it's part of our normal contracts to be able to um, establish a termination methodology should we find that the operation and the agreement is no longer working for us. Uh, and that's true of any agreement that we would we would enter into with any operator. Um, and so, uh, yes, there is an incentive for Touchstone to be successful. I think you heard that from Touchstone themselves. Uh, and I think from the city's perspective, uh, we expect and anticipate that we're going to be monitoring uh, that work. Uh, we don't want to see this golf course fail any more than we think Touchstone uh, wants to see it fail. Um, and so we'll be working with them hand in hand in an effort to make every possible adjustment we can if it if there isn't a product there uh, then we'll look at what our other remedies and options are um, moving forward thank you and, and with that said i wouldn't be able to support the 18th month contract for the reasons of actually the question that i posed earlier today with the three-year minimum so that we also hope that touchstone can also succeed in their venture in santa rosa thank you All right, Madam City Clerk, if you could please call the vote on the substitute motion. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? No. Council Member Sawyer? No. Council Member Rogers? As stated by Councilwoman McDonald, no. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? No. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Nay. Mayor Rogers? No. That motion fails with only one aye by Council Member McDonald and six no's by the remaining council members. Okay. So we are back to our original motion, which was the staff recommendation. Is there any other substitute motions, discussions, questions? Council Member McDonald? No, there's no more from me. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and call the vote on the motion then. Okay, so just a point of clarity that was seconded by Council Member Sawyer, correct? Correct. Thank you. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? No. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye, and if I may, I, I love the way that we can actually take something and tear it apart if it means it's good, if, if it's for the good of, of Santa Rosans. So aye with that, thank you. And Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with seven ayes with Council Member McDonald voting no. Okay. All right, well to the Touchstone team, we look forward to our partnership and getting moving. And I know that the public is, is really anxious and excited uh, to get to know you as well. Uh, and we'll be checking in as you as you heard. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. We, we look forward to it. We're just thrilled to be involved with Santa Rosa and the community and can't wait to get started. Yeah. Great. Well, Council, we're gonna take a 30 minute dinner break. So we'll come back at 7.35. And we'll come back with item 15.1 uh, before we make our way through the rest of our items.
Eddie, do you want to swing the gavel for me? Yeah. You'll have to hear it, Mayor. <laughs> See you all in a half hour.
So do you get the short straw for this? Or?
All right, Council, I'm noticing a quorum. So let's go ahead and call the roll to reestablish and get going. Okay, Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Rogers? Present. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming? Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Okay, and Council Member Fleming probably will be joining us shortly, so let the record show that all Council Members are present with the exception of Council Member Fleming and Council Member Sawyer. Great, thank you. Uh, Madam City Manager, let's move to item 15.1. <coughs> Item 15.1 is a public hearing authorizing submission of the fiscal year 2022-2023 action plan and approval of grant agreements for public services, fair housing, and housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. I would like to introduce program specialist Ju Julie Guerin. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and council members. My name is Julie Guerin and I'm a program specialist with the Housing and Community Services Department. Uh, the public hearing tonight is for the submission of the fiscal year 2022-2023 action plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and approval of funding recommendations. 
Right. Next slide, please. HUD requires a submission of the action plan to receive Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnership Act, and Housing for Persons with AIDS grants. Council actions requested tonight include the offer, authorization of submission of the plan to HUD and approval of funding recommendations. Next slide, please. HUD requires submission of the action plan <clears throat> uh, to receive these funds. The purpose of the action plan is to define how federal funds will be spent and identify housing and community development needs, goals, and priorities. The action plan template is provided by HUD and is based off the 2020 through 2024 consolidated plan. Next slide, please. Action plan goals. First priority goals are to increase supply of affordable rental housing for low-income households, provide housing assistance, support for low-income households with HIV AIDS, preserve existing affordable housing stock, and provide housing and services to special needs populations. Action plan second priority goals, if there is additional funding include to increase access to home ownership and provide funding for public facilities improvements and promote economic development. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as you can see from the table below, um, fiscal year 2022-2023 estimated allocations, the grant allocations from HUD for each funding source are in the first column and then program income and total available funds follow in the second and third columns. So for fiscal year 22-23, the total available funds include $1,579,132 in CDBG funds, $845,012 in home funds, and $481,043 in HOPWA funds. Um, and I would just uh, note that program income comes from loan repayment from the prior use of funds. Next slide, please. So um, staff held a public meeting on February 4th, 2022 and conducted public outreach through the COC listserv and traditional and social media announcements. Um, the draft annual action plan was available for review and public comment from March 11th through April 11th, 2022. And then again, after receiving updated guidance and a waiver from HUD, um, <clears throat> an updated draft action plan was available for an additional review and comment period from May 3rd to June 3rd of 2022. Next slide, please. Public comments received to date are included in the draft annual action plan. And additionally, any comments received at tonight's public hearing will be included prior to submission to HUD. Next slide, please. Um, for annual funding, 85% of CDBG funds are used for housing and administration, and up to 15% of CDBG funds are used for public services. Um, on November 12th, the city released a request for proposals for the provision of homeless services. Funding recommendations for CDBG funded public services are as follows. The living room is being recommended for $38,870. The homeless service center is being recommended for $102,000. And the family services center is being recommended for $96,000. <clears throat> Um, fair housing. Fair housing is a federally mandated program that must be responsive to the impediments to fair housing. Uh, fair housing advocates in Northern California is being recommended for $45,000 for the fiscal year 22-23 from real property transfer tax, which is part of the general fund. Next slide, please. Hopwa. The city has received a HOPWA allocation of $481,043. 3% of that allocation is used by city for administration. 
face to face, the city of Santa Rosa's HOPWA service provider is being recommended for $466,612 for the fiscal year 22-23. So the, the recommendation um, has four parts. Um, the first part is to authorize the submission of the fiscal year to the 2022-2023 action plan to HUD. The second is to approve the fiscal year 2022-2023 grant agreements for public services, fair housing, and HOPWA. And the third is to authorize the Director of Housing and Community Services to execute the grant agreements. And <clears throat> the fourth is to authorize the City Manager to execute the federal funding agreements with HUD and any additional documents required to implement the action plan. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Council, let's see if there are any questions to start. All right, I'm not seeing any, so I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And let's see if there's any public comment. Um, I see nobody rising in the chamber and no raised hands, and we have no voicemail public comment on this item. All right, we'll bring it back. Council Member Fleming, this is your item. Thank you, Mayor. I'm bringing a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing submission of the fiscal year 22-23 action plan and approving grant agreements for public services, fair housing, and housing opportunities for persons with AIDS and waive further reading of the text. Second. So it's a motion from Council Member Fleming, and it sounded like a second from Council Member McDonald. See if there's any additional comments from the council. I'm not seeing any. So, Madam City Clerk, if you could please call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Sawyer absent. All right. Thank you so much, team. Let's move on to item 14.2. Item 14.2 is a report operating agreement for the Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter and Homeless Services Grant Agreements for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. Housing and Community Services Manager Kuykendall will deliver the report. Thank you, City Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and members of the Council. The item before you this afternoon seeks approval of an operating agreement for the Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter and Homeless Services Grant Agreements for fiscal year 22-23. I am Kelly Kuykendall, uh, a manager in the Housing and Community Services Department. Here with me this afternoon or evening, I also have Sasha Cohen. She's a program specialist that uh, joined our team about two months ago, and we're very happy to have her, and she will be uh, presenting together this evening. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the, the presentation. I'll provide some background on the request for, for proposals. Uh, council direction from February, and then the subject of this evening's council item, which, it, which is the fiscal year 22-23 uh, agreements. Next slide, please. So in November of 2021, the city issued a request for proposals for the provision of homeless services and seeking an operator for Sam Jones Hall for the upcoming fiscal year. That was issued in November and proposals were due December uh, 2021. Uh, an evaluation committee was convened in January of this year. And based on the recommendation of the evaluation committee, staff came forward in February with uh, recommendations on the operator and providers. Next slide, please. So based on the RFP process, the recommendations of the evaluation committee 
and staff recommendation on February 22nd, council approved Catholic Charities um, to continue as the operator of Sam Jones Hall. This was a competitive process. We received three proposals and out of the RFP process, Catholic Charities was selected as the operator. For homeless services, this was uh, non-competitive. We received proposals from existing providers and that includes Catholic Charities Homeless Outreach Services Team, the Homeless Service Center and Family Support Center, as well as YWCA Sonoma County, their Safe Health Shelter Program. And this is an emergency shelter for um, uh, victims or survivors of domestic violence. Council also directed staff to prepare agreements for these programs um, and return for your consideration. That's what we're doing this evening. And I'll provide more information about the, the five-year term in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Uh, Julie Guerin, Program Specialist in our department, just presented on um, the Public Services Program and recommendations for uh, that program. Uh, and you just approved contracts for the Homeless Service Center, Family Support Center, and the Living Room. Um, she, she went into detail about that. I will say that uh, those three programs do receive a uh, community development block grant. Um, HSC and FSC also receive an augment from the general fund. Um, we will be funding our homeless services this year with uh, the American Rescue Plan Act funding, ARPA, um, uh, so long as those programs uh, meet the funding source requirements. Uh, just to provide you with a little additional context, these three contracts were considered under the Public Services Program per HUD requirements. Uh, there's also a Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County, their HC Family Fund Program. Uh, they applied to the Public Services Program. However, due to limited resources under that program, they're being considered under this item. And they'll be funded with general fund and or, a rescue, or, and or ARPA funding. As I mentioned, we'll be funding our um, homeless services programs this year with ARPA unless they receive a, a different funding source. Um, we have the provision in there uh, to allow for general fund resources in the event that a program or service is not eligible for ARPA funding. However, working, however, we're working closely with finance and our consultant to sure, ensure compliance with, with ARPA. With that, I'm going to turn the next couple slides over to Sasha. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So these next two slides are an overview of the operating agreement and grant agreement that we're seeking your approval on this afternoon. I won't be reading out the goals and outcomes, but the information is here on the slides for you to review. So the first program here is Catholic Charities, the host program. It's the Homeless Outreach Services Team. They're a street outreach team that's focused on engaging individuals residing in encampments and getting them into services, shelter, and housing. The budget is $1,035,450. The next program is Catholic Charities for Sam Jones Hall. That's the emergency shelter for single adults. It provides up to 213 beds, basic services, plus housing focused case management. The total budget is $2,128,742. Um, please note that the budget did increase by $66,000, and that was for the Annex Portable Toilets. Those do need to be in place until a permanent bathroom facility um, can be built. And then the budget also, so you know, does include funding from the county and the community foundation, as well as city resources. And then just so you know, the total here at the bottom, the $3,274,192, that's actually going to be the total of slides six and seven that we're seeking approval for today. Next slide, please. So here we have program for YWCA Sonoma County Safe Health Shelter. That's our emergency shelter for homeless victims of domestic violence. The budget for that is $50,000 and that's for five emergency beds plus supportive services. And then we have Community Action Partnership Sonoma County's HCA Family Fund. That's um, financial assistance with security deposits, rent, and mortgage. The funding for that is provided by a private donor. We fund $60,000, and that is for the program administration. Kelly, did you want to talk about the YWCA budget? Yes, briefly before we move on to the next slide, the, the YWCA did request $75,000 for this year, and 
Based on feedback that we received from the budget team, we did try to keep our budgets as flat as possible. So we've kept it at 50,000. Um, I do believe that there is a representative of the YW, YWCA available to speak during public comment if they have held on this late into the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. So the contracts included on this slide are just to give an overview of the other programs that are a part of homeless services. They were included and approved as item 15.1 of today's agenda. So this is Catholic Charities Homeless Service Center. That's our drop-in center that provides basic services such as showers, laundry, telephone, mail, referrals, and shelter intake. The budget is $236,000. Then there's Catholic Charities Family Support Center. That's the emergency shelter for families. It provides up to 138 beds in basic services plus housing focused case management. That budget is $196,000. And then there's the living room. They provide case management, counseling, tr transitional housing and meals for women experiencing homelessness. That budget is $38,870. Next slide, please. Sasha, real quick, Sandy, sorry, can you go back to the, there was just one thing I wanted to highlight on this slide is for the Homeless Service Center, the budget has increased by $34,000 this year, and that's for the Warming Center. Should the city decide to activate it, those funds are intended for that purpose only. Thank you, next slide. Thank you. And I also do want to advise that we did meet with the providers this year. And so the scopes of the services and the outcomes may have some minor changes. So in summary, we've provided the agreements with Catholic Charities for Sam Jones Hall and host Community Action Partnership Sonoma County for the HCA Family Fund and YWCA Sonoma County for the Safe House Shelter. These are for the fiscal year 2022 to 2023 and continuing for up to five years to fiscal year 26, 27 on a conditional basis that's subject to contractor performance and funding availability. And they give the Housing Community Services Director the authority to execute the amendments to agreements subject to these parameters. And this is contingent upon the approval of the budget on June 21st. Next slide, please. So it is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the Council, by two resolutions, approve the following. First, an agreement for the operation and use of the Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter Housing Focused Program with Catholic Charities, the Diocese of Santa Rosa, in the amount of $2,128,742 for the initial period July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023, which is year one, and continuing for up to five years total. So fiscal year 22-23 to fiscal year 26-27, and that's on a conditional basis subject to contractor performance and funding availability. And next slide, please. The second is the grant agreements for the provision of homeless services with Catholic Charities, the Diocese of Santa Rosa for the Homeless Outreach Services Team in the amount of $1,035,450. YWCA Sonoma County's Safe House Shelter Program in the amount of $50,000 and Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County for the HCA Family Fund in the amount of $60,000 for the initial period July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023, which is year one and continuing for up to five years total, fiscal year 22-23 to fiscal year 26-27, again on a conditional basis subject to contractor performance and funding availability. And this concludes our presentation and we are available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much council. Who has questions to start? Councilmember Rogers. Thank you. I had questions about the, the process of um, one being able to go to Sam Jones Hall um, what is the process of being able to go to Sam Jones Hall? And um, yeah, what is the process? To be placed at the shelter, is that your question, Councilmember Rogers? Yes. So our system of care is switched from using coordinated entry for shelter placement for using it only now for uh, housing. And so 
in order to access uh, shelter at Sam Jones Hall, an individual would have to reach out to uh, Catholic Charities to, to access that. Um, and we do have, uh, I don't have it up in front of me, there's a new flyer that was released with the change of coordinate entry and access for individuals uh, seeking shelter throughout the county and at Sam Jones Hall. And so I can share that information um, with the full council and it's also available on our website. Um, and so uh, one would reach out to Catholic Charities and is that during certain hours or? It's typically during uh, business hours. So I, I just find it <clears throat> hard to conceptualize because emergency shelter um, is people tend some people will need emergency shelter not during uh, business hours. So what happens in, in those cases? For after hours response, I'm not aware of a resource right now. We do have some, um, some beds set aside for uh, first responders um, after hours and they would reach out direct, directly to the shelter operator to Catholic Charities. But outside of that, you know, the response right now or the availability after hours is pretty limited throughout the county. Okay, and, and what what team or what, who do they reach out to in Catholic Charities? So they have to contact Catholic Charities and I think Sasha is working on pulling up the information as I'm trying to answer these questions, so thank you. Yeah, so it, to get into Sam Jones Hall, applications can be made by calling the Homeless Service Center. Um, the phone number is available on the county's website for them, and applications are accepted Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And what about after hours? I don't believe there's any information about after hours on the flyer, and again, that is a need throughout the county. I'm asking because people are brought to our ERs or um, brought for emergency services um, by our first responders and um, <clears throat> they're not being provided access to our shelter. So if you call the shelter, the shelter has beds and we're paying for a service and Catholic Charities cannot be um, contacted. In, in my personal firsthand experience. And so I wanna know how that, uh, it, it hopefully is changing um, with this different coordination of, of care or is it changing or, because it's, it, it, it's really difficult when you have someone that goes to the ER for something or the police can't contact Catholic Charities to get someone into a bed so they drop them off at an ER. That's not proper care because they have nowhere else to, to take them. And, and that's the normal in our community. So I want to know how this is being remedied if we're paying for a service. The service needs to occur and providers shouldn't say, oh, well, we never can get a hold of them. That's not okay. I, I called from 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. in the morning, and I would call the shelter, and the shelter said, you have beds, but you have to call this number. We have beds, but you have to call this number. We cannot accept someone. You have to call this number. You have to call this number. So, and I, and I brought this <clears throat> concern up multiple times, but we cannot keep having people stay in our emergency uh, psychiatric system or our emergency medical system, if we have services within our community that we are paying for with taxpayers' dollars that are clogging up other areas of care if, because providers are not providing the service. And I, I just, I, I would like a, a resolution. I want an answer, and I don't want to just keep kicking the can down the road because it's not acceptable care. So to Council Member Rogers, I don't, I don't want to speak for Catholic Charities, but I mean, I think we're in a situation, we don't have a perfect system. Uh, it's almost like 
we have in response as well and we're trying to make that 24 7. I think this is something that we can have a conversation with our providers about. Um, it, uh, I believe Kelly did speak to this is a concern that we have throughout the county. I think it's something that we can have a conversation with with our partners as we you know continue to build out our shelters. Um, I don't have the exact answer for you right now because I don't know the operating capacity. Um, but I think it's something that we can look into and get back back to you with. Council member, do you have more? I will re I will be quiet for now, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I do because I've been saying this, this is not the first time that I've said this and I still don't have an answer and our, we don't have the capacity in other areas, but yeah, I'll wait for an answer, but I don't, I don't really care to have an answer. I want to see results, not an answer. Councilmember Fleming. Thank you. I want to just um, echo what Council Member Rogers is saying, that this is a persistent experience that we have in the emergency rooms. We both work in emergency psychiatric services where often the access to the shelter is the thing that's putting it, the, um, a person unnecessarily in emergency services. What I think would be a reasonable resolution would be to work with Catholic Charities to get a phone number that could not just be provided to what we think of as traditional first responders like police and fire, but also to the emergency rooms and to the county psychiatric unit. And I think that if we could have that done within the next week or two so that we can all have access to that intake number, that would be just a simple and seamless resolution to this issue. I don't mean to speak on your behalf, Council Member Rogers. I just think that that would be a tangible and simple solution. I, I would love to agree with you, but when I have police call for me, because I think that that would be the resolution, and they say that they cannot contact anyone, um, that they have the same problem, then I know that the problem is not a title. The problem is the process of actually getting a hold of someone. So when I actually say, you guys drop someone off here, they are medically cleared, we're done with them. They don't need to be in a medical facility or whatever the case may be. And so now they need to be discharged, but we don't have anywhere to discharge them. So now they're in a medical facility and they cannot be moved. Can you come pick them up? Well, we can't get a hold of anyone at Catholic Charities either, but we will keep calling. And they can't get a hold of anyone? That's a problem. And well, what number are you dialing? And we're going back and forth. Well, we're, everyone's dialing the same number and no one can get a hold of them. So it is a little frustrating because it's, it, it is a system that isn't working, but when we have a part that we're paying for that should be working um, and there are beds available, it's not that we don't have beds, we're paying for something that we should be, the community should be receiving. So th that is the problem. It's not that we don't have the capacity. We have the capacity, it's there, but the service that we are paying for is not being provided. That's my problem. All right, Council, any other questions? Mayor Rogers, may I speak? Yep. Thank you. So on the contract under the agreement on page two of 44, it says so, scope of services, the shelter, the shelter shall be open 24 hours per day, seven days a week, 365 days per year. In addition to that bullet, could we then add any number shall be provided for us to contact the shelter to obtain services? So that we can actually put it in writing in the contract that a number is then provided for that 24 hour care. Councilmember McDonald, I think we can add that to the contract. Thank you. 
Mayor, may I add, add, yep. Go ahead, add, Member Fleming. May I add to that that um, that number will be staffed as well, 24 hours a day, by somebody who has the capacity to accept p people into the shelter. Thank you. An amendment to the amendment. We'll consider that a friendly one. Well, we don't have any motion on the table yet, so we'll bring that back after. Do we need comments. to have a motion, Mayor Rogers, for us to add that contract, or well, can now, we just now direct it? The, now is not the appropriate time for us to make a motion yet. We're going to finish our questions and go to Councilmember Schwedhelm and then do public comment. But we'll we'll include that when we discuss it. And then a. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rogers. I, I guess my question would be adding, I, I totally get the need. Um, and if our goal is to have 24 seven access where people can enter it, if we have capacity of the shelter, there's gotta be a cost for that. Because I'm guessing the people that answer the phone are different than the intake people. Just being part of the conversations with coordinated entry as to why that system was not working because there was not enough funding from HUD so that you could do both the housing and emergency shelter intake. Same thing with you know, one of my colleagues mentioned uh, we want to release someone from the hospital. Well, we have a Nightingale program that also has capacity issues. So again, all this stuff so sounds great, but there's a cost attached to it. And at this point um, where we have dollar figures here, that if our desired goal was to have 24 seven opportunity for intake with a number, but actually people where you could take them in, I would like to know what are those additional costs going to be? If I may, uh, Mayor Rogers. Yeah, please. So um, thank you for this input. Um, and we will look into this and come up with a solution. I know that Council Member McDonald has presented one uh, today. Um, one of the issues that we'll have to navigate is the conditional use permit um, does not require us, does not allow us to do intakes at the shelter. They're done out, outside of the shelter off site. Um, Again, you know, something we can navigate, but I do want to raise it tonight. And the, the intent of that condition of the permit um, dates back to opening the shelter um, and trying to prevent, um, you know, people showing up at the shelter, potentially impacting the neighborhood to get, get services. The other issue is I'd have to talk with Kathy Cherries about any costs um, associated with having um, a, a phone uh, number, excuse me, staffed. Uh, for a 24 seven access to the shelter to um, council member Schwedhelm's point. Thank you. Any other questions, council? Council member Rogers. Um, is it not, is, is there not already a, um, a phone that is connected to Catholic charities? Um, did that change when we change the coordinated entry. So intakes for the shelter are done via the homeless service center. And so that is operational during business hours. And so I don't have a phone number available for you this evening. I can look into that and, and get back to you. So my question initially was how um, do we have beds available outside of the business hours? And you said that for, uh, I think, I want to say you said for first responders. Do those, so there are, go ahead. Do those individuals not have to go through an intake process? That, I, I don't know, council member. Um, Rogers, I'm not entirely familiar with the after hours process. And so I can look into that and get back to you. You're asking some excellent questions this evening and I'm sorry, I just don't have the information available for you right now. So, and by, by any means, I'm not saying let's open up the intake process for 24 seven. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there are circumstances in which people are within our community that require intake into our shelter. Um, like if someone was in a situation where they're being battered, we don't say come back at 9 a.m. You need to stay 
where you're at and the situation you're in until 9 a.m. Please come back to the women's shelter or the shelter where we will help you and your children until 9 a.m. Please stay in, in, in where you're at. So there are situations where people need emergency shelter. That is what I'm saying. And the hospital and our emergency psychiatric facilities, including uh, our police, uh, fit under that criteria. And so if the police drop someone off somewhere, I think that fits under that, that, that criteria. Um, and so that's what I'm saying. What is, what is that process? Um, and how do we do that? I don't think that that would be an additional cost if it is already there. Just how do we access that is what I'm saying. Because I was just told it's already there. We're just not being able to access it. So, thank you. So, council member, what I'm hearing, and I'll let staff tell me if I'm wrong, is that it's not the, uh, necessarily a capacity issue with the shelter. It's that the use permit for the shelter as it currently exists prevents intake from being at the shelter. So if there's going to be intake off site, there could potentially be a staffing cost to have an additional person at a place that didn't otherwise wasn't open. Uh, so what I'd suggest is we let staff talk with the provider and come back to us with uh, the, any type of fix that we can come up with uh, to try to work around that that barrier. Uh, Council Member Fleming, go ahead. Yeah, I think that what might help me with this piece of under of reconciling Council Member Schwedhelm's concern about the funding to make sure that these services are more accessible to our, you know, most vulnerable folks is understanding what the current mechanism is for first responders and if it is or isn't working for them and then you know not reinventing the wheel but going from there and making sure that system does work and then figuring out how that we can um, tap into that instead of setting up or standing up a whole new service. Rogers, may I ask a question? Yep. Since the contract specifically says the shelter shall be open 24 hours per day, seven days per week, 365 a year, would we not just need to get clarification on how to access the shelter? That seems to me to be the missing um, piece of the contract is the, access, the accessibility of the shelters that we have. It's not that they don't have a bed. It's not that we have a problem in the intake process. We have a problem with access after hours. So I, I think if we had that clarification brought back to us, we could move even forward with this contract to not interrupt services for the folks that need it the most right now, but that is a necessary component. And so I would feel more comfortable adding it to the contract so that it's very clear what our expectations are for the shelter and that we were, would be able to, the community would be able to um, access somebody on site or off site because a phone can actually go to somebody's home in an emergency situation if there's a 1-800 number and it's routed through to somebody who could potentially be on call that night. I'm looking to, to Kelly or the city manager. Council Member McDonald, so I believe what we um, need is clarification on what is meant by 24-7. And if it's 24-7, then where's the intake process? Um, who can actually do the intake? What is the process for first responders? Um, I think that's that's all I have. If there's other questions that I'm missing, and and perhaps the contact information, yeah, the contact, the telephone number. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
My concern is that it shows in the contract that we have access to the shelter, as Councilmember Rogers has stated. What's not clear is how we access it, and that's probably because it's not delineated in a contract for anyone to be able to go back to and say, this is what's expected. So we believe we're paying for a service, and then if that service is not accessible to community members that really are in need of it. That is where the frustration, I think, is lying to many of our um, first responders, including those families that perhaps Council Member Rogers has been working with. So that would be my um, solution to this clear problem that we ha seem to have, and I think that Catholic Charities would be able to give us that information if we went back to them. We can bring you back that clarification. Kelly? Thanks, Mayor Rogers. I just want to point out, and I understand we need to clarify the accessibility issue raised this evening. 24-7 operation is different than 24-7 um, access to the shelter. There are currently five beds that are set aside for, um, for uh, first responders or for public safety. And so uh, I hear the feedback and appreciate it about how do we access those beds, particularly after hours. Um, but there, there's a limited, uh, limited amount of beds that are available. I did clarify with Catholic Charities the intake process. So somebody could come in in the evening after hours, and then the intake could be done the following day. So just wanted to provide that additional information. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Yes. So why isn't the phone being answered for people to access those beds? So There's Council a Member, I think that I think that you have gotten an unsatisfactory answer, and I get that. But I think staff, what I'm hearing from staff is that they need to be able to take this back. They're not going to have a good answer for us tonight. Well, she just got some really good answers right now on the fly, and I just thought that would have been one of the questions about the the phone. Um, and what phone that is, and what is that process, and who answers that phone, but, okay. And Kelly, can you get back to us with that answer? In this moment, no, but I can get back to you after the meeting, yes. Okay. Any other questions, Council? All right, let's go to public comment on this item then. Okay, don't see anybody rising in the council chamber and I have Madeline O'Connell. Um, go ahead, please. Hi everybody, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. I don't see my clock, but I'll try to keep it short. Thanks Kelly and Sasha, yes, the YWCA hung in there. I was there in person and uh, then I did have to get home as my children are headed to bed soon. Um, I just uh, am very grateful for the opportunity to speak on behalf of YWCA, uh, Sonoma County's singular, vital and um, only domestic violence service provider. We do have the only, one and only uh, shelter for families fleeing violence inside their own homes. To flee violence in your home uh, immediately uh, creates homelessness in your life. Um, we started back in 1975. Um, we, uh, the very first thing we did was start a crisis hotline. And that number for everyone listening in the 707 area code is 546-1234. We answer that call 24 seven. My staff of advocates are on an on-call system, which includes overnight shifts. Uh, it's not inexpensive, but it's vital to support families enduring a situation where they need immediate triage. It might be three in the morning and it might be three in the afternoon, but we're here to answer that line. I wanna tell you a little bit about the shelter that you support. And um, I recall very distinctly being in your chambers back in uh, 2018 for our original contract. Um, our home is a 4,500 square foot uh, Victorian. Uh, from the turn of the century, eight bedrooms, uh, two kitchens. We've remodeled every single window has been replaced, new roof, new flooring, um, new HVAC. So it's got air and heat on all three floors. 
Uh, we're um, asking for an increase in our contract, which we have not um, increased from our original amount back in 2018, 19 of 50,000 thousand dollars we're asking for an increase of twenty five thousand and the numbers just uh, add up inflation and the cost of living increases for our staff has been quite an expense over the past year um, that's increased by thirty five percent and there's been a twenty percent increase in employer costs related to staff benefits um, we are solid in Santa Rosa in Sonoma County we're not going anywhere we've been here since 1975 and we're here to support families Trouble is, it costs money to do that. And I'm hopeful that you will um, see fit to increase the uh, budgeted amount from 50 to 75,000. Call me back anytime. I'd love to be part of your study sessions on how to respond to our most vulnerable citizens whenever they need us. And you can learn more about us at ywcasc.org. Thank you so very much for your time and attention to my comments. Um, Mayor, I have no additional hands raised and no voicemail public comment on this item. Great, thank you. And Madeline, just a huge thank you from uh, all of us for all the work that you and your team do. We know it's not easy work, but it's important work, and you've been a, a really great partner for the city. Uh, so just want to say thank you for that. Uh, Council Member Sweathelm, can you please put a motion on the table? Sure, I've got two resolutions. Start with the first one, uh, move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving an agreement between the City of Santa Rosa and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa for the operation of the Samuel L. Jones Homeless Shelter Housing Focused Program for fiscal year 2022-2023, year one, in the amount of $2,120,742 and continuing for up to five years total, fiscal year 2022-23 to fiscal year 2026-27 on a conditional basis and authorizing the chief financial officer to pay all proper claims and costs and waive further reading the text. Now, council member, do you wanna articulate again uh, let's go to Councilmember McDonald. I think you were the one that was wordsmithing a little bit. Um, what additional bullet points you were hoping to have added? Let me get back to the contract, Mayor Roger, Rogers. I apologize for that. Um, well, while you do that, let me make sure I have a second on the motion. Oh, second. Okay, there you go. If I may, if, um, if I may, through the city manager, I, I thought I heard the motion is only covering the first resolution. Did you intend to do it one at a time, or correct? Okay, thank you. So, would you like me to amend the motion to add that language to the I, bullet in the contract, or would you like me to just direct staff to ask that that be added? Um, I think if I think ask uh, to make a friendly amendment, if that so suits you, and we'll see if. Tom is amenable to it. Sorry, I'm trying to read the text below, so I'm sure that I heard you. You wanted me to go ahead and make an amendment to the contract under bullet C to add the language to add it. Well, Council Member Fleming it, had additional language that she added onto my suggestion. So would you like us to combine our suggestions? I apologize if I'm not hearing you correctly. No, it's all good. I'll say if somebody would like to make a friendly amendment, I'll entertain that now. Okay. And then we'll see if Council Member Schwethelm uh, is okay with that amendment. And for my part, Council Member McDonald, I um, had asked for something that uh, came with associated costs that were unknown to me. So I will allow you to put forth your friendly amendment as you see fit and then. Um, We'll get on there. <laughs> Thank you. So under on page 2044, under section agreement, bullet C, where it says shelter shall be open 24 hours per day, seven days per week, 365 days per year, add the additional language of any number shall be provided to access the shelter. I'll second. Okay, and uh, Council Member Schwedhelm, are you okay with the friendly amendment? I, I guess I would just need clarification. What do you mean by access the shelter? So if someone answers the phone, because I'm hearing what the issue is, people want to have 
to be able to actually enter and stay there, which again, I think has some additional costs. So what is your definition of access? Well, I guess my clarification on this is if the shelter is saying they're open 24 seven and 365 days a year, there's clearly people there. What seems to be the barrier is no one to call to get into the shelter. So you can be at home and take a call, but someone will need to meet that person that's in need to allow them entry into the shelter, if it's a temporary bed of the five day by beds or whatever we do have. But it seems to me the first barrier is we can't access a person to get to the shelters. The second barrier perhaps is we have no one on staff to bring them into the shelter. We just don't know that right now based on tonight so but because it says we have access to a shelter 24 7 it would seem to me that a phone number should be provided of how to get to that shelter i, I guess where i'm struggling because i heard staff say basically this is consistent with our um, temporary occupancy or our um, operating permit so if we were to make some changes here we may be in violation of our own use permit did i hear that correctly I, do, I think what we have, I think we can provide a phone number because it's my understanding that we can do intake, Cor correct Kelly, shake your head yes or no, or there is access to beds. The intake process would have to take place the next morning. Uh, so what we need to do is provide a phone number for someone, whether it's first responders or the hospital, we need to provide a phone number so someone can call so they can have access to the shelter. Correct. The intake part seemed to me that could be delayed. It's the access to a bed that's necessary and imminent under those circumstances. That so is correct. that would be my concern of not adding that we are requiring a phone number is provided so that so, our first responders can get a hold of you. It sounds to me we're just talking about logistics. There, there, there needs to be a number for individuals to call to make certain that there are beds available if first responders or if there's a release from the hospital, they can call this number. And I will clarify with Catholic Charities to make certain that we're not adding anything that would increase the contract. Right. My concern is so they call, they talk to someone, yeah, we have bed space, Okay, we need that right now. That's what I heard from some of the colleagues. And that is going to add some additional costs is what I'm hearing and might be in violation of our conditional use permit of doing, taking care of that person who needs an emergency shelter bed. I don't think we have the 24 seven ability to do that based on our conditional use permit that I heard staff say. There's access to the bed, but the intake process would take place the next morning. But I guess that's what I'm questioning. Would that be a violation of a conditional use permit if, that, if a person who needs an emergency shelter bed outside the normal hours be in violation of the conditional use permit? I do not believe so. Kelly, can you clarify that? So go against the conditional use permit. I will say that our declaration of shelter crisis, which provides us greater flexibility for public property, so city owned property, um, that we do have some flexibility to make adjustments to the conditional use permit. Um, not formally, not going through a formal conditional use per permit um, uh, process, but we have made adjustments to that over the past several, several years to, uh, for example, increase our occupancy um, in response to the demand for shelter beds in our community. So bring it back. I think we're all on the same page. I'd love if we got a bed, let, let, let's get them in there. But are there some unintended consequences of this decision? Because we don't have the operator here to say this is why this process ended up the way it is now. And doing this live when we don't have all the data. I, 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 I totally get we're all familiar with the situations where someone needs emergency shelter. We have no way of getting it. This contract is, you know, if we need to modify it, can that specific aspect of it, once we get more feedback from the operator, come back without delay of the contract versus making a decision now without having feedback from the operators to why the system is set up the way it is right now? Because it does sound like an easy solution. So again, I'm not opposed to what we're trying to do, but if there's gonna be a problem, because of the same issue, whether it be the crisis response center, Nightingale, this is not the only place where this occurs. So look at the system as a whole, 
I, I, I'm not comfortable making a change on the fly without a little bit more data about are there some unintended consequences of what we're all trying to do. So how about uh, this idea? Um, you approve the contract with the change that the council member recommended conditional on one, no increased cost, and two, that it's consistent with the conditional use permit. I'm all for that. <laughs> so moved. I think somebody has to second that if I so move it. Well, actually, if it's a friendly uh, amendment, I will accept that as long as yeah. the clerk has got the language that our assistant city attorney just shared. Yeah, Mr. Burke, if you could re repeat that, please. Sure, so the motion would be to approve the contract with the amendment that was made about inserting the phone number conditioned on two things. One, that there's no increased cost in the contract, and two, that the change is not inconsistent with the conditional use permit. That's what I meant. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, is there any additional discussion on that point? I, I hate to belabor Council it. Council Member Fleming? Yeah, I hate to belabor it, Mayor, but um, the last piece about consistent with a conditional use permit, given that we're under a, all, and also consistent with the state of emergency, so that staff and Catholic Charities has some flexibility, because if we go all the way back to the original um, conditional use permit and don't take all those other subsequent factors into consideration, it may limit some of the things that staff and Catholic Charities might be able to do to improve access. What I heard is the language that Mr. Burke suggested, but then also saying, and also, consistent with the conditional use permit and or the emergency declaration. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure was in there. Is that, I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying and making sure that I heard you correctly. And Mr. Burke, would that be acceptable? Yes. All right, let's check with Council Member Schwethelm. Absolutely, that makes sense. Okay, and the second? Councilmember McDonald. Do you want me to second that again? I made the motion. Would, no, I'm making, I'm making sure you're good with that. I, I'm happy with that amendment. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, Madam City Clerk, could you please call the vote? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Schwedhelm. Aye. Councilmember Sawyer. Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming. Yes. Vice Mayor Alvarez. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Councilmember Sawyer absent. Okay, and Councilmember Schwedelm, your second motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the following. One, grant agreements for the provision of homeless services with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa Homeless Outreach Services Team in the amount of $1,035,450. YWCA Sonoma County Safe House Shelter Program in the amount of $50,000 and Community Action Partnership of Sonoma County HCA Family Fund in the amount of $60,000 for fiscal year 2022-2023 year one and continuing for up to five years total fiscal year 2022-23 to fiscal year 2026-27 on a conditional basis and two, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to pay all proper claims and costs and wait for the reading of the text. I would like to second. Okay, I had a motion from Councilmember Sweathelm and a second from Councilmember Rogers. May I Any make discussion? A, may, may I, I make a friendly? Oh, I apologize. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Councilmember Rogers. Um, can we? Do, can I make an amendment to a friendly amendment to see if we can provide them with the additional twenty-five thousand? That's the motion from, from the amendment from Councilmember Rogers. Uh, Councilmember Swedhelm, do you accept the friendly amendment? 
I would ask the impacts from the city manager because I know we have mid-year budget and where I'm hesitant, very, again, once again, where the cause is. Heck, I'd rather increase their contract by 100,000, but I don't know what other impacts that would have. Could it potentially be a discussion at our mid-year budget update where we get a big picture of all of our funding needs and ask and what they are versus doing it right now in isolation on this item? Yeah, Council Member Swetham, thank you for that question. This is a cost we talked about bringing back mid-year. Um, I know mid-year didn't take place till almost February of uh, this past year, but we're hoping to bring back the mid-year budget around September, October. Um, so um, if you know you don't mind waiting until the mid-year budget, I think it's probably a cost we could bring back, or an, uh, excuse me, a recommendation we could bring back to you then. And so that would be my preference because, again, I think let's increase it. And I don't think not funding it tonight would have any operational costs on the safe house. And, again, I, I would like to look at it with all the other funding challenges that were being faced. So I, I wouldn't accept it on this motion right at this point. Okay. Um, would you like to make a substitute motion then, Council Member Rogers? Um. Yes, let's do that, Mayor. So, walk me through this one. How do we? I think your, I think your substitute. Yeah, I think your substitute motion would be essentially the the staff recommendation with the change of the added twenty five thousand. Yes, I would like to make a substitute motion with the staff recommend recommendation um, with the additional twenty five thousand. Is there a second for that motion? For clarification, would that $25,000 be brought back at mid-year budget review? Or are you asking for that to be brought in tonight so that it's added to this budget for clarification on your motion? Now, and then that would be it. Council Member Fleming? Yes, I, um, uh, Hearing no second, um, I have a, a slightly different motion that might be more um, acceptable, which is, is it possible to bring that back when we adopt our budget this month um, so that we can look at it holistically um, and make changes as we last minute, small tweaks that are usually, you know, this size or even a little larger at that point. I would need to defer that question to my CFO because we are bringing back some other recommendations. Um, do I have um, the CFO on the line? I think Alan needs to be pr promoted, but I do see him on there. We are Didn't he just get a promotion? <laughs> Don't get me started with bad jokes, council member. <laughs> Uh, so I think um, the question to you, Mr. Alton, um, and congratulations on both promotions, is um, would it be possible to have um, a, the $25,000 increase brought to us as a line item on the budget that we'll be hearing later this month? So uh, during the budget period, uh, you, you could, or during the adoption, you could request that. I would say this that additional amount would then take our balance budget and put it out of balance by, by that amount. So that that's the decision that you would weigh at that time. Uh, but of course, uh, it could be uh, uh, added uh, to the request and adoption. Um, by how much would it put our budget out of balance? Right, right now we're we're literally balanced, so it'd be twenty five thousand dollars over. Okay, I will hold off on my um, substitute motion and um, suggest that we wait till the mid year review. Okay, so the motion was made by Councilmember Rogers to do a substitute motion with the added twenty five thousand. Is there a second for that motion? Okay, seeing none, 
uh, we'll revert back to the original motion, which was the staff recommendation. Is there any additional discussion on that motion? All right, Madam City Clerk, if you could please call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes with Council Member Sawyer absent. All right, let's go to item 14.3. Good evening, uh, Mayor Rogers, uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez, my God, Vegas again here, uh, bringing you the Measure O Violence Prevention Partnerships Choice Cycle 11 Grant Program Funding Recommendations. So uh, before I jump into this presentation, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to our Violence Prevention Partnership staff member, Madeline Brown, who's been absolutely instrumental in the success of this launch. Um, launching this has been a huge lift um, because I'm new and we have a lot of uh, staff who are new uh, and we could not have gotten this far without her help and dedication. So I just, I had to say that. So um, thank you and next slide, please. So uh, some quick background on the CHOICE uh, program. Uh, Measuro passed uh, in 2004, so this comes from our Measuro uh, funding, which was a quarter cent transaction tax in use for the last 20 years. Um, and it will be concluding in fiscal year 2024-2025, the Violence Prevention Partnership and Recreations Neighborhood Services Division received 20% of the Measuro revenue. Um, of that 20%, 35% of that is allocated for grants to community-based organizations and local school districts. Um, so we launched the Community Helping Our Indispensable Children Excel grant program in um, 2006, and it's been instrumental in our violence prevention um, efforts. And we can go into the next slide, please. So after rebranding from the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force in 2015, the partnership expanded the scope of its mission to reduce youth and gang violence by adopting a public health approach. Consistent with other local initiatives such as Health Action, Cradle to Career, and Upstream Investments, the Violence Prevention Partnership is designed to improve the health and safety of the community. This upstream approach of understanding the root causes of violence provides the partnership with an opportunity to identify strategies that will address the key determinants of the community's overall health and safety. The community safety scorecard articulates the idea that safety is more than just crime statistics and incorporates indicators across from four major domains, those being econ uh, economic conditions, crime and safety, family and community connectedness, and school conditions. Um, in 2017, uh, the strategic plan was launched, which included data gathered and analysis through surveys and focus groups with community members and partners, complemented by extensive research of evidence-informed practices and programming. The plan uh, that um, the strategic plan that the Violence Prevention Partnership needed to, uh, found that they needed, we needed to invest in numerous programs that supported pro-social activities and behavior in youth and families and provide alternatives to gang involvement by supporting community organizations that align with our four pillars, which are school readiness, street outreach and mediation, student engagement and truancy prevention, and workforce development. Um, and next slide, please. So if approved, funding for the agencies will commence on July 1st of this year and end on December 31st of 2024. Each funding year, we will be able to allocate $750,000 with a cap of $150,000 uh, per program, meaning that no program will receive more than $150,000 per year. The allocation will take place contingent on 
available funds, satisfactory performance of scopes of work, completion of required outcomes and measurements, and discretion of the city manager or designee. Another point to keep in mind is that the recommended agencies must provide a 50% funding match with up to 25% of that being available to be in kind. So that's another point to make. And we can go to the next slide, please. The process for identifying and selecting the community agencies began with the 2021 Community Needs Assessment, where we identified a deep and urgent gap in services for youth ages 13 to 18. Through this report, we identified further important needs or items to consider for cycle 11. One of those being a need for pro-social activities and in and out of schools, need for mentorship and access to positive role models, guidance and support during and post-pandemic, need for trauma-informed care among school staff and community partners, and a need for culturally relevant programming. The request for qualifications was released on January 10th of this year. Our team provided a technical assistance orientation shortly after the release for community agencies to inquire more about the grant opportunities and partnership. By the last day to submit, we had received 17 applications, totaling an ask of over $2 million per year. February 24th, the grant review team met for an orientation on the selection process. April 5th, our grant review team, who represented various community sectors, came together to culminate the selection process. I do want to note that in addition to the framework from our 2021 Community Needs Assessment, the review team made the selection using, again, the 2017 to 2022 Violence Prevention Strategic Plan, the 2016 Community Safety Scorecard, and the Measure O Ordinance. So these documents highlighted a specific focuses on positive youth justice model, trauma-informed care, wraparound approaches, culturally relevant methodologies, results-based accountability, place-based initiatives, and high needs areas as identified by our scorecard. Finally, on May 18th, we shared the upcoming recommendations with the Violence Prevention Partnership Policy Team and the Executive Advisory Board. So we're going to go to the next slide, please. So the grant review team was made up of the community members and partners that you see here. We have Bridget Beck from Sonoma County Probation, Interim Chief John Cregan from Santa Rosa Police Department, Superintendent Anna Trinnell from Santa Rosa City Schools, Dr. Hector Rico from the Roseland, who is a superintendent at the Roseland School District, and Leslie Graves, who is our chair for the Community Advisory Board. Jesus Rosales not only works for Verity as a youth outreach specialist, but also is one of our Latino service providers, Pro Promotores, and works very closely with youth in and out of the juvenile hall and in our communities. Jeff Tibbetts, who is our Director of Recreation. And we can go to the next slide, please. So to get us started in the categories, we have school readiness, and the grant review team selected four Cs, Early Education Outreach Intervention Program, which works one-on-one with at-risk families in prioritizing communities and connect families to early education, child care, as well as all needed family supports. Four Cs will also offer early care scholarships to families needing immediate support, and additionally, four Cs will continue, has continued to successfully launch grassroots outreach strategies, including door-to-door, on the radio, social media, and they have a very strong presence in the community at community events. Next slide, please. In the category of student engagement and truancy prevention, the review team selected Center for Wellbeing's Project True, which is a school-based leadership program which empowers youth in high-need areas. It employs a strength-based and harm reduction model that is effective in increasing student engagement and fostering student success. Community Matters 
Safe School Ambassador Program. This is an evidence-based program it, which empowers and equips carefully selected students with intervention skills that reduce bullying and mistreatment, LAMPACs, rooting youth in nature, providing teens ages 13 to 18 with culturally relevant, healthy outdoor recreation, trust and relationship building, addressing stressors through nature and supporting adults to support youth, all alongside peers and positive adult role models. Raices Collective Programa Cosecha. This is a student-led community facilitated program, which will allow students to identify current social emotional needs, which will boast, bolster Raices capacity to serve as critical partners in delivering culturally relevant and informed workshops that will meet student identified needs. Uh, next slide, please. The Boys and Girls Club of Sonoma Marin's REACH program, which is Diversion and Intervention Program, uh, is housed at our local juvenile hall. The REACH program aims to mitigate dangerous behaviors of high-risk youth through outreach, mediation, and intervention, along with life skills education and cognitive development programs to change the lives of youth. Community Action Partnership of Sonoma's Roseland Strong Program it's a continuum of integrated place-based programs providing services in Southwest Santa Rosa, focusing on youth and family success, including building strong relationships with residents and connecting them to partners and the larger community. LifeWorks of Sonoma County's El Puente program uh, provides in-home therapy to youth and their families using a culturally responsive, strength-based approach focused on healing trauma building communication, connection, and enhancing resiliency. The program is delivered by two bilingual bicultural counselors trained in evidence-based therapeutic modalities who join families in creating their own goals, breaking disruptive cycles, honing in on existing strengths, and building effective skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the process of selecting the aforementioned um, agencies was very difficult, and there were a lot of important factors that went into the deliberation, um, taking into consideration the framework elements and the need to meet specific earlier uh, mentioned indicators. And given the limitations of the funding amount uh, for this cycle, there were no agencies selected for the workforce development category, uh, but we can speak um, uh, later to, to uh, how we will still be uh, working with agencies on that. Um, next slide, please. So um, it is recommended by the Office of Community Engagement that the council by resolution adopt the funding recommendations of the grant review team for the Measure O Choice Cycle 11 grant program for July 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2024, and direct the city manager or designee to enter into funding agreements with approved funder providers and authorize the city manager or designee to approve and execute the funding agreements and amendments with Choice Cycle 11 funded agencies subject to approval as to form by the city attorney. And we can go to the next slide. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Deputy Director. And I uh, want to appreciate all of the work that goes into this uh, from, from you, from your staff, uh, from community partners, uh, from the whole team and, and the rest of our staff as well. Uh, let's open it up for questions from council members. Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. My question to you is, do we ever get any data on how the programs that we've funded um, are working, or is there something that they report back to the city of Santa Rosa, and then how do we access that, or does it just go straight to you? That is a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, we do have our choice grant update um, it's, it's like an updated scorecard. Uh, we have our 2020 uh, updated uh, scorecard available on our website and it, and it, it's used our results-based accountability. So it'll tell you how much we did, um, how far we got, and are we, and are we being successful? Uh, we're very grateful to Upstream Investment who got us sort of started on that. Um, and that will be available um, 
every year. And we are hoping to soon be able to close out cycle 10 to let the community know how collectively we did um, within cycle 10 cycle. And then um, we will be doing a closeout um, at the end of cycle 11 as well. So it'll be a larger, more extensive report. Thank you so much. Any other questions, Council? All right, let's go to public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I see nobody uh, rising to go to the program or podium, and I see no raised hand. Oh, hold on, I do. One moment, please. Uh, Sandra Valencia, please go ahead. Yes, um, I definitely we um, stand here as a choice funded agency with Community Chalker Council. I just want to um, hopefully that you support um, moving forward with approving this funding. I am firsthand working with families and being in our community with a Community Chalker Council for 28 years, um, have been able to um, do intensive case management in a whole different level. To, uh, things to this funding and be able to secure um, more families to be able to provide for their families at the same time, make sure that their children are safe, healthy environment with nurturing adults and um, being able to support this program to really um, impacts the families and the community overall in Santa Rosa and the families and adults and the children um, that are not here today to represent, to say, please support them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see no other hands. And there's no voicemail public comment on this item. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and bring it back to Council then. And Council Member Fleming, I believe that this is your motion. Thank you, Mayor. I'll bring a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting the funding recommendations of the grant review team for the Measure O 2004 Choice Cycle Grant 11 or Choice Cycle 11 grant program for July 1, 2022 through December 31, 2024 and granting authority to the city manager or designee to approve and execute funding agreements and waive further reading of the text. Second. Second. Do we have any additional comments? Okay. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Council Member. Mr. Mayor, can I make a comment? I have my hand up there. Oh, yeah, my apologies. Go for it. Just for the vote, I really want to thank the grant review team, having done that a couple years ago. Um, reviewing 17 different applications and have to select just eight is quite the challenge. So I really appreciate the time, energy, and effort, and the volunteerism, especially for those um, couple of superintendents. I know they've got busy schedules, but it was um, very impressive that they agreed to participate on this. And I'd also like to thank um, the voters of Santa Rosa, because without this measure of funds, here's almost $2 million going back into the community. This is exactly what we said we were um, going to be doing. And Magali, thank you for talking about the evaluation of it, because these programs do work. But again, we have just to thank the voters of the city of Santa Rosa who approved this funding stream. And uh, it's just been a great collaboration throughout the community. Thank you. Any other council members? OK. Now we will call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes, with Council Member Sawyer being absent. All right, thank you. Madam City Manager, let's do item 14.4, .4, please. Thank you, Mayor. And if you would just give me one quick second before we go to item 14.1. Uh, Deputy Director Tellis jumped in before I could make a comment. I just want to remind this body, sometimes we will bring comprehensive reports uh, to this body and we may not always have all the answers. We may not have answers that you like, but I have a sh extremely dedicated and hardworking team and I want to make certain that, that we are respecting staff. Uh, for the hard work that they put in and that if we have to come back to you with 
uh, an answer or we need to make adjustments, I just ask that you remember to um, respect the staff. Thank you. Item 14.4 is a report. It's the Parklet Program um, Manual Adoption. I'd like to introduce Deputy Director Osborne and Deputy Director uh, De La Rosa. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and uh, members of the council. So at long last, Deputy Director Gabe Osborne and I are here along with a number of other uh, dedicated and very involved city staff to present a pathway to move us from the temporary parklet program to a permanent one. And um, if we could get the uh, presentation up, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, so this has been um, something that has been uh, an interest, particularly to economic development for many years, well before the pandemic. Um, but like most things the city does, it is far more complicated than uh, the name implies. And this is because uh, parklet programs are informed by local, state, and federal regulations and touches almost every department in the city. Um, that said, we uh, believe we've created a program that will be easy to navigate in as affordable a manner as possible. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, the purpose of adopting the Parklet Program Manual is so that we can clearly outline the process criteria and costs for safely um, delineating and repurposing certain spaces within public streets. And uh, the benefit of this is to broaden the potential of these spaces from um, auto-centric uses to, uh, to uses that create or, or really bolster uh, vitality and social activities, predominantly in commercial districts, but in residential centers as well. So um, I wanna note here that parklets are uh, mostly associated with eating and drinking establishments, but this isn't always the case. Certainly it isn't um, the only thing we're proposing in um, the manual. Uh, they can be built by other business types for other community oriented purposes as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, years ago, uh, when we first began looking at developing a program, we hit many, many internal roadblocks, uh, starting with whether businesses should even be allowed to privatize public space. Um, and that's on top of just a myriad of other um, operational concerns and considerations. But you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And once COVID came along, we were able to very quickly uh, develop the temporary program that we have today um, that is operated out of the uh, Planning and Economic Development Department, um, obviously with the support of all other departments. Uh, and we did this using the encro encroachment permits as the permitting path. Um, and this is really the, the model that uh, we'll be using moving forward, uh, using encroachment permits. But um, specific to public versus private parklets, by way of background, before COVID, uh, when parklets became a thing in other cities, they were almost always public spaces, uh, though primarily used in service to and um, abutting private businesses to where it wasn't always evident um, that they were open for public use. So COVID changed this and um, is actually continuing to change uh, and inform programs, even in cities like San Francisco, where those programs were adamantly designed to be public. So while our temporary program allowed park, uh, parklets to be private spaces, moving forward, uh, what we'll be presenting to you uh, covers two options, either public or private parklets, with the difference um, really only reflected in what fees are applied. So we'll get that into that in a minute, but um, just so you understand, so public parklets will still be sponsored by a business organization or community group, uh, but uh, they're open for public use regardless of whether uh, people patronize the sponsoring establishment or not. And then private parklets are just that. Um, they'll have more costs associated with them, uh, but the sponsoring organization uh, has the uh, right to limit the use of the space to those patronizing their business. And I just wanna mention here that um, fairly soon we'll be rolling out a small business facade improvement grant program and parklets are, uh, or will be an eligible expense within that program. Next slide. 
So I'm actually going to hand this over to Gabe here in a second um, to get into the technical details of the manual. But before I do, I just want to point out the isolated area this, this program addresses. So on this diagram, uses that um, fall within the frontage zone and the furnishing zone. So really any area of the public sidewalk that is not um, the uh, shaded five foot uninhibited through zone. Um, the, the, the other sidewalk areas are covered under a separate uh, approval and permitting process. And especially in the downtown, those uses are generally permitted by right. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dave. Thank you, Raisa, and good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the Council. Um, as Raisa mentioned, our proposed parklet program today really adds to a portfolio of existing programs the city has in place for outdoor seating, and that's really what this exhibit is intended to show. Uh, we do have existing programs for sidewalk or cafe seating, and we do have existing programs for the expansion of patio seating on public, uh, excuse me, private property. Um, the parklet program, for reasons Rice mentioned earlier on in the presentation, has definitely been the most challenging, um, mainly due to the location. Uh, it is located in an area that historically has been programmed for parking, um, and it creates a significant number of challenges to address all the variety of issues that potentially it can present long term in that area. Um, but what we hope we're able to present today is a program that not only focuses on aesthetics, but also focuses on safety and a program that alleviates some of the burdens from a processing and time standpoint on the applicant, as well as the fees, because we really do want this to be as successful as it possibly can. Next slide, please. So as we step through today's presentation, I'll dive into quite a bit of detail on the specific uh, requirements and permit processing steps. I'd like to begin by a very brief overview of what that permit pathway duration and process looks like. Uh, we are proposing to allow parklets to move forward under encroachment permit applications. That is an existing application type uh, that is supported by our city code. It also has an existing fee structure associated with it. Uh, so the manual will actually supplement the code and it dives into some of the details that are very unique to parklets and addresses those, um, but it will work in conjunction with the code requirements. We are proposing to issue those permits for one year with annual renewals and we are not restricting the number of renewals, uh, hence the permanent program. Uh, the reason we have it on a one-year cycle is because the universe around a parklet and the public right-of-way can change. Uh, so parklets have to always be associated with an active business and that can change. Um, and then obviously in the public infrastructure arena, uh, we're dealing with a lot of capital projects that might temporarily displace the parklet. So the one-year cycle gives us the ability to review to make sure uh, that it's free and clear for that year. Uh, from a process standpoint, we are pushing it through two reviews. The first is an initial review that really what that looks at is site suitability. Um, and that's intended to provide clarity to the applicant um, through that process. And that process can be submitted by a business owner. It does not require a design professional. Uh, we will approve the site and that will provide clarity in the process before they engage an architect and start investing in final design. The second process is the final design review, and that is a review of the design drawings reviewed against all manual requirements, code policies, and standards. Um, that will have a public noticing process associated with it, which is a 15-day public noticing. And then obviously, once approved, we'll be generating construction drawings and the encroachment permit will be issued. Next slide, please. So when looking at the location criteria, we didn't want to create a policy that created any allowances or restrictions based on geographic areas. We really wanted to look at a solution that would allow parklets to go throughout Santa Rosa when the location criteria is met. And that location criteria falls into a few different categories. The first is traffic safety. So we're only proposing to allow parklets on a street with a speed limit of 25 miles per less and a trip volume of less than 5,000 vehicles a day. Um, we're proposing to create a separation from intersections of 15 feet. So that would be 15 feet from any street corner, intersection or active driveway. Uh, we are allowing the traffic engineer some discretion in this area. So if a lesser distance actually meets the same safety goal, we can allow it. Um, we're not allowing installations in any blue curb zone or red curb zone. Those are accessibility and emergency parking. Um, we are allowing uh, parklets to go in yellow zones, but they actually have to replace the yellow zone. That is a loading zone. Uh, the other category that can control the location is utility clearances. Uh, the biggest being hydrant clearance. So in the public right of way, we have to maintain access to all hydrants and fire department connections. So we are creating a buffer of seven and a half feet. 
Uh, park lights can go over the top of other utilities that exist in the right of way. Those are typically underground utilities. We are requiring that the parklet provide access to most utility covers. So those can be valve covers. They're generally areas where we need to operate the utility from the surface and the parklet will have to provide direct access to that. Um, through this process, we worked closely with PG&E because obviously they have infrastructure in the right of way as well and they have more stringent requirements. In some situations, utility covers are vented because of air circulation reasons. The parklet cannot be placed over the top and PG&E also has requirements with overhead power lines. Um, so we actually incorporated those PG&E requirements into our proposed program. Uh, the other item that can control the location of parklets really is the public process. Uh, so in this particular case, we are restricting the parklet to the fringe of the building. So that really means the width of the business. A parklet that wants to extend beyond the business has to obtain permission from the adjacent owner or tenant. That individual can approve or deny that request. Um, and we're also going to analyze unique site-specific issues that are brought forward as part of the public noticing process. We don't necessarily see that that would result in a denial of the application, um, but we want to open it up for that public review and we want to be able to address the community's concerns. Next slide, please. So obviously parklets take up public parking and one of the challenges is balancing out the need for public parking with the desire to activate that space in a different way. And to create that balance, we are restricting the number of spaces that a parklet can occupy. Uh, parklets can be in either parallel, perpendicular, or diagonal spaces. And they can either occupy three diagonal spaces or three perpendicular spaces or two parallel spaces. Uh, I think it's important to note that we in the policy are adding staff discretion to increase the number of spaces when unique circumstances exist. And that would typically be when an applicant cannot take full advantage of a parking stall. Um, and that type of situation would exist when the buffer increases. So as you can see in the detail, we're proposing a buffer of three to four feet from the adjacent parking stall just for operational purposes. Um, for example, you may see a fire hydrant right along that line, which would include that separation of seven and a half feet, which would further push the parklet away from the edge of the parking stall. So you can run into a situation where a property, excuse me, a business owner is essentially getting 20% of the parking stall. So in that type of situation, we would allow an additional stall to be brought in the mix to be able to provide the same amount of space. Next slide, please. So what I mentioned before is really when we go through our preliminary site plan or our preliminary review, we're really trying to determine site suitability. And we also wanted to make this a simple process. So we provide a significant amount of guidance in the program manual, including plans that can be submitted. Um, obviously, you can see that this is a digital representation, but if an applicant wishes to prepare this by hand, we will accept it. Um, but this is generally what we're looking for. We're looking for the footprint of the parklet and all the surrounding uh, features that are in the right of way and where the parklet is in relation to the business. So this is really added as a guidance for the applicant. Next slide, please. So although we really wanted to create a program that was universal to the city of Santa Rosa when the location requirements are met, we did have to place a specific focus on the downtown station area. And the downtown station area is the downtown and railroad square area. Um, and the reason being is we really wanted our permanent program to be informed by the lessons learned and our experiences under our temporary allowances. Um, so right after COVID, when we had the initial shelter in place requirements, we stood up two programs that allowed temporary seating in the right of way. Um, those had very minimal requirements, limited cost. Um, and we learned quite a few lessons from that. And we also were able to see where the demand existed for that. And 100% of those applications were issued in the downtown station area. Uh, so we knew that there was a the definite demand for permanent parklets. So I had to focus on some of the unique issues in that area. And the biggest issue is associated with the paid parking. So in addition to balancing the parking needs with the desire to activate public space, we're also incorporating into the discussion uh, potential impacts to the parking fund by allocating or, ex excuse me, placing parklets in areas that normally would generate parking revenue. So as we first started down this road a year or so ago to start working on the manual, we originally came up with a proposal that looked at potentially recovering some of that parking fund. And that was looking at a one-time fee and then an ongoing fee for that parking impact. 
And as we started doing our community outreach and engaging the community on that front, there were some significant concerns about the overall fee package. Uh, parklets are not cheap to build and just the cost of construction can be fairly pricey. So we were looking at developing a model where overall from a development of a plan standpoint and a fee package that we were balancing that. So that didn't really create avoidance because we wanted this to be successful. Um, so once that came up, we started taking a harder look at the parking fee. Um, and from a methodology standpoint, if we look at the downtown and the railroad square area, there is surplus parking. So when we look at a limited number of parklets, uh, they are isn't potentially an impact on the parking revenue. And that's due to the fact that as a vehicle approaches a space that has a parklet in it, it is able to further maneuver in that area to utilize surplus parking. And that surplus parking is generating revenue. So the vehicle is really not being displaced out of the parking district to where it doesn't pay. Um, now it's very hard to make that finding when we don't have a restriction on the number of parking spaces that can be allocated to a parklet because you could run into a situation where there is saturation and there's too many parklets in the area and then we're pushing outside of that surplus. So to address that issue, we are proposing to delegate authority to the parking manager to set a cap on the number of metered parking spaces in the downtown and railroad square areas. That initial cap is proposed to be set at 50 metered spaces between the two areas. Uh, that 50 metered spaces is a well above and beyond the current demand that we've been seeing for permanent parklets. Um, and it's also very close to the total number of spaces that we allocated to our temporary program. And at the height of that program, we were utilizing 50 spaces. Uh, so we think that 50 will not only meet the current demand for permanent parklets, but also the future demand. And it also allows us to move forward with no fee for the parking on the parklets. Uh, because there isn't necessarily that nexus because we're taking advantage of the surplus parking. Next slide, please. So once we get through site suitability, um, we're actually getting into design. Um, and there's a few components to that, with traffic safety being the most important. Uh, the detail that's provided on this slide was provided by the National Association of City Transportation Officials. It gives a general idea of how a parklet lays out. Um, that organization also has provided some protection measures for parklets. Uh, those have been incorporated by other local jurisdictions, and they've also expanded on those, as have we. So what we're requiring to protect from a traffic safety standpoint is we're requiring wheel stops on both sides of the parklet. And as you can see from the detail, parklets typically have parking on both ends, and the wheel stop prevents the vehicle from striking the parklet as it maneuvers in and out of the parking stall. We are also requiring soft hit posts, and those are number two on the detail. So those are posts at the corners. Uh, they make the parklet more visible, especially at night because they have reflective material on them. So we can, the vehicles approaching can see the corner. Uh, we're also controlling the depth of the parklet. Uh, so the parklet is, is pushed away from the edge of the parking stall to create more of a buffer from uh, vehicular traffic running parallel. And in some situations, we may see where the end of the parklet is not protected by a parking stall. And this can be a situation where the parklet is, is located fairly close to an intersection and is occupying the last parking stall adjacent to the intersection. Uh, in that particular case, when an edge is exposed to oncoming vehicular traffic, we are requiring a water barricade on that edge as an additional measure. And then I think the most important is to limit uh, the exposure to the high number of vehicles traveling at a high speed. And that's why we were only allowing parklets when the speed limit is 20 miles per hour um, with the specific 5,000 vehicles per day allowance. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, parklets are installing a structure in the public right of way, they do have to meet building code requirements. Um, all portions of the structure shall meet live loads and wind loads. What that means is obviously you have people occupying the, the parklet. They are leaning against railings. They are sitting on chairs. Uh, so structurally, the parklet has to make sure it meets those loads. Um, as you expand vertically on the parklet, it is more susceptible to wind. Um, so there has to be a structural analysis um, from a code compliance standpoint to make sure it works. Um, all portions of the platform and the seating area shall meet ADA requirements. And I think this is an important point. Um, a parklet is a very unique seating area in the public right of way. And being that, it has to meet all associated ADA requirements. 
Um, and it, some of the more specific items, uh, well, this is not an all-inclusive list, but it includes uh, slip-resistant surface materials. It ensures that wheelchair users can access the parklet. It also ensures that the parklet has the correct percentage of accessible seating. Um, and one of the big reasons why there's always a platform is because the platform can control the slope, which is a particular uh, item from an ADA standpoint. Um, we are also with the structure uh, attempting to reduce vertical and overhead elements. Uh, roof, roofing is strongly discouraged. It can be allowed at the discretion of the chief building official. Uh, the reason it is discouraged is because of the wind issue. Um, it, became, it becomes more of a risk to the general use of the right of way. Um, and generally there's more support structures and anchoring that happens at the base to make it work. And of course, the next bullet point is we wanna reduce anchoring because that potentially impacts the roadway. Uh, the final item on the building side are occupancy load calculations. Those really look at the number of occupants that a business has, uh, private parks, fire sprinklers, or the number of restrooms. Uh, we don't anticipate that to occur based on the small square footage, um, but that can actually happen and they actually have to go through the calculation as part of the submittal. Next slide, please. So in addition to building design, um, there are general aesthetic requirements. And, and these are always a bit challenging because from a processing standpoint, we're trying to make parklets very ministerial, uh, mainly to support a very streamlined process. And those are very much check the box sort of items when we say ministerial application. So we're really encouraging every effort to beautify and create visual character in the street state. Um, so we're looking at modular and movable, movable outdoor dining. Um, because we're not require, or excuse me, because we're not recommending a more formal design review process, we're actually requiring the parklet to meet um, the design of the building, which the assumption is, is in most situations, the design of the building goes through a design review process. So by matching that, you're essentially bringing in that design review element. Um, all exposed support structures shall be covered with visually pleasing products, so we don't want to see any bare wood. Um, materials cannot create glare or illuminate an off-site area. That's potentially just creating impacts to the right-of-way, so metallic materials may be problematic. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the items to support a ministerial application and more of a checklist are including items that we will not permit. Um, and this is a bit of a comprehensive list from what some other agencies have done and some of our experience with our temporary parklets. Uh, what we're not proposing to include in uh, the installation are pop-up tents. Uh, those can be problematic for a variety of different reasons. Um, outdoor carpeting or fake lawn products, any form of lattice, either wood or plastic, any pallets, which likely will not hold up from a structural standpoint based on the current requirements anyway. Uh, no plastic tables or chairs, no plastic uh, or vinyl fences, trellises or furniture. Uh, no picket fencing or chain link fencing, and no hinged middle pet enclosures. So all those are included in the policy. Next slide, please. So the amenities that not only are we allowing, but we're also encouraging are bike parking. That may be included as part of the parklet or may be installed directly outside of the parklet. Um, we're encouraging native drought tolerant plantings in planners incorporated into the parklet. Uh, instead of doing overhead roofing structures, we're allowing some level of vertical with overhead umbrellas and canvas covers to provide sun coverage. Uh, we're also allowing warm tone, which is generally a yellow light, string lights or lanterns, which we're encouraging those to be solar powered, powered and battery powered candles. Um, our fire department is also allowing propane heaters, but that must be consistent with fire department requirements. So there's a separate permitting requirement for that. It controls separation from overhead elements. Um, and it also deals with the storage of propane. And then obviously trash and recycling and compost bins are also encouraged. Next slide, please. So when we get into the fees, this is one of the areas where we put a significant amount of effort over the last three months. And as I described in a previous slide, we were able to move forward without proposing a parking fee. Uh, public and private parklets do deviate a bit on the total fee package. Uh, both are susceptible to the general permitting fees. Those include processing, plan review, inspection fees associated with the encroachment permit. Uh, there's also a fee that covers the hard cost of the noticing. Uh, the other fee that comes into the mix when it's a private parklet is potentially the water and wastewater demand fees. Uh, all businesses basically go through a calculation when they start up to determine the anticipated sewer and water use. And when those businesses expand, uh, that calculation is revisited. And this is an expansion of the business because it's a privately controlled area, very similar to an internal uh, additional square footage add to the, the building. 
Um, so the water department goes through a calculation, and if that calculation shows that the usage on the overall site will increase, which is an important point, it looks at the overall parcel, uh, then the applicant is susceptible to paying a one-time demand fee. Uh, that demand fee is actually a benefit to the property owner because it, it basically goes into the pool of available capacity that the parcel has. Um, and it's not always due. Uh, there's a variety of different reasons. Uh, oftentimes there can be credits where uh, more intense uses have left the building and then when, as the restaurant comes in, even though it expands, it's able to leverage credits that exist on the parcel. Um, but it definitely is a calculation that we go through and it is a possibility that private parklets will have to pay. Next slide, please. So looking at the two-year fee program, um, so for a proposed uh, parklet, and this we'll see a deviation here really based on a public and a private parklet, uh, they all have to pay the encroachment permit fee, and that's estimated to be about $720 based on the current fee structure. Uh, obviously, as that changes in the future, then this fee changes with it. Um, we're also adding the public information services fee, which is essentially covering our noticing. And the water and sewer demand fee, this is a bit of an estimate based on an increase in 2,000 gallons of additional demand. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it only applies to private parklets, um, and it may not apply if the parcel has available fee credits. And then as we see in our second year, that's a very small renewal fee for just the encroachment permit, which covers our cost to review that. Uh, the overall fee package we're proposing is one of the smallest that I've seen for permanent parklets. Um, so as I mentioned, we're really trying to encourage the deployment of these parklets and we're trying to give the applicant the ability to invest more in the design and create the beautification element in the right of way. Next slide, please. Uh, so I think it's always important to talk about uh, how we touch public processes, um, both with the manual creation that we've gone through as well as how we administer this uh, policy. Uh, so through the application review, um, obviously we require permission from the adjacent property owners so they have a voice in uh, the installation of that parklet, especially when it extends into their frontage. Uh, we also run this through a 15-day public review period uh, that will involve notices sent to tenants and owners within 600 feet of the radius. Uh, anytime we do that, we obviously work with the adjacent community to address any concerns that are brought forward. Um, as we developed this manual, it was a bit of a unique situation that we did have a very targeted audience. We, we did our best to create a universal policy that can apply throughout the city, um, but we had a uh, real desire within the downtown area and the railroad square districts to implement permanent parklets. Uh, so we worked very closely with those districts. We held multiple meetings with business owners to talk through some of the concepts that we were looking at um, and to course correct when needed. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also conducted some very direct interaction with the temporary permit holders to see what their interests were in moving forward with a, a permanent park with it. Next slide, please. Um, so we're moving to the conclusion here. Uh, you know, obviously I mentioned in the, the early stages of the presentation that we do have a temporary outdoor seating program. Uh, so our goal, obviously, because that was temporary, that was put in uh, strictly for COVID relief to throw a lifeline to businesses, is we really want to stand that down as we bring forward the permanent policy. So the temporary program was very simple. I'm 100% COVID relief. Uh, it was all private use, very minimal requirements. In that particular case, we actually allowed it under the city code chapter 13, which allows for an encroachment permit to occur. So that was all done through that code allowance, uh, simply due to the need that we needed to get it up and running fairly quickly to support the needs of the community. Now, if we move forward with the adoption of the permanent policy today, um, what our proposal is, is to cease any issuance of temporary permits uh, because we'll have the permanent program in place that any applicant wishing to move forward can go through the permanent program. And then we also want to remove the temporary seating by September 12th um, and of this year. And that date is fairly strategic. So for those applicants that have no desire to move forward with the permanent program, we still wanted to give them an opportunity to have some level of outdoor seating through the summer. So September 12th actually gets it through Labor Day and also gets a weekend after Labor Day. And what we found is that most parklets are removed on the weekend because of the resources that can come in to support that. Um, another option, if an applicant does want to actually move forward with a permanent program, um, by completing the application and formally submitting a complete application prior to the date, we will allow the temp seating to remain while the permit goes through the review process. 
Um, and just a notice for the public, um, obviously when we get into uh, revoking permits and sunsetting policies that exist, we do our best to get voluntary compliance, we do our best to notice and we do our best to support. Um, the city can remove seating out of the right of way and that seating can be removed with the permit holders expense. We do our best to not let it get to that point, um, but that is usually our last effort to address these issues if we run into a non-compliant situation. Next slide, please. So before we hit the, the final side, um, I, I did discuss some of uh, the components that are involved in our, our recommendations today. Um, one in spe uh, specifically is we do want to potentially authorize the Director of the Planning and Economic Development Department to execute future updates to the program manual. Um, and that would be very specific to the following areas. Uh, fee references, obviously those are changed through other processes as fees are adopted and modified. Uh, we want to want the flexibility to update those numbers in the policy just to keep it uh, clear and keep it up to date. Um, and the same holds true with local, uh, local, state, and federal code references. Those are adopted and this will be incorporated in the policy through this means to, to keep that fresh. Um, and then we do control internally often permitting procedures and application processes. And those can change for a variety of different reasons with digital submittals coming into the mix. So we're requesting the flexibility to be able to make those changes. Next slide, please. And that brings us to the, to the end. Uh, so I'd like to complete the presentation by simply restating the recommendations. Um, I apologize, we do have a slight typo in the first. Uh, the first is to adopt the Parklet Program Manual outlining requirements to expand a business's outdoor operating space on a public street and assign existing service fees to applications initiated under the program. Second recommendation is to authorize the Director of Planning and Economic Development to approve future changes to the Parklet Program Manual when references to local, state, and federal code requirements, adopted fees, or application submittal processes require updating. And the third is to authorize the parking manager to determine the total number of metered parking spaces within the downtown station area that may be utilized for permanent parklet program. Um, and with that, both Raisa and I and a variety of different staff and different departments are available to answer any questions the council may have. All right, thank you so much, Gabe. There's always a very thorough and, and very good presentation. I wanna thank all of the staff that have worked on this uh, and have uh, worked on compromises to try to move this program forward. Council, do you have questions for staff? Council Member Fleming? Yeah, I have one question about the 5,000 5, trips and 25 miles. Will that impact any of our existing uses in terms of um, the, the parklets that are currently going on? Will, will they have to dismantle that, that is an excellent question. Um, the area that we're further analyzing is on Mendocino. Um, we see different traffic patterns as we uh, move up from Mendocino, pretty much from college to fourth. Um, the highest trip counts are from college to seventh, and that's over the 5,000, but we didn't see any parklets in that corridor. Um, fifth to seventh was slightly over 5,000, um, and we did see parklets in that corridor, and then fourth to fifth was under. Um, the traffic counts are actually from 2019, and we are going through the process now of doing additional traffic counts to accurately capture what those traffic patterns are. Um, obviously, we had the change with Courthouse Square. We had issues with COVID affecting really traffic patterns. Um, so we're fairly certain 5th to 7th will be under it. Um, and we'll be working with those applicants directly to iron out those details um, if we start seeing permanent requests in that corridor. Uh, but that is the only area that we've identified that would not be eligible. The rest of the parklets uh, would be eligible based on those restrictions. Um, Gabe, do you want to speak a little bit about Brew as well? Absolutely, yes. Brew is a fairly unique situation and we do have that referenced in the manual. Um, that is not parking. That's essentially taking additional right-of-way space that's not programmed for a specific use because it's in the middle of the two travel lanes. So our manual does allow for that. Um, it is very much a unique situation. So in that particular case, we're going to do our best to, to apply all of our requirements to that, um, but it won't always fit because those situations are fairly unique. Um, and they can be very unique from a traffic standpoint. Um, as you can see from Brew, um, obviously more water barricades out there, more temporary redirection of traffic. Um, so we will be working very closely with them and we have from the start. 
Um, and the policy does allow for it. It just will be a fairly unique uh, case by case determination on what the ultimate requirements under that permit will be. Okay, thank you. And going back to my question about the existing parklets that which was specifically that you identified on Mendocino between 5th and 7th, um, would it be possible for the traffic engineer or the city manager or their designee to make exceptions for existing uses that come close to uh, the the parameters but that are not within it and or um, what and then uh, an adjacent question is what if in the future um, existing uses end up with higher traffic um, uh, or higher trips I don't imagine we would increase the speeds but that perhaps the the amount of trips begins to exceed 5,000 in a particular area in spite of our traffic calming measures um, around the downtown And those are all excellent points. I, I think um, from a policy standpoint to address the question about an existing permit. Uh, so basically, as we review the permit, those requirements really lock in. So if patterns change within that year, we don't revisit it, but we are creating a, a permitting process where we actually revisit this on an annual basis. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because conditions can dramatically change. Um, so when we deal with the 5,000 trips, it, you know, what point does it become more of a safety issue with the parklet? And at what point are there more stringent traffic control measures that we implement? Um, so as we currently sit, um, that is not an area where we added discretion. Um, that is an area where we can add discretion. Um, and we have that in other areas in the policy, especially with the 15 foot separation. Um, where basically that bounces back to the traffic engineer to make a determination that if you're essentially 5,001, that that's close enough to 5,000. Um, so it isn't into the policy now, um, but that would be consistent with some other allowances we have in there. And that can be specifically focused on existing parklets that were approved under different circumstances. So what you're saying, just to be super clear, is that the traffic engineer has a bit of discretion um, around the amount of trips and then I, I suppose since it's coming back to us, it'll be a, a great opportunity to look at traffic calming. And then the other thing that I noticed about the parklets is that they are inherently traffic calming in and of themselves. And so I imagine that uh, that when there are collisions, there are much lower speeds because the roads are significantly lower. I know there was um, a parklet collision on Fifth Street um, between Mendocino and D, I want to say, but I don't think anybody was injured necessarily. I, I think it was um, the the pit, the. I'm going to butcher the name. It was something pig. It was. It's a great restaurant. Anyway, I don't know if it's still there. The what pig? The naked pig. That's right. Anyway, so you know there are risks associated with it, but I, I one of the things that I really like about these is that they do slow down traffic and they make the area more accessible. And I, I like to hear that the traffic engineer does have some discretion. Gabe, uh, if I if I may, Mayor uh, Gabe, I don't know if anyone from traffic engineering is on. Um, if they are, they can talk about the Mendocino Avenue corridor study that's currently underway in the downtown. If they're not on, I'll just simply mention, uh, council member, that, that we actually are actively looking at alternatives for Mendocino Avenue between 4th and 10th, and that may feed directly into the work that, that Gabe and Rice have done to try to understand what that corridor may look like in the future that may enhance the ability for future parklets. So I, I think some of that work is in the process of, uh, of happening. That's really exciting. I'll contact you separately to, to learn more about that. I know the businesses and, and the bike ped people will be excited to hear about that as well. And we, we do have Rob Sprinkle available. And, and Rob, would you like to provide more detail on that? I think Jason really nailed it on the head. I was, I was ready to jump in. Um, but yeah, we, did, we have had a, a public meeting and got a lot of great input. There's actually a survey online right now where we've gotten over 600 different comments um, uh, regarding what to do with Mendocino Avenue and how to um, help accommodate all different modes of transportation on the segment between College and Fourth Street. So, um, 
that's going to be incorporated into our slurry project, which is coming up next summer. So we're really excited to um, get the feedback from the public and to move forward with a, a design to help accommodate all modes there. All right. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions? All right, let's get a public comment on this item. Uh, Mayor, I don't see anybody going to the podium. I see no raised hands, and we have no voicemail public comment on this item. All right, I'm going to go ahead and bring it back then. And Councilmember McDonald, I believe it's your motion. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I move the resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopt the Parklet Program Manual and assigning existing service fees to applications initiated under the program, authorizing the Director of Planning and Economic Development to approve future changes to the Parklet Program Manual to address code updates, fee adoptions, and changes to permitting process, and authorizing the parking manager to determine the total number of metered parking spaces within the downtown station area that may be utilized by the permanent parklet program and waive further reading of the resolution. Second. So motion from Councilmember McDonald and a second from Councilmember Fleming. Is there any additional comments from Council? Mayor. Let's go Councilmember Rogers and then Fleming. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for all the hard work. It, it is very thought out um, and thorough, uh, very comprehensive. And I think all the comments that I received from um, a lot of the, the neighbors that had concerns about parklets that were next to them, um, that you really addressed those issues and did it very uh, thoroughly um, and did it in a way where it is creating community, not division. And so I just wanted to thank you for doing that and doing it in writing. Um, so thank you very much for your hard work on this. And Councilmember Fleming. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just, I wanted to add that these, these parklet programs, they can seem really simple when you just want to throw something up, but the devil is in the details and it's always, you know, interesting on the outside to watch the cities that tried to permanent, make these permanent a year ago or 18 months ago and how, how difficult it was. So, I just want to applaud our staff for going through all these finer points. The fact, the fact that I haven't been deluged by emails from my constituents and business owners in the downtown is a real testament to your outreach and your wisdom on these topics and that that we had no comments tonight just baffled me i thought we were going to be here till midnight so um really well done thank you cast member mcdonald Thank you, Mayor. Um, in addition, I received some emails just requesting that we approve this item from different members of the um, community that weren't business owners, but felt that it was really important to have opportunities to sit outside. And I think we know that the pandemic is not over yet, and many people do want to still eat outside. And so I appreciate the aesthetic part of what we're doing in the Parklet program as well, so that there's some consistency and there's some um, some recommendations for design so that we do have that aesthetically pleasing downtown area. I think that that's critical when we look at building and what we want to have and see specifically around the lighting so that it's inviting. It also creates an opportunity for people to feel safe when they're down at our restaurants in the evening time when there's outdoor lighting like that. So thank you again for the great presentation tonight and um, I echo what all of my colleagues have said about the importance of having this continue. Thanks. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, sir. Very quickly, I just want to applaud all the efforts that were, uh, that were made to make this happen. Uh, government didn't dictate how a business should be ran. Instead, it witnessed, it supported, and it assured that, that our downtown commerce and merchants thrived during the pandemic. So thank you on behalf of all the merchants of downtown. All right, let's go ahead and call the vote. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes, with Councilmember Sawyer being absent. Okay. 
Okay, thank you so much, Gabe and Raisa and everybody. Let's move on to item 14.5. Report item 14.5 is City Code Charter 18-52, Flood Damage Protection Amendments. Chief Building Official Jesse Os Oswald will present the report. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez and Council. Um, glad to be with you tonight. Always a tough act to follow uh, going behind Gabe and Ray. So I always seem to be stuck behind these, these rock stars. Um, so tonight, uh, we bring before the council uh, uh, the first uh, a look at uh, the, the flood damage protection ordinance with the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, next slide, please. So the this flood damage protection ordinance uh, is really the operational physical element of the national flood insurance uh, program, which is operated under FEMA. And a little extra information on that is th this program affords homeowners in flood prone areas, uh, typically lower rates for flood insurance than say your, your commercial type carriers. So it's a beneficial program for those, for those um, property owners in, in flood uh, potential prone areas. Uh, so the, the ordinance sets forth the requirements for construction and development within designated flood, flood prone areas. Uh, next slide, please. So what started this uh, uh, revisit to our ordinance? Our ordinance uh, is, is fairly, um, it's not long, it's not overly complicated, and it historically has been uh, uh, very compliant. Uh, so the first thing that uh, brings us here is uh, FEMA recently uh, completed a flood insurance study and a flood insurance rate map for areas within Sonoma County that were primarily outside the city of Santa Rosa limits. Uh, focused, the, the study was focused in the Todd Creek and its tributary areas. Um, and very few, uh, if I recall right, maybe two or, or maybe more, but not very many more uh, parcels actually within the city limits were affected. Uh, here we have a statement from the uh, director of floodplain management with FEMA, uh, Rachel Sears, that indicated these maps didn't have any significant changes that made uh, flood flood hazard data uh, any any more uh, uh, instrumental in, in the local application. Uh, that the flood insurance study in the in the firm maps will become effective July nineteenth, twenty twenty two. Uh, necessitating, necessitating the changes, uh, the adoption of the changes to our local ordinance to maintain participation in this national flood insurance program. Next slide, please. So as I indicated, um, we were fortunate and I believe uh, have remained vigilant over the years in our ordinance in, in maintaining compliance with the federal requirements and other state requirements to, to essentially match those ordinances. Uh, the, the idea is that we, we literally are, are told by the federal agency that we, we must be consistent with their laws, regulations, and ordinance to maintain compliance and maintain enrollment uh, in the program. So some of the highlighted changes uh, that, that were uh, brought forth to uh, affect our ordinance, uh, some additional uh, definitions, including the definition of recreational vehicle, uh, which is uh, we're, we're seeing more common use of those for uh, some types of housing. So they wanted to identify those um, and how those are uh, dealt with in flood prone areas. Uh, procedural clarifications on how we apply uh, requirements to development in flood prone areas and the additional of one technical requirement that is, is fairly new uh, is the establishment for what's uh, normally called uh, free board. It means essentially that uh, the lowest floor of any new development, say a house, uh, meaning the, say it's a one story home, that floor needs to now be one foot above what's called base flood elevation. Next slide, please. And I apologize for the blurriness of these pictures. I'm not sure uh, the transition from the, the snip to the slide. But this shows uh, the original requirement trying to indicate the, the somewhat blue-green area of where a flood level could 
he anticipated to rise to in that level really shows that it could rise to about the floor level of, of a home. And that was the old requirement that we simply had that floor level at or above that level that's identified in the flood, map, flood maps. Uh, next slide, please. So the newest requirement, again, apologies for the blurriness, tries to indicate showing that lowest floor now, if we were to build a home in a flood prone area and the established uh, base flood elevation was X, the lowest floor of the home would have to now be one foot above that. That's an extra element of safety when uh, designing structures, homes primarily, but other structures and how we would want those to be uh, constructed to be uh, reusable, so to speak, in the event of a flood. Next slide, please. So bringing us to the, the short uh, and end of the, the presentation, uh, it's recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the City Council by resolution, number one, introduce an ordinance adopting amended City Code Chapter 18-52 flood damage protection to comply with regu regulatory requirements that our ordinance coincide with 44 Code of Federal Regulation 60.3 and adopt a resolution setting a public hearing on July 12th, 2022 for adoption of the ordinance. And I also have uh, waiting in the wings, uh, Claire Myers, Stormwater and Creeks Manager and Flannery Banks, Assistant Engineer with Stormwater and Creeks for any technical questions that may be posed more on the flood study side uh, as opposed to the ordinance itself. All right, thank you so much, Jesse. Let's see if there are any questions from council members. Not seeing any, so let's go to public comment. I see nobody rising in the council chamber, no hands raised in Zoom, and I have no voicemail public comment on this item. Okay, council member Swedholm, can you introduce uh, uh, suggestion, motion. A suggestion. First of all, I want to say, Jesse, awesome presentation. Don't sell yourself short. Nice job. So I would like to introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting amendments to City Code Chapter 18-52 and waive further reading of the text. Second. And any additional conversation? All right, let's call the vote. Councilmember Schwedhelm? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes, with Councilmember Sawyer being absent. And then I'd like to introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, setting a time and place for a public hearing for the proposed adoption of amendments to Santa Rosa City Code Chapter 18-52, Flood Damage Protection, and way further reading in the text. Second. So motion from Council Member Schwedhelm with a second from Council Member Rogers. Let's call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with six ayes, with Council Member Sawyer being absent. All right. Thank you, Council. So we have uh, one written communication for tonight. It's the notice of final map for Bellevue Ranch Phase 7. Let's go ahead and open it up and see if there's any public comment. Mayor, there, I see nobody rising to the podium. I no hands raised and I have no voicemail public comment on this item. All right, let's also then take public comment for non-agenda items for our second time for the night. And again, I see nobody rising to the podium, no hands raised, and I have no voicemail public comment on item 17. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll go ahead and adjourn tonight's meeting.
see you all back at home soon.